The American Indian in the Great War by Dr. George P. Donahue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What would William Penn have thought if he had been told that one day the descendants of the Lenny Lenape, whom he first met on the shores of the Delaware at Shakamaxon, were to cross the great salt water to fight side by side with the Frenchmen, the Englishmen, and the men of every race and creed who believe in justice and truth? What could have La Salle and the countless other voyageurs who carried the lilies of France from the lakes of Canada to the shores of Louisiana have thought? had they been told that the descendants of the Chippewas, the Mississauguas, the Iroquois, the Loups, and many other tribes of red men, were one day to go to France to protect Paris from the invasion of savagery. What would the Calvinistic Scotchman, who became a bloodthirsty hunter of the Injun along the foothills of the Alleghanies, have thought if he had been told that the descendants of the Seneca and Muncie, whose war-whoop he had heard over the smoldering ruins of his log cabin, were one day to die on the fields of Flanders as comrades in arms with the ladies of hell. What would all of these worthy pioneers have deemed such a picture, an impossible one? And when we think of the short time which has passed since the frontiers of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland were bathed in the blood of the Indian Wars, less than 125 years, does not the picture seem a merely imaginary one? The descendants of Tammany, Ted Yuskung, Canasatego, and the great host of other Indian chiefs, fighting the Germans as aviators, as artillerymen, as sharpshooters, as doughboys, and wearing the khaki as defenders of civilization in its great struggle with savagery. Does it not seem like a dream? The American Indian has been noted as a warrior since his first meeting with the white race. As someone has said, the Indian has a genius for war. He is a born strategist. He has shown his ability as a warrior in all of his battles with the white race from the time of John Smith to the masterly retreat of Chief Joseph. So far as the writer is aware, the only real battle with white men in which he was outwitted by strategy was at Bushy Run in Pennsylvania, when Colonel Bouquet showed superior ability to Kayasutha as a strategist. It is small wonder, then, that the Indian has again made a name for himself in this greatest of all wars, in which the choicest soldiers of all nations have taken part. The extent of his services in this war was little understood or appreciated. When one realizes the immensity of the injustice done to the Indian by the white race, as well as by the nation, the fact that he offered himself as a volunteer in this war to fight under the flag of the nation which has denied him all rights of citizenship, is in itself a thing to be wondered at. The United States entered this war to make the world a safe place for the oppressed of the smaller peoples, and make treaties between nations something more than mere scraps of paper. And yet the Indian has been denied every right of citizenship by the government, and every treaty between his tribes and the United States has been nothing but a scrap of paper, to be torn up whenever it suited the pleasure of the government, or the avarice of white men, to do so. And no one realizes this fact more fully than does the Indian himself. But when the United States entered this war to fight for righteousness between nations, the Indian offered himself and his money to the utmost limit. More Indians enlisted in proportion to the population of fighting age than did any race in the entire continent. It must be kept in mind that the Indian is neither an alien nor a citizen. He occupies no place whatever in the scheme of governmental affairs. He is nothing but a perpetual ward of the nation. He has never played a part in the political affairs of the government simply because he has been ignored as a factor. We have had to meet the desires of the German-American, the Irish-American, the Greek-American, the Russian-American, and all the other hyphenates. In what political fight has the American Indian ever been taken into consideration? What party has ever tried to place in its platform some bait to attract the vote of the American Indian? The Negro vote, the German vote, the Irish vote have all been sought by all sorts of devices. The Indian has never been sought because it does not exist. And yet, when the United States called for soldiers to cross the ocean to fight for the preservation of civilization, the Indian left the land of his ancestors to die on foreign soil, fighting side by side with his white brothers under a flag which he had no right to call my flag, and for a nation which had denied him the right to call my country. 
the warriors of nearly every tribe on the american continent are today sleeping side by side with the khaki-clad yanks on every battlefield of northern france from vimy ridge to the argonne forest there were in the army and navy of the united states in round numbers about ten thousand indians of this number over six thousand enlisted as volunteers according to the figures given in the second report of the provost marshal general the total registration of the indians under the selective service was seventeen thousand three hundred and thirteen of this number six thousand five hundred and nine were inducted into the army of the united states the commissioner of indian affairs in his report for nineteen eighteen estimates that there were in the military service of the united states eight thousand indians of all tribes in his report he says considering the large number of aged and infirm indians and others not subject under the draft leaving about thirty three thousand of military eligibility i regard the representation of eight thousand in camp and actual warfare as furnishing a ratio of population unsurpassed if equaled by any other race or nation that is twenty eight per cent of the available manpower of the indian race if the same percentage had been carried out by the white population of the nation there would have been an army of ten million men under arms in addition to giving men the indians gave of their money to the red cross liberty loans and other war activities to the first liberty loan they subscribed four million six hundred and nine thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars to the four loans a total of twenty million dollars or an average of fifty eight dollars for every indian man woman and child in the united states in september nineteen eighteen there were ten thousand indians in the american red cross the indian women and girls worked as faithfully in making hospital supplies as any class of women in the continent the indians of canada have been equally patriotic and self-sacrificing in their service according to the annual report of the department of indian affairs of canada for nineteen eighteen more than thirty five hundred indians had enlisted this number represents approximately thirty five per cent of the indian male population of military age resident in the nine provinces duncan c scott deputy superintendent general of indian affairs of canada says the indians have established for themselves a magnificent record which should place their race high in the esteem of their fellow countrymen and our allies the manner in which the indians have responded to the call to the colors appears more especially commendable when it is remembered that they are wards of the government and have not therefore the responsibility of citizenship that many of them were obliged to make long arduous journeys from remote localities in order to offer their services and that their disposition renders them naturally averse to leaving their own country and conditions of life some of these canadian indians walked five hundred miles in order to enlist one of them traveled three thousand miles from the arctic coast near herschel island by trail canoe and boat to vancouver in order to enlist many of the canadian indians have been decorated for unusual bravery they excelled as sharpshooters one of these named ballantyne of the eighth battalion before being wounded killed fifty germans the majority of whom were sharpshooters or snipers as they are now called many of the indians of the united states and canada served as commissioned officers the majority of the officers and non-commissioned officers of the d company one hundred and fourteenth battalion of canada were indians of the six nations these few facts gathered from the official reports of the united states and canada show a part of the help given by the american indian to the cause of the allies does it not seem to be the time after the injustice of more than a century of dishonor to grant to this patriotic race a place side by side with the white man and the negro in the affairs of the nation they were deemed worthy of a place by the side of their white brothers in the battles of vimy ridge the marne chateau thierry and in the argonne forest they have been deemed worthy to sleep the last long sleep side by side with their comrades in khaki in those hollowed spots in france why then are they not worthy to take a place side by side with the white man and the negro in the battles of peace as charles a eastman ohiesa says in the american indian magazine it is not the fault of the people in a way not perhaps the fault of any particular administration that the soldier returning from the marne or chateau thierry should still find his money and land held by the indian bureau when he asks for freedom they answer him can you propose anything better than the present system he replies is there anything better today than american citizenship 
until this blot is cleansed from the star-spangled banner we had better speak softly about injustice to the weaker races and not talk too loudly about the right of self-determination the indian is not asking for a separate government all he is asking for is the right to become an american citizen under the flag for which he fought when all citizenship and government was at stake end of the american indian in the great war by dr george p donahue read by colleen mcmahon buck versus bell superintendent of state colony epileptics and feeble-minded mr justice holmes delivered the opinion of the court this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dale grothman buck versus bell superintendent of state colony epileptics and feeble-minded mr justice holmes delivered the opinion of the court one this is a writ of error to review the judgment of the supreme court of appeals of the state of virginia affirming a judgment of the circuit court of amherst county by which the defendant in error the superintendent of the state colony for epileptics and feeble-minded was ordered to perform an operation of salponectomy upon carrie black the plaintiff in error for the purpose of making her sterile one forty three b a three ten one thirty s e five sixteen the case comes here under the contention that the statute authorizing the judgment is void under the fourteenth amendment as denying to the plaintiff in error due process of law and equal protection of the laws two carrie buck is a feeble-minded white woman who was committed to the state colony above mentioned in due form she is the daughter of a feeble-minded mother in the same institution and the mother of an illegitimate feeble-minded child she was eighteen years old at the time of the trial of her case in the circuit court in the latter part of nineteen twenty four an act of virginia approved march twenty nineteen twenty four Parens, Laws, nineteen twenty four, c, three ninety four, and Parens, recites that the health of the patient and the welfare of society may be promoted in certain cases by the sterilization of mental defectives, under certain safeguard, etc. That the sterilization may be effected in males by vasectomy, and in females by salponectomy without serious pain or substantial danger to life that the commonwealth is supporting in various institutions many defective persons who if now discharged would become a menace but if incapable of procreating might be discharged with safety and become self-supporting with benefit to themselves and to society and that experience has shown that heredity plays an important part in the transmission of insanity, imbecility, etc. The statute then enacts that whenever the superintendent of certain institutions, including the above-named state colony, shall be of opinion that it is for the best interest of the patients and of society that an inmate under his care should be sexually sterilized, he may have the operation performed upon any patient afflicted with hereditary forms of insanity imbecility etc on complying with the very careful provisions by which the act protects the patient from possible abuse three the superintendent first presents a petition to the special board of directors of his hospital or colony stating the facts and the grounds for his opinion verified by affidavit notice of the petition and of the time and place of the hearing in the institution is to be served upon the inmate and also upon his guardian and if there is no guardian the superintendent is to apply to the circuit court of the county to appoint one 
if the inmate is a minor notice also is to be given to his parents if any with a copy of the petition the board is to see to it that the inmate may attend the hearing if desired by him or his guardian the evidence is all to be reduced to writing and after the board has made its order for or against the operation the superintendent or the inmate or his guardian may appeal to the circuit court of the county the circuit court may consider the record of the board and the evidence before it and such other admissible evidence as may be offered and may affirm revise or reverse the order of the board and enter such order as it deems just finally any party may apply to the supreme court of appeals which if it grants the appeal is to hear the case upon the record of the trial in the circuit court and may enter such order as it thinks the circuit court should have entered there can be no doubt that so far as procedure is concerned the rights of the patient are most carefully considered and as each step in this case was taken in scrupulous compliance with the statute and after months of observation there is no doubt that in that respect the plaintiff in error has had due process at law four the attack is not upon the procedure but upon the substantive law it seems to be contended that in no circumstances could such an order be justified it certainly is contended that the order cannot be justified under the existing grounds the judgment finds the facts that have been recited and that carrie buck is the probable potential parent of socially inadequate offspring likewise afflicted and that she may be sexually sterilized without detriment to her general health and that her welfare and that of society will be promoted by her sterilization and thereupon makes the order in view of the general declarations of the legislature and the specific findings of the court obviously we cannot say as a matter of law that the grounds do not exist and if they exist they justify the result we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives it would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices often not felt to be such by those concerned in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offsprings for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind the principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes jacobs versus massachusetts 197 us 11 25 s ct 358 49 l e d 643 3 a n c a s 765 three generations of imbeciles are enough five but it is said however it might be if this reasoning were applied generally it fails when it is confined to a small number who are in the institution's name and is not applied to the multitudes outside it is the usual last resort of constitutional arguments to point out shortcomings of this sort but the answer is that the law does all that is needed when it does all that it can indicates a policy applies it to all within the lines and seeks to bring within the lines all similarly situated so far and so fast as its means allow of course so far as the operations enable those who otherwise must be kept confined to be returned to the world and thus open the asylum to others the equality aimed at will be more nearly reached six judgment affirmed seven justice butler dissents 
the end of buck versus bell superintendent of state colony epileptics and feeble-minded cincinnati's old cunny by lyndon f edwards this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org cincinnati's old cunny a notorious purveyor of human flesh by lyndon f edwards forward in the following publication lyndon f edwards relates the evil deeds of ohio's most notorious resurrectionist william cunningham the paper was originally published in the ohio state medical journal volume 50 may 1954 the author has graciously granted permission to reproduce the article the boards and the staff of the Public Library of Fort Wayne and Allen County present this publication in the hope that it will interest local readers. The son of Albert R. and Mary E. Hare Edwards, Lyndon Forrest Edwards, was born in Louisville, Ohio, on November 25, 1899. He received the Bachelor of Arts degree in 1922 and the Master of Science degree in 1923 from Ohio State University. Dr. Edwards continued graduate study at the University of Michigan, the University of Illinois, and Ohio State University. In 1928, the degree of Doctor of Philosophy was conferred on Lyndon Edwards by Ohio State University. Dr. Edwards has had considerable experience in the teaching profession. His former positions follow. Instructor in Zoology, Ohio State University, 1923-25. Instructor in Anatomy, University of Illinois, 1925-29. Since 1929, he has served in various capacities in the College of Medicine at Ohio State University. Dr. Edwards is a member of the following professional organizations. International Association for Dental Research, American Association of Anatomists, Ohio Academy of Science, Columbus Dental Society, American Association of the History of Medicine, and the Franklin County, Ohio Historical Society. He was a member of Sigma Xi, Omicron Kappa Upsilon, and Gamma Alpha. He is also a past president of the Ohio Academy of Medical History. Lyndon F. Edwards has published several books, Anatomy for Physical Education, Concise Anatomy, and Synopsis of Anatomy. He has also written the chapter entitled Anatomy in Trapezano's Review of Dentistry for State Board Examinations and has co-authored the chapter entitled The Maxillary Sinus in Orban's Oral History and Embryology. He has also published scientific papers in the field of human anatomy. In recent years, he has developed an interest in the history of medicine, particularly in the history of anatomy. Dr. Edwards married Elizabeth Smith on September 2, 1925, and has one daughter. He currently holds the post of Professor of Anatomy in the College of Medicine at Ohio State University. Main Text For the sake of accuracy, and to be truly interpretative, the historical account of any era should include a record of the evil deeds of disreputable characters as well as the good deeds of honorable ones, albeit the tendency is to disregard the former in order to glorify the latter, because of their greater appeal to the pride and esteem of their fellow countrymen. The medical colleges and the good citizens of Cincinnati during the 19th century could well boast of their outstanding professors of anatomy, such notables, for example, as Drs. Silly, Clendenin, Cobb, Comegus, Gobrecht, Gross, Judkins, and others too numerous to mention, names which still grace the roles of Ohio's Medical Hall of Fame. It is not the object of this paper to detract one iota from the laurels of these professors of anatomy. Rather, the purpose is to depict some of the deeds and something of the character of a villainous individual by the name of William Cunningham, a professional resurrectionist upon whom the professors relied for procuring their anatomical material. The Drayman Boogeyman More stories were told about Cunningham than of any other of the resurrectionists in Ohio, of his grave-robbing episodes, and of his escapades in eluding law officers. He was the boogeyman of all ill-behaved children in the environs of Cincinnati during the period when he plied his trade in corpses, which was between the years 1855 and 1871. He was known locally by various names, including Old Man Dead and The Ghoul, but he was more familiarly called Old Cunny, not simply because it was a contraction of his real name, but since he was as cunning as the proverbial fox, and due to his adroitness and daring, he was deserving of the cognomen. He was born in Ireland in 1807 and is described as having been a big, raw-boned man with muscles like Hercules, a protruding lower jaw, and an insatiable thirst for hard liquor. During the day he was ostensibly a drayman, but at night he plied his trade as a professional resurrectionist, 
supplying the medical colleges of Cincinnati with cadavers, which he and his hired helpers exhumed from the local cemeteries. According to a Cincinnati physician, who knew him in a business way, Cunny was an expert in his business. Usually he took the body to town in a buggy sitting in the seat beside him. The corpse was dressed up in an old coat, vest, and hat. He would hold the reins in his right hand while he would steady the corpse with his left arm around the waist of his silent companion. Whenever people passed and the corpse would gravitate forward and downward, Cunny would slap his inoffensive partner in the face and say to him, Sit up. This is the last time I am going to take you home when you get drunk. The idea of a man with a family disgracing himself in this way. Old Cunny's Cunningness Illustrative of Old Cunny's cleverness are the following incidents related about him. One night, between the hours of 11 and 12 o'clock, he and two of his confederates stopped at a saloon in Carthage to have a drink. His identity being known by almost everyone in the environs of Cincinnati, and his nightly movements always arousing suspicion, after he and his helpers had departed, several of the patrons of the saloon organized themselves into a posse and proceeded to follow the ghouls to the cemetery used by the city infirmary in the rear of that institution. The party in pursuit surrounded the cemetery just as the ghouls were in the act of raising two subjects from their graves and commenced firing promiscuously at them. His two helpers escaped into an adjoining woods, but old Cunny stood his grounds and obstinately refused to obey the command to hold up his hands. Finally, when one of the members of the party drew a bead on him with a rifle, which failed to go off when the cap snapped, he reluctantly gave himself up and begged them to spare his life. Old Cunny was then piled into his conveyance, and accompanied by his captors, was forced to drive back to Carthage. On their return to that village, he persuaded his captors to stop at the saloon, where he bought them several drinks. When they were properly mellowed, he was released and permitted to return to Cincinnati with his empty wagon. However, instead of continuing toward that city, he circumvented the route and returned to the cemetery, during which time his doughty captors merrily dispersed to their homes. Meanwhile, his helpers, having been well trained in their duty, had returned to the scene of their ghoulish task, had hooked the two subjects from their graves, and placed them in sacks all ready for transportation to one of the medical colleges. Two Bodies Twice Snatched on another occasion, he and two of his helpers were apprehended on Reading Road near Walnut Hills with their booty, which consisted of two bodies which they had just exhumed from a cemetery near Hartley and were concealed in gunny sacks. The three were immediately placed under arrest and taken to the Ninth Street Police Station, and the bodies were delivered to a nearby funeral establishment for subsequent identification. The following morning, the suspects were released on bail, and that afternoon, two unassuming individuals, unknown to the attendant in charge, called at the undertaker's establishment and, claiming they were from the coroner's office, demanded the bodies for the purpose of holding an inquest on them. The two bodies were released without hesitation. Upon the arrival of the proprietor, when told of the incident, he contacted the coroner's office, only to learn that the bodies in question had not been sent for or been seen. Inasmuch as there were no corpi delecti as evidence, no case could be made out against Old Cunny, and he and his confederates were released. In the Cincinnati Daily Gazette, under the date of November 22, 1870, is a news item to the effect that a body delivered to one of the medical colleges of that city was stolen by the enterprising sawbones of a rival establishment during the night. Old Cunny was therefore compelled to make another midnight expedition last night, much to his disgust, not that he dislikes the business, but that he is now getting old, and that which was once pleasant recreation has now become somewhat of a burden. Wonder if it ever occurred to that reporter that there is a strong likelihood that old Cunny himself might have been the guilty one who stole the body and resold it to a rival institution. Such episodes were known to occur. Evidently, not all of old Cunny's contraband was destined for the anatomy laboratories in Cincinnati, as judged from a news item in the Cincinnati Daily Gazette, dated January 20, 1870. According to this news report, Cunningham, the resurrectionist, deposited a box at the U.S. Express office marked Glass with Care, C.O.D. Dr. M.P. Hayden, Leavenworth, Kansas. Suspicions of the company's agents were excited, and when they opened the box, it contained the body of a Negro woman prepared for the dissecting knife and served up in a sack. The freight was returned to Mr. Cunningham. A Ghastly Revenge Old Cunny's villainous nature is well illustrated in a story told of him when he took ghastly revenge on some frolicking medical students who had played some sort of a joke on him. 
According to the story, he became so enraged with the students that he knowingly dug up the body of a smallpox victim which he delivered to the dissecting room, as a result of which the unprotected students promptly became infected with the disease. Although Cunningham probably was booked in the police records of Cincinnati more often than any other of its citizens during his time, not all of the charges brought against him were based on his resurrection activities. As mentioned previously, he was addicted to strong liquor, and because of that weakness, he was occasionally booked on charges of drunkenness and disturbance of the peace. Thus, for example, in the Cincinnati Daily Gazette on January 13, 1870, we read that William Cunningham, an express driver who will be remembered by all who have attended the medical colleges of this city, managed to get arrested last night. He first fired his brain with whiskey, and then fired off an enormous revolver on Central Avenue. The report goes on to say that he had on his person more than $70 in greenbacks, a sum, according to the write-up, slightly larger than usual for station house visitors. Evidence that Old Cunny enjoyed a lucrative income from his nefarious business is furnished by an editorial in the Cincinnati Daily Inquirer on February 21, 1871. It comments upon the poor conditions of the Wesleyan Cemetery in that city, pointing out that several of the graves look as though they had been robbed by a professional body snatcher. The heads of the graves, about two feet square in area, are sunken lower than the rest. Indeed, after consideration of the ease with which anyone can get into the grounds, it is not a matter of surprise if Cunny or some other professional has often paid nocturnal visits to the Wesleyan and obtained subjects for the various medical colleges. It then goes on to say that, when men of small means and endowed with a bare living can afford to purchase fine residences and building sites, can drive home $400 carriages right from the manufacturer, things do begin to look somewhat suspicious. It may be assumed that, by inference, the editorial writer refers to none other than William Cunningham. The Champion Resurrectionist Caught As is the usual fate of all culprits who fail to learn that crime does not pay, the law finally caught up with the hero of this tale. Old Cunny's End is best described in a feature article which appeared in the August 31, 1871 issue of the Cincinnati Daily Inquirer, entitled, The Champion Resurrectionist Caught. Under this caption, it is pointed out that everybody knows Old Cunny, the resurrectionist, whose occupation for many years past has been to supply the various medical colleges of the city with subjects for dissection, and who, it is understood, has amassed quite a handsome competency at his contraband employment. Twelve or fifteen years ago, when he was in the prime of manhood, Cunny was so adroit and careful, though daring withal, that he carried on the business almost without molestation but of late years his increasing age and infirmity have several times thrown him into the hands of the officers, though by singular good fortune he has hitherto escaped punishment. The news item then goes on to state that, Yesterday morning about one o'clock the attention of two police officers was attracted by the figure of an old man driving at a rapid rate down a Cincinnati street, followed by a crowd of men and boys running after him, hooting and hollering, Stop him! Stop him! and the like. The officers called him to stop, but he only laid whip to his horse and drove past them. The horse, however, was lame, and the load in the wagon seemingly heavy, and after a short race one of the officers grasped the bridle while the other took charge of the driver. The driver was old Cunny, who, returning after a night's work at his ghoulish employment, had been delayed on his road home by an accident to his vehicle. In the wagon was found a sack containing the dead body of a man, while a similar package on the seat beside him contained the remains of a child, a boy ten or twelve years old. Cunny was taken to the police station and ensconced behind iron bars. His contraband was put in charge of the coroner, and he entered a plea of not guilty. After paying bail to the sum of three hundred dollars, he was released from custody to answer to the charge of illegal possession of dead human bodies at the next session of the Common Pleas Court. On September 12, 1871, there appears a statement in the same newspaper to the effect that Cunningham had been indicted on five counts. No record could be found as to whether or not he had appeared in court to answer these charges, or whether or not he was found guilty and sentenced. The next news we hear of him is in the October 23, 1871 issue of the newspaper, in which it is mentioned for the first time that Old Cunny was a patient in the Cincinnati hospital, and that he regarded the announcement of his demise yesterday morning as an error. The news item goes on to say that he was suffering a temporary derangement of his system from the use of too much poor whiskey, but that he promised to be out in a few days ready for business, which he claimed was being sadly neglected during his illness. 
an appropriate fini. It is not known whether or not he was able to fulfill his promise. However, it is known from the announcement in the local daily press that Old Cunny met his demise on November 2, 1871, at the age of 64. According to Jutner, that was not the end, however, of his earthly remains. For on authority of this author, prior to Cunningham's death, he had sold his body to the Medical College of Ohio, and when he died, it was turned over to that institution by his bereaved widow, who managed to get an additional $5 bill for his giant carcass. This author also made the claim that, at the time when he wrote the statement, the skeleton of Old Cunny is to this day the piece de resistance in the Museum of the Medical College of Ohio. Jutner's claim as to the eventual fate of Old Cunny's skeleton has been verified by a statement received recently from the Department of Anatomy, University of Cincinnati, College of Medicine, where the skeleton is now housed. This is not the last we hear of Old Cunny's widow, who has been described as being a bony, brawny-jawed Irish woman with a mouth like an alligator. She had evidently taken up Old Cunny's business where he left off, judging from a news item that appeared in the Ohio State Journal of December 6, 1878, under the date line Cincinnati, December 5th. According to this news report, a gang of resurrectionists consisting of five persons was arrested in that city, including among which were two women, one of whom was the widow of Cunningham of former notoriety in this business. Upon such depraved characters as the Cunninghams did the anatomists of the 19th century have to rely for the procurement of their anatomical subjects prior to the passage of anatomy laws, which made it unnecessary to resort to the nefarious and odious practice of body snatching. Inasmuch as the identities of the procurers and of the bodies which they delivered to the medical colleges were unknown to the anatomy professors, all business transactions having been carried on through an intermediary person, usually the janitor, the professors were consequently absolved of being a principal or accessory to the crime of body snatching. Granted that anyone who would be so wanton as to make his livelihood by desecrating places of human sepulture was deserving of all the vilifying names hurled at him, nevertheless we should not lose sight of the fact that the sins of commission of the ghoulish resurrectionists were made possible by sins of omission of the public and of their representatives in the legislative halls who refused for so many years to support an anatomy law which, as time has proved, abolished the need for resurrectionists. End of Cincinnati's Old Cunny, a Notorious Purveyor of Human Flesh Read by Alan Dove Danzig by Encyclopedia Britannica This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Piotr Nater. Danzig, or Danzig, Polish Gdańsk, a strong maritime fortress and seaport of Germany, capital of the province of West Prussia, on the left bank of the western arm of the Vistula, four miles south of its entrance at Neufahrwasser into the Baltic, 253 miles northeast from Berlin by rail. Population, in 1885, 114,805. In 1905, 159,088. The city is traversed by two branches of the Motlau, a small tributary of the Vistula, dredged to a depth of 15 feet, thus enabling large vessels to reach the wharves of the inner city. The strong fortifications which, with ramparts, bastions, and wet ditches, formerly entirely surrounded the city, were removed on the north and west sides in 1895 to 1896, the trenches filled in, and the area thus freed laid out on a spacious plan. One portion, acquired by the municipality, has been turned into promenades and gardens, the Steffenspark, outside the Oliver Tor, fifty acres in extent, occupying the northwestern corner. The remainder of the massive defences remain, with twenty bastions, in the hands of the military authorities. The works for laying the surrounding country under water on the eastern side have been modernized, and the western side defended by a cordon of forts crowning the hills and extending down to the port of Neufarwasser. Danzig, almost alone of larger German cities, still preserves its picturesque medieval aspect. The grand old patrician houses of the days of its Hanseatic glory, with their lofty and often elaborately ornamented gables and their balconied windows, 
are the delight of the visitor to the town only one ancient feature is rapidly disappearing owing to the exigencies of street traffic the stone terraces close to the entrance doors and abutting on the street of its old gates the hohetor modelled after a roman triumphal arc is a remarkable monumental erection of the sixteenth century from it runs the lange gasse the main street to the lange markt on this square stands the artus or junkerhof the merchant princes of the middle ages were in germany styled junker squire containing a hall richly decorated with wood carving and pictures once used as a banqueting room and now serving as the exchange there are twelve protestant and seven roman catholic churches and two synagogues of these the most important is st mary's begun in thirteen forty three and completed in fifteen o three one of the largest protestant churches in existence it possesses a famous painting of the last judgment formerly attributed to jan van eyck but probably by memling among other ancient buildings of note are the beautiful gothic town hall surmounted by a graceful spire the armory Zeughaus, and the franciscan monastery restored in eighteen seventy one and now housing the municipal picture gallery and the collection of antiquities of modern structures the government offices the house of the provincial diet the post office and the palace of the commander of the seventeen army corps which has headquarters in danzig are the most noteworthy the manufacture of arms and artillery is carried on to a great extent and the imperial and private docks and shipbuilding establishments notably the schickhau yard turns out ships of the largest size the town is famous for its amber beer brandy and liquor and its transit trade makes it one of the most important commercial cities of northern europe danzig originally owed its commercial importance to the fact that it was the shipping port for the corn grown in poland and the adjacent regions of russia and prussia but for some few years past this trade has been slipping away from her on the other hand her trade in timber and sugar has grown proportionally nevertheless energetic efforts are being made to check any loss of importance first in eighteen ninety eight by a determined attempt to make danzig an industrial centre manufacturing on a large scale and secondly by the construction and opening in eighteen ninety nine of a free harbour at neufarwasse at the mouth of the vistula the industries which it has been the principal aim to foster and further develop are shipbuilding naval and marine steel foundries and rolling mills sugar refineries flour and oil mills and distilleries history the origin of danzig is unknown but it is mentioned in the year nine hundred and ninety seven as an important town at different times it was held by pomerania poland brandenburg and denmark but in thirteen o eight it fell into the hands of the teutonic knights under whose rule it long prospered it was one of the four chief towns of the hanseatic league in fourteen fifty five when the teutonic order had become thoroughly corrupt danzig shook off its yoke and submitted to the king of poland to whom it was formally ceded along with the whole of west prussia at the peace of torn although nominally subject to poland and represented in the polish diets and at the election of polish kings it enjoyed the rights of a free city and governed a considerable territory with more than thirty villages it suffered severely through various wars of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries and in seventeen thirty four having declared in favour of stanislaus leszczyński was besieged and taken by the russians and saxons at the first partition of poland in seventeen seventy two danzig was separated from that kingdom and in seventeen ninety three it came into the possession of prussia in eighteen o seven during the war between france and prussia it was bombarded and captured by marshal lefebvre who was rewarded with the title of duke of danzig and at the peace of tilsit napoleon declared it a free town under the protection of france prussia and saxony restoring it to its ancient territory a french governor however remained in it and by compelling it to submit to the continental system almost ruined its trade it was given back to prussia in eighteen fourteen end of danzig by encyclopedia britannica the equality of inertial and gravitational mass is an argument for the general postulate of relativity 
A Chapter from Relativity, the Special and General Theory, by Albert Einstein. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. We imagine a large portion of empty space, so far removed from stars and other appreciable masses, that we have before us approximately the conditions required by the fundamental law of Galilei. It is then possible to choose a Galilean reference body for this part of space, world, relative to which points at rest remain at rest, and points in motion continue permanently in uniform rectilinear motion. As reference body, let us imagine a spacious chest resembling a room with an observer inside who is equipped with apparatus. Gravitation naturally does not exist for this observer. He must fasten himself with strings to the floor, otherwise the slightest impact against the floor will cause him to rise slowly towards the ceiling of the room. To the middle of the lid of the chest is fixed externally a hook with rope attached, and now a being, what kind of a being is immaterial to us, begins pulling at this with a constant force. The chest together with the observer then begin to move upwards with a uniformly accelerated motion. In course of time their velocity will reach unheard of values, provided that we are viewing all this from another reference body which is not being pulled with a rope. But how does the man in the chest regard the process? The acceleration of the chest will be transmitted to him by the reaction of the floor of the chest. He must therefore take up this pressure by means of his legs if he does not wish to be laid out full length on the floor. He is then standing in the chest in exactly the same way as anyone stands in a room of a home on our earth. If he releases a body which he previously had in his hand, the acceleration of the chest will no longer be transmitted to this body, and for this reason the body will approach the floor of the chest with an accelerated relative motion. The observer will further convince himself that the acceleration of the body towards the floor of the chest is always of the same magnitude, whatever kind of body he may happen to use for the experiment. Relying on this knowledge of the gravitational field, as it was discussed in the preceding section, the man in the chest will thus come to the conclusion that he and the chest are in a gravitational field which is constant with regard to time. Of course he will be puzzled for a moment as to why the chest does not fall on this gravitational field. Just then, however, he discovers the hook in the middle of the lid of the chest and the rope which is attached to it, and he consequently comes to the conclusion that the chest is suspended at rest in the gravitational field. Ought we to smile at the man and say that he errs in his conclusion? I do not believe we ought to if we wish to remain consistent. We must rather admit that his mode of grasping the situation violates neither reason nor known mechanical laws. Even though it is being accelerated with respect to the Galilean space first considered, we can nevertheless regard the chest as being at rest. We have thus good grounds for extending the principle of relativity to include bodies of reference which are accelerated with respect to each other, and as a result we have gained a powerful argument for a generalized postulate of relativity. We must note carefully that the possibility of this mode of interpretation rests on the fundamental property of the gravitational field of giving all bodies the same acceleration, or, what comes to the same thing, on the law of the equality of inertial and gravitational mass. If this natural law did not exist, the man in the accelerated chest would not be able to interpret the behavior of the bodies around him on the supposition of a gravitational field, and he would not be justified on the grounds of experience in supposing his reference body to be at rest. Suppose that the man in the chest fixes a rope to the inner side of the lid, and that he attaches a body to the free end of the rope. The result of this will be to stretch the rope so that it will hang vertically downwards. If we ask for an opinion of the cause of tension in the rope, the man in the chest will say, the suspended body experiences a downward force in the gravitational field, and this is neutralized by the tension of the rope. What determines the magnitude of the tension of the rope is the gravitational mass of the suspended body. On the other hand, an observer who is poised freely in space will interpret the condition of things thus. The rope must perforce take part in the accelerated motion of the chest, and it transmits this motion to the body attached to it. The tension of the rope is just large enough to affect the acceleration of the body. That which determines the magnitude of the tension of the rope is the inertial mass of the body. Guided by this example, we see that our extension of the principle of relativity implies the necessity 
of the law of the equality of inertial and gravitational mass. Thus we have obtained a physical interpretation of this law. From our consideration of the accelerated chest, we see that a general theory of relativity must yield important results on the laws of gravitation. In point of fact, the systematic pursuit of the general idea of relativity has supplied the laws satisfied by the gravitational field. Before proceeding farther, however, I must warn the reader against a misconception suggested by these considerations. A gravitational field exists for the man in the chest, despite the fact that there was no such field for the coordinate system first chosen. Now, we might easily suppose that the existence of a gravitational field is always only an apparent one. We might also think that, regardless of the kind of gravitational field which may be present, we could always choose another reference body such that no gravitational field exists with reference to it. This is by no means true for all gravitational fields, but only for those of quite special form. It is, for instance, impossible to choose a body of reference such that, as judged from it, the gravitational field of the Earth, in its entirety, vanishes. We can now appreciate why that argument is not convincing, which we brought forward against the general principle of relativity at the end of section XVIII. It is certainly true that the observer on the railway carriage experiences a jerk forwards as a result of the application of the brake, and that he recognizes in this the non-uniformity of motion retardation of the carriage. But he is compelled by nobody to refer this jerk to a real acceleration retardation of the carriage. He might also interpret his experience thus. My body of reference, the carriage, remains permanently at rest. With reference to it, however, there exists, during the period of application of the brakes, a gravitational field which is directed forwards and which is variable with respect to time. Under the influence of this field, the embankment together with the Earth moves non-uniformly in such a manner that their original velocity in the backwards direction is continuously reduced. End of the equality of inertial and gravitational mass as an argument for the general postulate of relativity, a chapter of Relativity, the Special and General Theory, by Albert Einstein. Mr. Flannery Finds Himself by Anonymous from the popular magazine december twentieth nineteen sixteen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by dale growthman mr flannery finds himself by anonymous joseph m flannery the radium king who is more than six feet tall, has a diaphragm like a flour barrel, and is possessed of the energy of a fully developed locomotive, was invited to lunch on one occasion with six Philadelphia millionaires. The talk turned to health, poor health, and many of the ills that the flesh is heir to. The millionaires, according to their stories, had suffered greatly. Their talk touched on torpid livers, weak lungs, the thyroid gland, lymphatic glands, the clavicle, the poplital space, the gastrocinemius, the greater trochanther, the ventricles of the heart, and so on. Finally, the medical atmosphere became too pronounced for Flannery. Gentlemen, he said solemnly, I realize my mistake. I thought I had come to a luncheon, but to my amazement I find myself at an organ recital. The end of Mr. Flannery Finds Himself Florence Nightingale to her nurses, a selection from Miss Nightingale's addresses to probationers and nurses of the Nightingale School at St. Thomas's Hospital. Preface Parts 1, 2, and 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Twyla Johnson. Preface 
Between 1872 and 1900, Miss Nightingale used, when she was able, to send an annual letter or address to the probationer nurses of the Nightingale School of St. Thomas's Hospital and the nurses who have been trained there. These addresses were usually read aloud by Sir Harry Verney, the chairman of the Nightingale Fund, in the presence of the probationers and nurses, and a printed copy or a lithograph facsimile of the manuscript was given to each of the nurses present for private use only. A few were written to the Nightingale nurses serving in Edinburgh, the letters were not meant for publication and indeed are hardly suitable to be printed as a whole as there is naturally a good deal of repetition in them since miss nightingale's death however heads of nursing institutions and others have asked for copies of the addresses to be read or given to nurses and her family hope that the publication of a selection may do something to carry further the intention with which they were originally written perhaps too not only nurses but others may care to read some of these letters there is a natural desire to understand the nature of a great man's or woman's influence and we see in the addresses something at least of what constituted miss nightingale's power her earnest care for the nurses her intense desire that they should be perfect speak in every line they do not of course give full expression to the writer's mind they are written after she had reached middle age as from a teacher of long and wide experience to pupils much younger than herself pupils some of whom had had very little schooling and did not easily read or write the want of even elementary education and habits and traditions of discipline which grow in schools are difficulties less felt now than in eighteen seventy two when miss nightingale's first letter to nurses was written at that time it was necessary in addressing such an audience to write very simply without learned allusions though some such appear in disguise and without too great severity and concentration of style the familiar words of the bible and hymns could appeal to the least learned among her hearers and never lost their power with miss nightingale herself but through the simple and popular style of the addresses something of a philosophical framework can be seen when miss nightingale hopes that her nurses are a step further on the way to becoming perfect as our father in heaven is perfect she has in mind the conception she had formed of a moral government of the world in which science activity and religion were one in her unpublished writings these ideas are dwelt on again and again they are clearly explained in her note on a prayer of st teresa we cannot really attach any meaning to perfect thought and feeling unless its perfection has been attained through life and work unless it is being realized in life and work it is in fact a contradiction to suppose perfection to exist except at work to exist without exercise without working out we cannot conceive of perfect wisdom perfect happiness except as having attained attained perfection throughout work the ideas of the impassable and of perfection are contradictions this seems to be the very meaning of the word perfect made through made perfect through suffering completed working out and even the only idea we can form of the perfect perfect god in us grieving the holy spirit of god my father worketh and i work these seem all indications of this truth we cannot explain or conceive of perfection except as having worked through imperfection or sin 
the eternal perfect almost presupposes the eternal imperfect hence her deep interest in the laws which register the connection of physical conditions with moral actions she quotes elsewhere a scientific writer who delighted in the consciousness that his books were to the best of his ability expounding the ways of god to man i can truly say she continues that the feeling he describes has been ever present to my mind whether in having a drain cleaned out or in ventilating a hospital ward or in urging the principles of healthy construction of buildings or of temperance and useful occupation or of sewerage and water supply i always considered myself as obeying a direct command of god and it was with earnestness and reverence due to god's laws that i urged them for mankind to create the circumstances which create mankind through these laws is the way of god the letters have needed a little editing miss nightingale had great power of succinct and forcible statement on occasion but here she was not tabulating statistics nor making a business-like summary for a minister in a hurry certain ideas had to be impressed in the first place orally on minds which were not all highly trained and for this she naturally wrote in a discursive way she did not correct the proofs as the readers of her life will know she was burdened with other work and delicate health and she found any considerable revision difficult and uncongenial it has therefore been necessary to make a few amendments such as occasionally correcting an obvious misprint adding a missing word or taking out brackets stops and divisions which obscured the sense a few of the many repetitions and one or two passages only interesting at the time have also been left out the object has been to change as little as possible and i hope nothing has been done that miss nightingale would not have done herself if she had corrected the proofs the first two addresses give perhaps the fullest expression of the main theme to which she returns again and again others have been chosen chiefly for the sake of characteristic illustrations of the same thing rosalind nash part one london may eighteen seventy two for us who nurse our nursing is a thing which unless in it we are making progress every year every month every week take my word for it we are going back the more experience we gain the more progress we can make the progress you make in your year's training with us is as nothing to what you must make every year after your year's training is over a woman who thinks in herself now i am a full nurse a skilled nurse i have learned all there is to be learned take my word for it she does not know what a nurse is and she never will know she is gone back already conceit and nursing cannot exist in the same person any more than new patches on an old garment every year of her service a good nurse will say i learn something every day i have had more experience in all countries and in different ways of hospitals than almost any one ever had before there were no opportunities for learning in my youth such as you had but if i could recover strength so much as to walk about i would begin all over again i would come for a year's training to st thomas's hospital under your admirable matron and i venture to add that she would find me the closest in obedience to all our rules sure that i should learn every day learn all the more from my past experience 
and then i would try to be learning every day to the last hour of my life and when his legs were cut off he fought upon his stumps said the ballad so when i could no longer learn by nursing others i would learn by being nursed by seeing nurses practice upon me it is all experience agnes jones who died as matron of the liverpool workhouse infirmary whom you may have heard of as una wrote from the workhouse in the last year of her life i mean to stay at this post forty years god willing but i must come back to st thomas as soon as i have a holiday i shall learn so much more she had been a year at st thomas's now that i have more experience when i was a child i remember reading that sir isaac newton who was as you know perhaps the greatest discoverer among the stars and earth's wonders who ever lived said in his last hours i seem to myself like a child who has been playing with a few pebbles on the seashore leaving unsearched all the wonders of the great ocean beyond by the side of this put a nurse leaving her training school and reckoning up what she has learned ending with the only wonder is that one head can contain it all what a small head it must be then i seem to have remembered all through life sir isaac newton's words and to nurse that is under doctor's orders to cure or to prevent sickness and maiming surgical and medical is a field a road of which one may safely say there is no end no end in what we may be learning every day i have sometimes heard but have we not reason to be conceited when we compare ourselves to this person or that person naming drinking immoral careless dishonest nurses i will not think it possible that such things can ever be said about us taking it even upon the worldly ground what woman among us instead of looking to that which is higher will of her own accord compare herself with that which is lower with immoral women does not the apostle say i count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before i press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of god in christ jesus and what higher calling can we have than nursing but then we must press forward we have indeed not apprehended if we have not apprehended even so much as this there is a little story about the pharisee known over all christendom should christ come again upon the earth would he have to apply that parable to us and now let me say a thing which i am sure must have been in all your minds before this if unless we improve every day in our nursing we are going back how much more must it be that unless we improve every day in our conduct as christian women followers of him by whose name we call ourselves we shall be going back this applies of course to every woman in the world but it applies more especially to us because we know no one calling in the world except it be that of teaching in which what we can do depends so much upon what we are to be a good nurse one must be a good woman or one is truly nothing but a tinkling bell to be a good woman at all one must be an improving woman for stagnant waters sooner or later and stagnant air as we know ourselves always grow corrupt and unfit for use is any one of us a stagnant woman let it not have to be said by any one of us i left this home a worse woman 
then i came into it i came in with earnest purpose and now i think of little but my own satisfaction and a good place when the head and the hands are very full as in nursing it is so easy so very easy if the heart has not an earnest purpose for god and our neighbor to end in doing one's work only for one's self and not at all even when we seem to be serving our neighbors not at all for them or for god i should hardly like to talk of a subject which after all must be very much between each one of us and her god which is hardly a matter for talk at all and certainly not for me who cannot be among you though there is nothing in the world i should so dearly wish but that i thought perhaps you might like to hear of things which persons in the same situation that is in different training schools on the continent have said to me i will mention two or three number one one said the greatest help i ever had in life was that we were taught in our training school always to raise our hearts to god the first thing on waking in the morning now it need hardly be said that we cannot make a rule for this a rule will not teach this any more than making a rule that the chimney shall not smoke will make the smoke go up the chimney if we occupy ourselves the last thing at night without rushing about gossiping in one another's rooms if our last thoughts at night are of some slight against ourselves or spite against another or about each other's tempers it is needless to say that our first thoughts in the morning will not be of god perhaps there may even have been some quarrel and if those who pretend to be educated women indulge in these irreligious uneducated disputes what a scandal before those less educated to whom an example not a stone of offence should be set a thousand irreligious cursed hours as some poet said have not seldom in the lives of all but a few whom we may truly call saints upon earth been spent on some feeling of ill-will and can we expect to be really able to lift up our hearts the first thing in the morning to the god of good-will towards men if we do this i speak for myself even more perhaps than for others number two another woman once said to me i was taught in my training school never to have those long inward discussions with myself those interminable conversations inside myself which make up so much more of our own thoughts than we are aware if it was something about my duties i went straight to my superiors and asked for leave or advice if it was one of those useless or ill-tempered thoughts about one another or those that were put over us we were taught to lay them before god and get the better of them before they get the better of us a spark can be put out while it is a spark if it falls on our dress but not when it has set the whole dress in flames so it is with an ill-tempered thought against another and who will tell how much of our thoughts those occupy i suppose of course that those who think themselves better than others are bent upon setting them a better example part two and this brings me to something else i can always correct others though i cannot always correct myself it is about jealousies and punctilios as to ranks classes and offices when employed in one good work what an injury this jealous woman is doing not to others or not to others so much as to herself she is doing it to herself she is not getting out of her work the advantage the improvement to her own character the nobleness for to be useful is the only true nobleness which god has appointed her 
that work to attain. She is not getting out of her work what God has given it for her, but just the contrary. Nurses are not children, but women, and if they can't do this for themselves, no one can for them. I think it is one of Shakespeare's heroes who said, I labored to be wretched. How true that is, how true it is of some people all their lives, and perhaps there is not one of us who could say it with truth of herself at one time or another. I labored to be mean and contemptible and small and ill-tempered by being revengeful of petty slights. A woman once said, What signifies it to me that this one does me an injury or the other speaks ill of me if I do not deserve it? The injury strikes God before it strikes me, and if he forgives it, why should not I? I hope I love him better than I do myself. This may sound fanciful, but is there not truth in it? What a privilege it is, the work that God has given us nurses to do, if we will only let him have his own way with us, a greater privilege to my mind than he has given to any woman, except to those who are teachers, because we can always be useful, always ministering to others, real followers of him, who said that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Cannot we fancy him saying to us, If any one thinks herself greater among you, let her minister unto others. This is not to say that we are to be doing other people's work. Quite the reverse. The essence of all good organization is that everybody should do his or her own work in such a way as to help and not hinder everyone else's work but this being arranged that any one should say i am put upon by having to associate with so-and-so or by not having so-and-so to associate with or by not having such a post or by having such a post or by my superiors walking upon me or dancing upon me you may laugh but such things have actually been said or etc etc this is simply making the peace of god impossible the call of god for in all work he calls us of none effect it is grieving the spirit of god it is doing our best to make all free will associations intolerable in religious orders this is provided against by enforcing blind unconditional obedience through the fears and promises of a church. Does it not seem to you that the greater freedom of secular nursing institutions, as it requires or ought to require, greater individual responsibility, greater self-command in each one, greater nobleness in each, greater self-possession in patience, so that very need of self-possession of greater nobleness in each requires or ought to require greater thought in each more discretion and higher not less obedience for the obedience of intelligence not the obedience of slavery is what we want the slave obeys with stupid obedience with deceitful evasion of service, or with careless eye service. But now we cannot suppose God to be satisfied or pleased with stupidity and carelessness. The free woman in Christ obeys, or rather seconds, all the rules, all the orders given her with intelligence, with all her heart, and with all her strength, and with all her mind not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the lord and you who have to be head nurses or sisters of wards well know what i mean for you have to be ward mistresses as well as nurses and how can she the ward mistress 
command if she has not learned how to obey, if she cannot enforce upon herself to obey rules with discretion, how can she enforce upon her ward to obey rules with discretion? Part 3 And of those who have to be ward mistresses, as well as those who are ward mistresses already, or in any charge of trust or authority, I will ask if sisters and head nurses will allow me to ask of them, as I have so often asked of myself, what is it that made our Lord speak as one having authority? What was the key to his authority? Is it anything that we, trying to be like him, could have like him? What are the qualities that give us authority, which enable us to exercise some charge or control over others with authority? It is not the charge or position itself, for we often see persons in a position of authority who have no authority at all. And on the other hand, we sometimes see persons in the very humblest position who exercise a great influence or authority on all around them. The very first element for having control over others is, of course, to have control over oneself. If I cannot take charge of myself, I cannot take charge of others. The next, perhaps, is not to try to seem anything, but to be what we would seem. A person in charge must be felt more than she is heard, not heard more than she is felt. She must fulfill her charge without noisy disputes, by the silent power of a consistent life, in which there is no seeming and no hiding, but plenty of discretion. She must exercise authority without appearing to exercise it. A person, but more especially a woman, in charge must have a quieter and more impartial mind than those under her in order to influence them by the best part of them and not by the worst. We sisters think that we must often make allowances for them and sometimes put ourselves in their place and I will appeal to sisters to say whether we must not observe more than we speak, instead of speaking more than we observe. We must not give an order, much less a reproof, without being fully acquainted with both sides of the case. Else, having scolded wrongfully, we look rather foolish. The person in charge every one must see to be just and candid, looking at both sides, not moved by entreaties, or by likes and dislikes, but only by justice, and always reasonable, remembering and not forgetting the wants of those of whom she is in charge. She must have a keen, though generous, insight into the characters of those she has to control. They must know that she cares for them, even while she is checking on them, or rather that she checks them because she cares for them. A woman thus reproved is often made your friend for life. A word dropped in this way by a sister in charge, I am speaking now solely to sisters and head nurses, may sometimes show a probationer the unspeakable importance of this year of her life when she must sow the seed of her future nursing in this world and of her future life through eternity. For although future years are of importance to train the plant and make it come up, yet if there is no seed, nothing will come up. Nay, I appeal again to sisters' own experience, whether they have not known patience, feel the same of words dropped before them. We had in one of our hospitals, which we nurse, a little girl patient of seven years old, the child of a bad mother, who used to pray on her knees when she did not know she was heard. Her own little prayer, that she might not forget, 
when she went away to what she already knew to be a bad life, the good words she had been taught. In this great London, the time that children spend in hospital is sometimes the only time in their lives that they hear good words, and sometimes we have patients, widows of journeymen, for instance, who have striven to the last to do for their children and place them all out in service or at work, die in our hospitals, thanking God that they had had this time to collect their thoughts before death and to die so comfortably as they expressed it. But if a ward is not kept in such a spirit that patients can collect their thoughts, whether it is for life or for death, and that children can hear good words, of course these things will not happen. Ward management is only made possible by kindness and sympathy, and the mere way in which a thing is said or done to a patient or probationer makes all the difference. In a ward, too, where there is no order, there can be no authority. There must be noise and dispute. Hospital sisters are the only women who may be in charge, really, of men. Is this not enough to show how essential to them are those qualities which alone constitute real authority? Never to have a quarrel with another, never to say things which rankle in another's mind, never, when we are uncomfortable ourselves, to make others uncomfortable, for quarrels come out of such very small matters, a hasty word, a sharp joke, a harsh order, without regard to these things, how can we take charge? We may say so-and-so is too weak if she minds that. But pray, are we not weak in the same way ourselves? I have been in positions of authority myself, and have always tried to remember that to use such an advantage inconsiderately is cowardly. To be sharp among them is worse in me than in them to be sharp upon me. No one can trample upon others and govern them. To win them is half. I might say the whole secret of having charge. If you find your way to their hearts, you may do what you like with them, and that authority is the most complete which is least perceived or asserted. The world, whether of a ward or of an empire, is governed not by many words but by few, though some, especially women, seem to expect to govern by many words by talk and nothing else. There is scarcely anything which interferes so much with charge over others as rash and inconsiderate talking, or as wearing one's thoughts on one's cap. There is scarcely anything which interferes so much with their respect for us, any want of simplicity in us. A person who is always thinking of herself how she looks, what effect she produces upon others, what others will think or say of her, can scarcely ever hope to have charge of them to any purpose. We ought to be what we want to seem, or those under us will find out very soon that we only seem what we ought to be. If we think only of the duty we have in hand, we may hope to make the others think of it, too. But if we are fidgety or uneasy about trifles, can we hope to impress them with the importance of essential things? There is so much talk about persons nowadays. Everybody criticizes everybody. Everybody seems liable to be drawn into a current against somebody or in favor of everyone doing what she likes, pleasing herself or getting promotion. If any one gives way to all these distractions and has no root of calmness in herself, she will not find it in any hospital or home. All this is as old as the hills, you will say. Yes, it is as old as Christianity, and is not that the more reason for us to begin to practice it today? Today, 
if ye will hear my voice said the father to-day ye shall be with me in paradise said the son and he does not say this only to the dying for heaven may begin here and the kingdom of heaven is within he tells us most of you here present will be in a few years in charge of others filling post of responsibility all are on the threshold of active life then our characters will be put to the test whether in some position of charge or of subordination or both shall we be found wanting unable to control ourselves therefore unable to control others with many good qualities perhaps but owing to selfishness conceit to some want of purpose some laxness carelessness lightness vanity some temper habits of self-indulgence or want of disinterestedness unequal to the struggle of life the business of life and ill adapted to the employment of nursing which we have chosen for ourselves and which almost above all others requires earnest purpose and the reverse of all these faults thirty years hence if we could suppose us all standing here again passing judgment on ourselves and telling sincerely why one has succeeded and another has failed why the life of one has been a blessing to those she has charge of and another has gone from one thing to another pleasing herself and bringing nothing to good what would we give to be able now to see all this before us yet some of those reasons for failure or success we may anticipate now because so-and-so was or was not weak or vain because she could or could not make herself respected because she had no steadfastness in her or on the contrary because she had a fixed and steady purpose because she was selfish or unselfish disliked or beloved because she could or could not keep her women together or manage her patients or was or was not to be trusted in ward business and there are many other reasons which i might give you or which you might give yourselves for the success or failure of those who have passed through this training school for the last eleven years can we not see ourselves as others see us for the world is a hard schoolmaster and punishes us without giving reasons and much more severely than any training school can and when we can no longer perhaps correct the defect good post may be found for us but can we keep them so as to fill them worthily or are we but unprofitable servants in fulfilling any charge yet many of us are blinded to the truth by our own self-love even to the end and we attribute to accident or ill luck what is really the consequence of some weakness or error in ourselves but can we not see ourselves as god sees us is a still more important question for while we value the judgments of our superiors and of our fellows which may correct our own judgments we must also have a higher standard which may correct theirs we cannot altogether trust them and still less can we trust ourselves and we know of course that the worth of a life is not altogether measured by failure or success we want to see our purposes and the way we take to fulfill such charge as may be given us as they are in the sight of god thou god seest me and thus do we return to the question we asked before how near can we come to him whose name we bear when we call ourselves christians how near to his gentleness and goodness to his authority over others and the highest authority which a woman especially can attain among her fellow women must come from her doing god's work here in the same spirit and with the same thoroughness that christ did though we follow him but afar off end of excerpts from florence nightingale to her nurses
The Four Gospels from a Lawyer's Standpoint by Edmund Bennett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is, as you know, a part of the lawyer's profession to examine and cross-examine witnesses to detect their errors and expose their falsehoods, or, on the other hand, to reconcile their conflicting statements and, from seeming discord, to evolve and make manifest the real truth. And this paper is the result of an effort on my own part to ascertain whether or not, independently of divine revelation, independently of the exercise of a devout Christian faith, independently of any appeal to our religious sentiments the truth of the story told in the four gospels could be satisfactorily established by a mere reasoning process and by applying the same principles and the same tests to the gospel narratives that we observe in determining the truth or falsity of any other documents or any other historical accounts while we claim no special favours in our investigations because of any alleged importance of the subject it is only fair to expect that every one will come to this examination with an unbiased and unprejudiced mind ready and willing to accept the same evidence of truth and honesty as in other inquiries moreover since we decide many important worldly matters upon the mere preponderance of evidence and arguments why should we not adopt the same principles here it is not necessary in order to recommend the gospel story for our adoption to insist that it be proved to a mathematical demonstration and beyond the cavils of every doubter or of every unreasonable sceptic why not adopt that conclusion which has the higher degree of probability rather than the opposite if we choose neither we practically reject both in secular matters if seventy five per cent of everything that can be said on both sides of any subject leads to one result we are generally ready to adopt that conclusion in preference to the other it is you know not uncommon before deciding some important worldly matter to arrange the argument pro and con in parallel columns and thus be guided by their comparative weight to our final conclusion let us do so here i approach this subject therefore with a personal reminiscence a few years ago while writing an historical address for one of our massachusetts cities i came across in a newspaper file of the revolutionary period a letter or what purported to be a letter written from that place giving an account of a meeting held there in seventeen seventy four and a copy of some patriotic resolutions passed thereat the writer of that letter if there ever was one had long been dead all the persons said to have taken part in that meeting were also gone the printer and publisher who gave the account to the world had likewise vanished from the earth there was no person living who could make oath or testify that such an occurrence ever actually took place but yet i had no hesitation in adopting the account as genuine and using it as an established event in the history of that town the mere fact of the existence of such a document under such circumstances was prima facie proof of its genuineness and authenticity quite sufficient to justify the acceptance of it as true until the contrary be proved what would have been my joy and confidence had i found four such letters in four different papers written by four different persons giving an account of the same transaction and although in a close comparison of these four accounts some variations should have been found as to the particulars of that event would that overthrow all belief in the truthfulness of the accounts nay would it not rather furnish stronger proof of their integrity had all four accounts been exactly alike the suspicion would have been irresistible that one was copied from the other or that all were taken from one and the same original but substantial uniformity with circumstantial variety is one of the surest tests of truth in all historical narratives the several accounts of many important battles of the world and of many other historical events vary in many particulars and yet no one thereby has any doubt of their occurrence the four portraits of the father of his country painted by four different artists viz stuart peel sharpless and wright though all taken about the same period of his life vary so much in expression that you would scarcely know them to represent the same person and yet the same george washington undoubtedly sat for them all the various editions of gray's elegy and some of shakespeare's plays differ as much as do some chapters of matthew and luke in their respective accounts of the same transaction indeed what four of us could go away from this meeting and give exactly the same account of what transpires here 
what four witnesses under oath in a court of justice ever describe a transaction precisely alike and yet their testimony is taken as reliable in cases involving the most important interests even of life and death indeed judges and juries are apt to discredit a cause in which all the witnesses tell a long story in exactly the same words let us apply the same principles to the subject matter of this address the four gospels exist they purport to contain the history of our lord jesus christ the authors are not living the characters they therein describe are no more no man living knows by direct personal knowledge that these things were ever so but why not apply the same rules of evidence and belief to scriptural narratives as to any other being in existence and a minute account of passing events they must be either genuine and true or else a gross forgery there is no alternative for the self-delusion theory is preposterous they were true when written or were then an absolute falsehood if the latter they must at that very time have been known to be false and an imposition on the credulity of those then living these stories began to be published not long after the alleged crucifixion many persons were then living who could have easily refuted the statements of the evangelists had they been untrue the enemies of jesus were still alive and active the scribe and the pharisee the priest and the levite still smarted under his repeated denunciations they had the disposition the opportunity and the incentive to deny the story of the miraculous birth the spotless life the marvellous works the sublime death the astounding resurrection and the glorious ascension of our lord had the then published description of these events been totally fabulous but so far as we know no person then living ever uttered a protest against these accounts and for two thousand years they have been received and treated as veritable history again being written they must have been written by some one there they are some persons wrote them and they must have been written by either bad men or good men by liars or by truth-tellers by forgers or by honest historians that is a very elementary and simple proposition but it is the key to the whole situation one which i ask you to steadily carry with you throughout this investigation remember that every circumstance tending to disprove forgery tends on the other hand to prove truth for they must be one or the other the question then is do wicked men write such books as these do liars proclaim that they and all other liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone does the thief denounce dishonesty or the adulterer proclaim uncleanness or satan rebuke sin if then these stories were not penned by wicked men they must owe their origin to honest men and if honest and truthful men wrote them they must be honest and true narratives and not a tissue of falsehoods is not the conclusion irresistible need we go farther but let us look at the subject from four other standpoints one peculiarities of each gospel aside from the general considerations above alluded to each gospel itself contains internal and indirect but cogent evidence of its own genuineness i purposely omit all reference to the manifold external proofs of the authenticity of the gospels the number and force of which increase with every new discovery and i confine myself wholly to inherent and intrinsic evidence thereof some of these illustrations i am about to give may be found elsewhere and i lay no claim to originality for nothing new or original can now be written on this subject to present some old truths in a new setting is all i can reasonably expect to accomplish let us look at each gospel separately and see how its naturalness its conformity to what we should expect its harmony with its surroundings tends to prove its truth st matthew take first the gospel of st matthew he and he alone records the circumstance of jesus paying tribute to the tax collector of capernaum chapter seventeen verses twenty four to twenty seven how do we account for this why should matthew be more likely to mention this particular fact than any other evangelist when we remember that he was himself a tax-gatherer and therefore especially interested in and observant of anything relating to his own profession the answer is obvious so again matthew informs us chapter twenty seven verse sixty six that after Jesus' burial the jews went and made the sepulchre sure sealing the stone and setting a watch how does it happen that matthew alone mentions that fact we must remember that the people of judea as had been justly remarked were oppressively taxed under the roman dominion and that excessive taxation often leads to evasion cunning and fraud by the taxpayer and to increased vigilance caution and close scrutiny on the part of the collector accustomed therefore to suspect fraud and evasion 
Matthew would naturally be the most likely to notice and record a fact which tended to show that in so important event deception had been carefully guarded against. Would a man forging the four Gospels remember that he must make Matthew state these facts and carefully make all the other historians omit them? Naming the Apostles Again, in giving the names of the twelve apostles, a natural incident occurs, which I regard as one of the strongest proofs of simplicity and truth in Matthew. The apostles are usually named in couples, thus, Simon and Andrew, James and John, etc. One couple is described by both Mark and Luke as Matthew and Thomas, Matthew's name being first in both stories, but Matthew himself, chapter 10, verse 3, with the modesty of an honest and true man, says Thomas and Matthew putting Thomas first and himself last. Is not this so natural as to be a sign of truth? But some skeptic may say, this is only accidental, that don't prove much anyway. Read a little further and see. Matthew's occupation was then, as now, an unpopular and odious one, and the other evangelists, therefore, when speaking of Matthew, make no reference to it. But Matthew himself, with true humility, says, Matthew the publican. Another instance of this same quality is found in the several accounts of Matthew's farewell feast to his former associates when he forsook all and followed Jesus. Luke, chapter 5, verse 29, says, Matthew made a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. Mark, chapter 2, verse 15, agrees in this complimentary description of this event, but Matthew himself modestly omits all reference to himself and the magnitude of the feast, and simply says, and it came to pass that Jesus sat at meat in the house, etc. Chapter 9, verse 10, without even saying it was his own house, much less that he had invited a large company to his banquet. Is this forgery? If not, it is honest truth. Falsehood is pretentious, brazen-faced, crooked. Truth is modest, natural, artless. Straws, are they? Do not straws indicate the true course of the wind? St. Mark Let us turn to St. Mark's Gospel. Here we constantly find explanation of Jewish terms and phrases which are not found in the corresponding verses of Matthew about the same event. Thus, in chapter 7, verse 2, Mark writes, When they saw his disciples eat bread with defiled hands, they found fault. And then the writer adds this explanation, for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not. And again in verse 11, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, Mark adds, that is to say, a gift. In chapter 2 verse 26, speaking of David eating the showbread in the days of Abiathar, he explains again, which is not lawful to eat but for the priests. In chapter 5 verse 41, when he records that Jesus said to the maid, Talitha kumi, he adds, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Again, Mark writes, chapter 7, verse 34, Ephatha, and adds, that is, be opened. Why is Mark so careful to explain all these Jewish terms and phrases when Matthew is not? If we remember that Matthew, himself a Jew, was writing for Jews, who understood such terms already, and Mark, himself a Gentile, was addressing Gentiles, who did not, we have the answer. What a skilful forger must he have been to have contrived all that. St. Luke Luke also has many indirect proofs of naturalness. For instance, Luke traces the genealogy of Jesus upwards to Adam, as the Gentiles did, because he was writing for Gentiles, while Matthew, writing for Jews, as we have said, reckons downwards from Abraham, as the Jews always did. Still more, in St. Luke's descriptions of miraculous cures, the natural and genuine character of his gospel clearly appears. Thus, while the others simply speak of Christ as healing a leper and of curing a man who had a withered hand, Luke says the first was full of leprosy, and it was the right hand of the last which was withered. Again, the others say Peter's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, but Luke writes that she was taken with a great fever, in the account of the healing of the centurion's servant, Matthew simply says the servant was sick of the palsy, but Luke, with more fullness, records that he was sick and ready to die. So, in the healing of the daughter of Jairus, Matthew merely states that her father addressed our Saviour thus, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus took her by the hand, and the maid arose. But Luke, with more minuteness and tenderness of feeling, tells us that Jairus fell down at Jesus' feet, and besought him, 
that he would come into his house, for he had only one daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a-dying. And Jesus took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straight away. And again, while three evangelists mention that Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, they all stop there, but Luke alone, with his more acute observation, adds, and Jesus touched his ear and healed him. So also Luke alone mentions the compassion of the good Samaritan, he alone records the fact that the sleep of the disciples in the garden of Gethsemane was induced by extreme sorrow, that Jesus sweat great drops of blood, etc., now, why this more accurate observation and description by Luke of every circumstance of disease and of mental and physical suffering than can be found in any other historian of the same events? What was there in Luke's history or life which qualified and induced him thus to note and describe all kinds of diseases so much more minutely than the others? Turn to Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, and you have the answer where Paul, writing to the Colossians, closes his letter thus, Luke the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Did the forger of Luke's gospel conspire with the forger of Paul's epistle, the one to put into Luke's mouth words which a physician would naturally utter, but without intimating that he was a physician, and the other to simply call him a physician without giving any circumstances indicating it? Forgers do not rest content with such roundabout confirmations. On the other hand, truth-tellers do not trouble themselves to make these stories corroborate each other but these are either forgeries or true tales. So much for Luke. St. John's Gospel also contains internal proof of honesty and genuineness. Thus, in chapter 6, verse 66, soon after the miracle of the loaves and fishes, we read that from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And again, in chapter 7, verse 5, that neither did his brethren believe on him. What an admission for a writer to make, if he were concocting a stupendous fraud to impose upon the community, viz. to openly proclaim to the world that the impostor, whose pretensions he was undertaking to bolster up, could not retain the confidence of those who were in daily personal contact with him. And this from a man who was not his enemy, but his first chosen disciple and his most devoted admirer. Candor might lead a truthful historian to make such an admission, but nothing would induce a fraudulent one to do so. But still another striking characteristic of genuineness is found in John's Gospel. He omits all reference to many events which the other evangelists record in full. Thus he makes no allusion to the temptation of Jesus by the devil, to the first miraculous draught of fishes, to the healing of Peter's wife's mother, or the recovery of the leper, to the cure of the paralytic, or of the withered hand, or of the two demoniacs, to the parable of the sower, to the stilling of the tempest, or the feast of Levi to our Lord, to the prophecy of the destruction of the temple, or the parable of the fig tree, to the transfiguration on the mount, or to many other important events, to which of some he was even an eyewitness. Why is this notable omission by John of so many scenes with which he was perfectly familiar, and which the other three evangelists record so fully? if it be the fact that John's gospel was written long after the other three had been published in the world, as is generally believed, does not that naturally suggest that he probably thought it unnecessary to repeat what they had already described so minutely? On the other hand, John alone mentions many interesting and touching incidents in our Saviour's life, about which all the others are entirely silent. Thus he alone narrates the story of John the Baptist at the time the Jews sent the priests and Levites to interrogate him. He alone describes the calling of Andrew and Simon, Philip and Nathaniel. He alone records the marriage in Cana of Galilee, the driving of the money changers from the temple, the visit of Nicodemus by night, the meeting with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, the healing of the nobleman's son, the scene at the pool of Bethesda, the parable of the good shepherd, the restoring of sight to the blind in the pool of Siloam, the raising of Lazarus, etc., in John alone do we read that sweetly tender address of Jesus to his disciples, which has since soothed many a sorrowing breast. Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. Chapter 14, verse 1. Why does John record so many touching and tender events in our Lord's life, of which others make no mention? Do we not find the explanation in the fact that he was the disciple whom Jesus preeminently loved, 
that he enjoyed in a special degree his master's regard and confidence resting his head so often on his master's bosom that his mother was one of those who constantly followed jesus and ministered unto him that of the four evangelists he alone was present at the transfiguration on the mount and at the agony in gethsemane that he alone followed jesus to the cross and was present at so many other affecting scenes to which the rest were not admitted could we have more satisfactory evidence of probability and truthfulness than these several peculiarities in the four evangelists indicate what a consummate forger must he have been who could know and constantly remember all these particulars and never make a slip in his fabrications the forger of the letters falsely attributed to mary queen of scots or of the famous parnellite letters some years ago could not compare in ingenuity with a possible forger of the four evangelists may we not believe therefore that each gospel by its own internal peculiarities bears testimony to its truth and reality two confirmations in the gospels by comparing the various gospels with each other we often find confirmations of their truth and veracity a notable instance exists in regard to herod's servants in matthew chapter fourteen verses one and two and luke chapter nine verse nine we read that when herod the tetrarch heard of the fame of jesus being perplexed thereat he said unto his servants inquiringly this is john the baptist he is risen from the dead john have i beheaded but who is this of whom i hear such things the inquiry at once arises why did herod address this question to his servants what could they be supposed to know or care about jesus or about john the baptist matthew gives no reason why but on turning to luke chapter eight verse three we learn that one of the followers of jesus was joanna the wife of herod's steward and in acts chapter thirteen verse one we are told that in the church at antioch there was a teacher named manaean who had been brought up with herod the tetrarch no doubt therefore herod supposed that the higher grade of his servants could give him some information about jesus which he wanted to know and it was not strange therefore that he should address them as he did the transfiguration on the mount again after the transfiguration on the mount luke says chapter nine verse thirty six that they who had witnessed this remarkable event kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen but he gives no reason for this extraordinary silence on a subject so full of interest and wonder and which the witnesses thereto would naturally be inclined to spread abroad but turn to mark and you will find the explanation chapter nine verse nine where he records that as they came down from the mountain jesus charged them they should tell no man what things they had seen etc one narrates the command but not the obedience the other the obedience but not the command is that a contrived variation or is it the natural and accidental difference into which honest witnesses constantly fall the passover once more when mark tells us chapter six verse thirty one that after the death of john the baptist jesus said unto his disciples come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while the writer adds for there were many coming and going without giving any intimation of the reason why so many should be abroad at that particular time but on turning to john chapter six verse four the missing link appears for we learn that the passover was nigh at hand and thus the cause of the travelling multitude is obvious viz they were all going up to jerusalem to the feast the samaritan's disregard of jesus still again in luke chapter nine verse fifty one and fifty three we are told that jesus on one of his journeys to jerusalem sent messengers before him to a village of the samaritans to make ready for his coming but the samaritans would not receive him because to use the scripture language because his face was as though he would go to jerusalem why should that be a reason for not receiving him what difference could it make to them whether he was going to jerusalem or to some other city luke does not tell us why nor does he give us the slightest clue on the subject but we learn it elsewhere it is this the samaritans did not believe in jerusalem as a place of worship they had set up a temple in gerizim in opposition to the holy city as jesus was known to be on his way to jerusalem to worship there it was only poor human nature that the samaritans did not feel like paying him any particular attention when on such a journey the denial by peter in the denial by peter a notable indirect confirmation or proof of veracity occurs 
thus three of the evangelists say that when peter was warming himself in the palace of the high priest a maid saw him and charged him with being a disciple of jesus but neither of the three intimate how she knew it to be so how should a maid-servant in the family of the high priest the most exalted officer in the jewish synagogue know such a fact proud of her position in the first family in town wearing the brightest and gayest dress of all her set what should that dark-haired and dark-eyed jewish maiden know or care about the lowly and despised nazarene much less as to who his deluded followers were turn to john chapter eighteen verse seventeen and the mystery is solved there we learn that the maid who thus addressed peter was the very one who kept the door of the palace through which peter had just entered but how did that enable her to know that peter was a follower of jesus read john again chapter eighteen verses fifteen and sixteen and we find out that john first went into the palace with jesus leaving peter standing outside and then john came out and as he was going out spake to her that kept the door and brought in peter right past her she saw john come in with jesus and then go out and bring in peter and remembering what he had said to her going out she was not a very bright girl unless she could put this and that together and guess pretty well what was going on and this incident furnishes another corroboration of one evangelist by the others john speaks of only one maid who thus addressed peter others say there were two while luke says it was a man but john himself further on indirectly confirms the other three because he says in verse twenty five that as simon peter stood and warmed himself they said therefore unto him art not thou one of his disciples smiting of jesus again in the last tragic scene of our saviour's life matthew tells us chapter twenty six verse sixty seven and sixty eight that his murderers after spitting in his face and smiting him with the palms of their hands challenged him to say who smote him as if that were an impossible question for him to answer how could such a question be difficult could he not see who struck him and in the face too matthew gives no fact throwing light upon it and none is there apparent you could not understand it from matthew alone but turn to luke and the reason for such a question is obvious for luke says chapter twenty two verse sixty four when they had blindfolded him they struck him on the face and asked him saying prophesy who is it that smote thee thus we see the force and significance of the question addressed to a blindfolded man which to another would have been too simple the bearer of the cross matthew and luke say that at the crucifixion of jesus his cross was borne by one simon a cyrenian but they give no other particulars about him mark alone adds that simon was the father of alexander and rufus why mark wrote his gospel at rome for romans but what had that to do with it turn to romans sixteen thirteen and we find that rufus was a disciple of jesus and lived in rome how natural therefore that mark when writing to romans should specially refer to rufus who was then living among them and whose father had been so closely connected with the awful tragedy of the crucifixion and how natural that first the pity and then the love of rufus should have been excited for jesus by the fact that his father had borne the cross and was an eye-witness to the awful sufferings thereon the account of which no doubt he had often heard from his father's lips division of the garments one more instance of confirmation remains the division of the garments of jesus after the crucifixion furnishes a remarkable instance of the truth of the gospel narrative as confirmed by other sources john informs us chapter nineteen verse twenty three that when the soldiers had crucified jesus they took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part how is this why just four parts were there no more soldiers there on such an extraordinary occasion as that yes they had the whole band matthew chapter twenty seven verse twenty seven mark chapter fifteen verse sixteen and a centurion's band is a hundred why were only four entitled to his garments this is the explanation crucifixion as a mode of punishment was well known to many ancient nations the common and familiar practice was to compel the person to bear his cross to the place of crucifixion and to lay the cross upon the ground one end slightly raised then the victim was laid upon it with his arms and limbs extended and four of the most brutal soldiers were selected to drive four large nails or spikes through the quivering flesh of his hands and feet for which repulsive service they were entitled by custom to his clothes as a special perquisite so john told the truth four parts to every soldier a part so much for confirmations by comparison three 
variations in the Gospels. Some well-disposed persons, for the most part of the rather feeble-minded sort, are much troubled at the variations in the gospel stories about the same event, and find many stumbling-blocks in their way. Let us look at some of the events recorded in different words by the various evangelists, and we shall realize what is meant by the phrase harmony of the gospels, and that mere variations are not contradictions, but, on the other hand, often real confirmations of each other. Take, for example, the imprisonment of John Baptist by Herod. Matthew tells us, chapter 14, verses 3 and 4, that Herod had laid hold on John and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had told Herod that it was not lawful for him to have her. But Matthew nowhere intimates that they were already married. Mark alone, chapter 6, verse 17, informs us that the marriage had actually taken place. Luke adds yet another reason for John's imprisonment, viz. because he had reproved Herod, not only for the Herodias matter, but also for all the evils which Herod had done. Chapter 3, verse 19. But there is no conflict or inconsistency in these different accounts. Every word of every one may well be true. Healing the leper. So in the healing of the leper, Matthew says, chapter 8, verse 2, Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Mark adds something different. Chapter 1, verse 40, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, etc. This additional fact of kneeling Matthew does not record. Luke, chapter 5, verse 12, mentions still another feature, viz. the leper fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, etc. These variations are only successive strokes on one and the same picture. The inscription on the cross. The inscription on the cross furnishes one more and one of the best illustrations of unity in variety to be found in the New Testament. Mark, chapter 15, verse 26, says it read, The King of the Jews. Luke, chapter 23, verse 38, This is the King of the Jews. Matthew, chapter 27, verse 37, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. John, chapter 19, verse 19, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Was there no cross on Calvary because of these variations, written as they were in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin? Luke chapter 23 verse 38. Is the story of Barabbas a myth merely because one evangelist, John, says he was a robber, and two others, Mark and Luke, call him a murderer? Was there no king of Tyre because in some places his name is spelt Hiram, and in others Huram? Is there no true time of day because all the clocks in your house strike at a different moment? These many variations lead to another suggestion. If these are forged tales, they were doubtless written by the same person or by four different persons. How improbable that the same person should take the unnecessary trouble to make up four false stories about Jesus in order to impose on the world, and at the same time make them so different from each other as to excite doubts in some honest and well-disposed minds, even to this day, as to the truth of any one of them. On the other hand, how vastly more improbable that four different persons at different times and in different places should deliberately sit down without any apparent motive to write four similar fictitious stories without any knowledge of each other's work, or, if they had such knowledge, that they did not make their stories agree better with each other. It is too absurd to be worthy of even denying. Here again we may learn from secular matters that the actual occurrence of some event is not to be doubted because of some discrepancy, or even some contradiction, in details between the different narrators thereof. For instance, some historians assert that Lord Stafford was condemned to be hanged for his alleged participation in the Popish plot in 1680, while Burnett and other historians narrate that he was beheaded. But that he suffered death for the charge, though probably unjustly, no one doubts. So, in our own times, there has been for more than a century a controversy as to the person who made the public proclamation of the Declaration of Independence from the balcony of the old State House in Boston on the morning of July 18, 1776. Many accounts assert that this proclamation was made by William Greenleaf, the High Sheriff of Suffolk County, while as many more declare that it was by Colonel Thomas Crafts. But recent researches disclose the fact that Mr. Greenleaf, having a weak voice, first read the declaration, sentence by sentence, to Colonel Crafts, who stood by his side, and then the latter, in his loud and sonorous tones, repeated the same to the assembled multitude below, and thus the seeming conflict is easily and naturally reconciled. 4. Inconsistencies in the Gospels 
let us now look at some of the alleged inconsistencies in the gospel stories in reconciling differences let not the children of this world be wiser than the children of light the healing of the two demoniacs mark chapter five verse two and luke chapter eight verse twenty seven say that a man with an unclean spirit coming out of the tombs besought jesus to cure him but does it follow that matthew was false because he says chapter eight verse twenty eight two men met him if there were two there certainly was one and if there was one it does not prove that there were not two but as has been well said there is an obvious reason why mark and luke mention only one what is it there was only one who showed any gratitude for his deliverance and his case therefore impressed itself the more on their minds since the duty of gratitude for blessings received was the special lesson they were seeking to inculcate and this expulsion of the devils and sending them into a herd of swine suggests another proof of reality and indirect confirmation there was says the evangelists nigh to the city of gadara a herd of swine feeding how could that be the jews were forbidden to eat swine's flesh it was such an abomination to the jews that one of them declared that he would die rather than eat it how happened it that such animals were being raised about the city of gadara and great herds of them too turn to josephus and we read that gadara was a grecian not a jewish city and the greeks had no aversion to swine's flesh the alabaster box of ointment again because matthew and mark say that the woman with an alabaster box of ointment poured it on the head of jesus was john a falsifier when he says she anointed his feet and wiped them with the hair of her head or because john mentions only mary magdalene as coming to the sepulchre on the morning of the resurrection does it follow that the other evangelists are not to be believed because they state that other women accompanied her nay john himself although he gives the name of only one indirectly confirms the others in their statement that more persons were present than mary for he says chapter twenty verse two that mary running to meet peter exclaimed they have taken away the lord out of the sepulchre and we using the plural know not where they have laid him the sermon on the mount another difference in the story about the sermon on the mount seems to trouble some minds wonderfully matthew chapter five verses one two and three says and seeing the multitudes he went up into a mountain and when he was set his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit etc on the other hand luke says chapter six verse seventeen he stood in the plain or a level place as the new version has it and lifted up his eyes and said blessed be ye poor etc one says he was standing the other that he was sitting how is this remember this is the longest discourse jesus ever delivered probably not wholly reported either and if he became tired of standing before his sermon was finished why should he not sit down he was human like the rest of us except without sin but one says he went up the mountain another that he stood on a level place how could that be did you never partly ascend a mountain and find a plateau tableland or level place on its sides or between its depths where many people could easily be assembled is not that exactly the way it probably happened luke agrees with matthew see chapter six verse twelve that before he commenced his sermon jesus went up into the mountain to pray and then he adds in verse seventeen that he came down and stood in a level place where he lifted up his eyes and said blessed are the poor etc i do not overlook the fact that tradition still points out just such a level place between two peaks called the horns of hattin on the road from tiberius to capernaum as the very spot where the sermon was delivered but i am suggesting that the combined gospel stories point to exactly the same conclusion miracle of the loaves and fishes then came the miracle of the loaves and fishes at bethsaida this miracle furnishes a striking proof of the harmony and consistency of the gospels while using language apparently inconsistent thus luke says chapter nine verse fourteen that the multitude sat down in company of about fifty each whereas another asserts that they sat down by hundreds how so this is another of the much vaunted inconsistencies of the bible how could these two expressions be true easily enough if they sat one hundred in the front row and fifty rows deep would there be any contradiction in the two statements would that not be a literal compliance with the words of mark chapter six verse forty viz and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties how many would that be fifty times one hundred is five thousand and therefore john without saying anything of the manner of their arrangement or the order of their seats simply says chapter six verse ten 
so the men sat down in number about five thousand each writer uses different words but all the statements harmonize and blend in one consistent whole but we are not quite through with this interesting story one evangelist informs us that the next day after feeding the five thousand some of the people of bethsaida which as you know is north-east of the sea of galilee took shipping and came over to capernaum on the west side and when they found jesus over there they said rabbi when camest thou hither john chapter six verse twenty five why did they put that particular question to Jesus? Was it mere idle curiosity, or was there some special reason for their surprise and wonder at finding Jesus in Capernaum so early the next morning? Let us see. Elsewhere we learn that in the latter part of the day of the miracle the disciples took the only boat there was at Bethsaida to cross the lake to Capernaum, and Jesus was not with them, for he had gone apart into a mountain to pray as there was no other boat at bethsaida the people who thus addressed jesus naturally wondered how he could have crossed that night so as to be in capernaum early the next morning turn to matthew and you will find how it happened chapter fourteen verse twenty five he tells us that in the fourth watch of the night jesus joined his disciples on their way over to capernaum walking upon the sea and this was in the very darkest hours of the night the people in bethsaida had no knowledge of Jesus' departure and supposing he was still in the mountain on the east side behind bethsaida where his disciples had left him the night before they might well be surprised at finding him so early the next morning over in capernaum on the west side of the sea and therefore naturally exclaimed when they met him why master how in the world did you get over here this morning but still another interesting question arises if the disciples had taken the only boat there was at bethsaida on the evening of the miracle how could the other people of bethsaida who addressed jesus thus have themselves gotten over to capernaum the next morning did some boats arrive at bethsaida during the night that was an awful night on galilee and in matthew chapter fourteen verse twenty four we learn that the disciples on their way from bethsaida to capernaum had a fearful time and their ship was tossed with the waves for the wind was contrary if the wind was contrary to the disciples going westward from bethsaida to capernaum it must have been favourable to other persons bound eastward to bethsaida from the west side of the lake and so it might have carried boats towards bethsaida that night but neither matthew mark nor luke mentions any such circumstance turn now to john chapter six verse twenty three where he says howbeit there came other boats from tiberius which like capernaum was on the west side of galilee nigh unto the place where they did eat bread after that the lord had given thanks and so a wind which to the disciples going southwest from bethsaida to capernaum would be contrary was exactly a wind to carry other ships that night from tiberius northeastward to bethsaida and that is how these citizens of bethsaida might have gotten over to capernaum that morning what adroit forgers these evangelists were the one to narrate facts which would not easily have happened unless some boats had arrived at bethsaida that night but without saying so the other to have incidentally mentioned such arrival in his account of the transaction i do not positively say that the people at bethsaida did cross the lake by boat to capernaum for they might have gone by land around the end of the lake as it is not over ten miles but i simply say that the facts stated in the several evangelists all harmonize with that view although the story of no one alone brings it all out. The Healing of the Centurion's Servant Luke informs us, chapter 7, verse 3, that when the centurion heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. On the other hand, Matthew as positively declares that the centurion went himself unto Jesus, beseeching him, chapter 8, verse 5. Some critics seem to think these two statements inconsistent but are the two accounts so utterly irreconcilable let us see would it be impossible or unnatural that the centurion should first send the elders to jesus as luke says he did and after they had been gone for some time becoming anxious and impatient at their long delay that he should set out himself to plead in person with jesus for this servant was very dear unto him and so meet jesus and the elders on their way back as matthew intimates he did if this were all the discrepancy between the two accounts it might be readily explained but unfortunately it is not for luke again in verse six repeats the assertion that as jesus was returning with the elders the centurion sent friends to him saying lord trouble not thyself etc but the greek word used in this part of the story and translated sent is epemsen not the same word translated sent in verse three where he speaks of sending the elders that word apestilen from apostelo 
which always means to dispatch, to send off, etc. But this word, epemsen, used in the sixth verse, means not only to send, but also, according to approved lexicons, to lead, to escort, conduct, proceed with, and is used in that sense by Homer and other writers. If Luke intended to convey the same meaning in the second place as in the first, why did he use a different word? Therefore the centurion might himself be conducting or proceeding with his friends, and so all meet Jesus returning with the elders. Indeed, the language that Luke puts into the centurion's mouth naturally imports that the latter was personally present with his friends as they met Jesus, for the centurion said, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come to thee, but say the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Was not the man who spake these words standing face to face with Jesus? If so, it is true that the centurion first sent elders to Jesus, as Luke narrates in verse 3. It is true that in the second place he did go himself, as Matthew records. It is true that when he went himself he was accompanied by his friends, as Luke asserts in verse 6, and there is now no contradiction, but all is in perfect harmony. The case of Bartimaeus as to the healing of bartimaeus at jericho a formidable discrepancy is thought to exist viz matthew chapter twenty verse twenty nine and thirty and mark chapter ten verse forty six speak of it as happening when jesus was departing from jericho while luke chapter eighteen verse thirty five says it came to pass as he was come nigh unto jericho etc this is sometimes thought to be a serious contradiction some think it a very serious one, and their hearts quake with misgivings. But look again. Is this a variation except in a completely unimportant particular, a mere fringe of the garment? Let us look at the miracle in the perspective. The important fact, the most important fact, is, did it take place at all, or was it a mere invention? Three witnesses declare it did, and no one says it did not. All agree it was near Jericho. All agree it was in the presence of a great multitude. All agree that the party healed be they one or two, sat by the wayside begging, all agree in all the other essential particulars of the miracle. They differ in only one unimportant point. Is the main story then true or false? Did they all three fabricate the tale? For you must convict all three of false testimony to prove it untrue. Did they copy from each other? Why, then, did they not copy alike, if three witnesses should testify in court to seeing a crime committed, and all three gave the same particulars, but two said it occurred in the forenoon, and one in the afternoon, or one said it was on the north side of the road, and another on the south, would that invalidate their testimony? The Bible stories, like other narratives, must be looked at in the perspective. If three witnesses in court agree in four particulars of the same transaction, and differ in only one, where is the preponderance of the testimony? that they were all lying, or that one of them is mistaken. This and other differences in the scriptures may militate against the doctrine of exact verbal inspiration, but that is not what we are endeavouring to maintain, but simply that the variance does not from a legal standpoint overthrow the positive testimony of the three evangelists that the event actually occurred. The Two Thieves The different stories about the two thieves upon the cross furnish a very gratifying theme for criticism to some enemies of the Bible. You remember that two evangelists say that they who were crucified with Jesus reviled him and cast the same in his teeth. But Luke tells us that one of them said, This man hath done nothing amiss. Are those two accounts both false? Would it be unnatural or impossible that both malefactors should have at first joined with the insulting crowd, and afterwards that the more tender-hearted of the two should have repented in the agony of approaching death, and exclaimed, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? Nay, in our modern criminal courts, how often does it happen that when two are arrested for some offence, they both deny it for a while to the officer, and yet afterwards one turns state's evidence and convicts both of the offence? How many a mother has called her two young children to her side for some disobedience of her command, and although both at first deny it, yet moved by her tender appeals, the more conscientious of the two at last breaks down, and choking with sobs confesses the whole transaction. Do not, therefore, I pray you, give up your Bible, your religion, or your God, because of such flippant talk about the contradictions of the Gospels, come from whom it may." Thus, by undesigned coincidences, by indirect confirmations, by unexpected corroborations, by natural and for the most part easily reconcilable differences scattered throughout these four histories, may we be abundantly satisfied of the truth and harmony of the Gospels. 
the variations in these stories do not detract from their reliability but rather the opposite what would be our opinion of a man who denied the real existence of another merely because four photographs of him one a front and one a back view and two others of opposite sides of his face did not present the same features is it not from the four views combined that you get the fullest and truest idea of the person portrayed so from the combined pictures of the acts and doings of our lord in the four gospels or rather this fourfold gospel do we best comprehend the fullness of his life and power what wonder then that rousseau felt compelled to declare that if the gospels were an invention the inventor was greater than the hero or a still later than rousseau to assert that the forger of such a jesus must have been superior to jesus himself conclusion this would be our conclusion if we were judging of the gospel story simply by the light of intellect and of reason and were endowed with no nobler and higher faculties but there is a spiritual power within us which makes the same answer a faith which is higher than mere belief as spirit is higher than mind or mind higher than body there is a part of us transcending the intellect a part more deep more boundless and more sublime than that of the mind a part which no fowl knoweth and which the vulture's eye hath not seen a part by which we may claim kinship with the cherubim and seraphim that part which enables us to see with the eye of a spiritual vision and discern with a celestial insight that faith which is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen which enables young men to mount up with wings as eagles to run and not be weary to walk and not faint a faith which inspired the celebrated congregational divine dr palmer to pen that devout hymn so full of trust love and confidence my faith looks up to thee thou lamb of calvary let not therefore the criticism of the sceptic the jeers of the scoffer or the doubts of the agnostic disturb our calm confidence in the actual existence the splendid example and the divine attributes of him whose earthly life miracles and teachings are thus described in the four gospels nay let us rather with that abiding conviction derived from reason faith and love combined confidently proclaim with the inspired apostle i know in whom i have believed or with that perfect and upright man of old i know i know that my redeemer liveth yes yes jesus lives i know full well naught from him my heart can sever life nor death nor powers of hell shall keep me from his side for ever amen end of the four gospels from a lawyer's standpoint by edmund bennett The Graves of the Fallen by Rajat Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June 2021. The Graves of the Fallen. Note This descriptive account of the work of the Imperial War Graves Commission was written by Mr. Rajat Kipling at the Commission's request. The illustrations showing the cemeteries and memorials as they will appear when completed are by Mr. Douglas Macpherson. What the Commission is The Commission consists of the Secretary of State for War, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, the Secretary of State for India, the First Commissioner of Works, the Honourable Sir George Purley, KCMG, appointed by the Government of Canada. The Right Honourable Andrew Fisher, PC, appointed by the Government of Australia. The Honourable Sir Thomas Mackenzie, KCMG, appointed by the Government of New Zealand. The Right Honourable W. P. Schreiner, PC, KC, CMG, appointed by the Government of the Union of South Africa. The Honourable Sir Edgar Bowring, appointed by the Government of Newfoundland, and the following members who accepted the invitation to help in this work and were appointed by royal warrant. Sir William Garston, GCMG, GBE. Mr. Harry Gosling, CH, JP. Mr. Rajat Kipling. General Sir C. F. N. McReady, GCMG, KCB. General Sir Herbert C. O. Plummer, GCB, GCMG, GCVO. Admiral Sir Edmund S. Poey, GCVO, KCB. Major General Fabian Ware, CB, CMG. 
all letters should be addressed to the secretary imperial war graves commission winchester house st james's square southwest on one and not to any individual member of the commission its history the origin and development of the imperial war graves commission is very simple in the first days of the war the different armies engaged created organizations under the direction of the war office to register mark and tend the graves of british soldiers as well as to answer inquiries from relatives and where possible to send them photographs of the graves later a national committee was constituted which on the suggestion of the prince of wales who took a keen personal interest in the work was expanded into an imperial commission representing the dominions india the colonies the fighting services labor the great public departments interested and the british red cross which latter had supplied as it still does to a considerable extent the funds for photographing and planting the graves its finance the finance of the commission is imperial all parts of the empire have generously and unreservedly promised to bear their share of the expenses the imperial war conference having considered the proposals of the commission passed the following resolution on june seventeenth nineteen eighteen the conference desires to place on record its appreciation of the labors of the imperial war graves commission and is in favor of the cost of carrying out the decisions of the commission being borne by the respective governments in proportion to the numbers of the graves of their dead the cemeteries with the growth of the war the commission's work naturally covered every part of the world where the men of the empire had served and died from the vast and known cities of our dead in flanders and france to hidden and outlying burial grounds of a few score at the ends of the earth these resting places are situated on every conceivable site on bare hills flayed by years of battle in orchards and meadows beside populous towns or little villages in jungle glades at coast ports in faraway islands among desert sands and desolate ravines it would be as impossible as undesirable to reduce them all to any uniformity of aspect by planting or by architecture in a war where the full strength of nations was used without respect of persons no difference could be made between the graves of officers or men yet some sort of central idea was needed that should symbolize our common sacrifice wherever our dead might be laid and it was realized above all that each cemetery and individual grave should be made as permanent as man's art could devise their design and care the commission instructed sir frederick kenyon k c b to report how these aims could best be realized and he after consulting very fully with the relatives representatives of the services religion and art and knowing the practical limitations particularly in obtaining labor for carrying out such a vast undertaking recommended that in each cemetery there should stand a cross of sacrifice and an altar-like stone of remembrance and that the headstones of the graves should be of uniform shape and size stone crosses to succeed the temporary wooden crosses were at first suggested but crosses of the small size necessitated by the nearness of the graves to each other do not allow sufficient space for the men's names and the inscriptions and are also by their shape too fragile and too subject to the action of frost and weather for enduring use plain headstones measuring two feet six inches by one foot three inches were therefore chosen upon which the cross or other religious symbol of the dead man's faith could be carved and his regimental badge fully displayed the regiments have been consulted as to the designs of these badges some of which have now been approved and are ready for engraving as soon as experiments which are being carried on have shown how to overcome the difficulties of dealing with such numbers in due time then wherever a man may be buried from east africa to north russia his headstone will carry his regimental badge 
identifiable the world over. Besides the fighting forces, provision must be made for the graves of the merchant seamen and discharged men whose deaths were due to enemy action, for sisters and nurses killed or died of wounds or disease, for labor units of all races, and, indeed, for all who have served in any capacity in the war. The distinctive badges of these headstones are not yet all decided upon. Inscriptions, Registers, and Planning In addition to the name and rank upon the headstone, the Commission feel that relatives should, if they wish, add a short inscription of their own choice as an expression of personal feeling and affection. These inscriptions will be at the relative's expense, and, to avoid unduly crowding the stones with very small lettering, which, besides being difficult to read, does not weather well, it has been found necessary to restrict the length of the inscription to sixty-six letters. Footnote. In counting the sixty-six letters, the space between any two words must be reckoned as one letter. End footnote. Every cemetery will keep registers of the dead buried there, and in these registers it is hoped that it will be possible, with the assistance of his kin, to enter the age, parentage, and birthplace of each known man. The planning and planting of the cemeteries must depend largely on their site and the climate of the country, but it is proposed that, as a general rule, the cemeteries should have buildings designed for services, ceremonies, and shelter, where the register of that cemetery will be kept under permanent safeguard. To recapitulate. 1. For each cemetery its cross of sacrifice and stone of remembrance, the latter bearing the quotation, Ecclesiasticus 44, verse 14, their name liveth for evermore. 2. For each grave its enduring headstone, carved with the symbol of the dead man's faith, his name and rank, his regimental badge, and whatever text or inscription his relatives may add. 3. In the cemetery building the register in which the man's birthplace, age, and parentage can be recorded and referred to. Memorials to the Missing This matter is naturally of the deepest concern to the relatives of those whose bodies have never been recovered or identified, or whose graves, once made, have been destroyed by later battles. Their number is not small, and Sir Frederick Kenyon has suggested that the best way to record their memory would be to place a tablet on the walls or cloisters at the cemetery nearest to the spot where it is presumed they have lost their lives. In the case of officers and men in the Flying Corps, the place of whose death could not be known within many miles, the tablet might be placed in the cemetery nearest to the camp from which they had started on their last flight. But in any case, relatives may be assured that the dead who have no known resting place will be made equal with the others, and that each case will be dealt with upon full consideration of its merits as regards the site and the place of the memorial. Graves of Indian Troops The symbols of their faith will also be carved on the headstones of the soldiers of the Indian armies who fought beside their comrades from England and throughout the Empire in France and Belgium in 1914-16, to and of the Indian Labour Corps who have since worked and taken the risks of life behind the lines. A committee of the Commission has decided upon the form that these symbols should take, and has further recommended that a Mohammedan mosque and Hindu temple should be erected in France for remembrance of the sacrifice made by Hindus and Mohammedans alike in the war. The designs for these buildings have been submitted for approval in India. In all such matters, the treatment of the bodies of these soldiers will be in strict conformity with the practice of their religions, and will be carried out under the supervision of native officers. Treatment of Isolated Graves After so many years of fighting over densely populated and civilized countries like France and Belgium, it is inevitable that there must be single graves and groups in position where, when the life of the land goes forward again, they cannot be reached or attended. 
some lie in what were once town or village thoroughfares and will be so again others by the side of railway stations and goods yards houses or factories in arable or pasture fields parks gardens and the like the objections to leaving these graves where they are need not be dwelt upon no precautions save them from being encroached upon or obliterated in the course of time there is moreover a strong sentiment among all ranks that such scattered graves look lonely and the instinct of the services demands that those who fell by the wayside should be gathered to rest with the nearest main body of their companions this is what the commission with all due care and reverence proposes to do removal of bodies in view of the enormous number over half a million of our dead in france alone the removal of bodies to england would be impossible even were there a general desire for it but the overwhelming majority of relatives are content that their kin should lie officers and men together in the countries that they have redeemed the allied nations too have freely given their land to our dead for ever and that offer has been accepted by the governments to allow exhumation and removal in the few cases where it has been suggested would it seemed to the commission be undesirable if only on the principle of equality and judging from what many gallant fighters have said and written before they in their turn fell a violation in all but a few special cases of the desire of the dead themselves battle memorials memorials to commemorate the parts borne by particular armies divisions or regiments in campaigns and battles such as to name only a few the canadians at ypres the south africans at delville wood the australians at amiens the british at the breaking of the hindenburg line will be advised upon by a fully representative military committee and it is to be hoped that the best art of the empire will give its services and advice in the designing of them suggestions from the public but the work so far has only been blocked out and there is room and welcome for suggestions of every kind from the public throughout the world whose servants the commission are for example it has been suggested that the entrance to individual cemeteries should carry a text or inscription and it has been decided that monuments should be erected to the dead whose graves are unknown of a special form which has yet to be settled these are points among others upon which the commission would be grateful for expressions of opinion the progress of the work meantime the long and difficult business of identification and registration goes forward still on all fronts the various architects to whose charge the cemeteries have been allotted are preparing their designs for the planting and the building required in france and steps are being taken to prepare dignified and characteristic designs for our cemeteries in the east and elsewhere all this can be effected in reasonable time but there is no possibility of expediting the delivery of the headstones more than half a million of these will be required and at present there is not labor enough in all the world to cut carve and letter them while they are being made the wooden crosses will stand and where necessary will be renewed the registers will be filled and filed and the cemeteries will be faithfully and reverently tended end of the graves of the fallen by rudyard kipling the hamilton burr dual correspondences by aaron burr alexander hamilton and william p van ness this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. New York, June 18, 1804. Sir, I send for your perusal a letter signed C.H.D. Cooper, which, though apparently published some time ago, has but very recently come to my knowledge. Mr. Van Ness, who does me the favor to deliver this, will point out to you that clause of the letter to which I particularly request your attention. 
you must perceive sir the necessity of a prompt and unqualified acknowledgment or denial of the use of any expressions which could warrant the assertions of dr cooper i have the honor to be your obedient servant a burr new york june twentieth eighteen o four sir i have maturely reflected on the subject of your letter of the eighteenth instant and the more i have reflected the more i have become convinced that i could not without manifest impropriety make the avowal or disavowal which you seem to think necessary the clause pointed out by mr van ness is in these terms i could detail to you a still more despicable opinion which general hamilton has expressed of mr burr to endeavour to discover the meaning of this declaration i was obliged to seek in the antecedent part of the letter for the opinion to which it referred as having been already disclosed i found it in these words general hamilton and judge kent have declared in substance that they looked upon mr burr to be a dangerous man and one who ought not to be trusted with the reins of government the language of dr cooper plainly implies that he considered this opinion of you which he attributes to me as a despicable one but he affirms i have expressed some other still more despicable without however mentioning to whom when or where is evident that the phrase still more despicable admits of infinite shades from very light to very dark how am i to judge of the degree intended or how should i annex any precise idea to language so vague between gentlemen despicable and still more despicable are not worth the pains of a distinction when therefore you do not interrogate me as to the opinion which is specifically ascribed to me i must conclude that you view it as within the limits to which the animadversions of political opponents upon each other may justifiably extend and consequently as not warranting the idea of it which dr cooper appears to entertain if so what precise inference could you draw as a guide for your future conduct were i to acknowledge that i had expressed an opinion of you still more despicable than the one which is particularized how could you be sure that even this opinion had exceeded the bounds which you would yourself deem admissible between political opponents but i forbear further comment on the embarrassment to which the requisition you have made naturally leads the occasion forbids a more ample illustration though nothing would be more easy than to pursue it repeating that i cannot reconcile it with propriety to make the acknowledgment or denial you desire i will add that i deem it inadmissible on principle to consent to be interrogated as to the justness of the inferences which may be drawn by others from whatever i may have said of a political opponent in the course of a fifteen years competition if there were no other objection to it this is sufficient that it would tend to expose my sincerity and delicacy to injurious imputations from every person who may at any time have conceived that import of my expressions differently from what i may then have intended or may afterwards recollect i stand ready to avow or disavow promptly and explicitly any precise or definite opinion which i may be charged with having declared to any gentleman more than this cannot fitly be expected from me and especially it cannot be reasonably expected that i shall enter into an explanation upon a basis so vague as that which you have adopted i trust upon more reflection you will see the matter in the same light with me if not i can only regret the circumstances and must abide the consequences the publication of dr cooper was never seen by me till after the receipt of your letter sir i have the honor to be your obedient servant a hamilton new york june twenty first eighteen o four sir your letter of the twentieth instant has been this day received having considered it attentively i regret to find in it nothing of that sincerity and delicacy which you profess to value political opposition can never absolve gentlemen from the necessity of a rigid adherence to the laws of honor and the rules of decorum i neither claim such privilege nor indulge it in others the common sense of mankind affixes to the epithet adopted by dr cooper the idea of dishonor it has been publicly applied to me under the sanction of your name the question is not whether he has understood the meaning of the word or has used it according to syntax and with grammatical accuracy but whether you have authorized this application either directly or by uttering expression or opinion derogatory to my honor the time when is in your own knowledge but no way material to me as the calumny has now just been disclosed so as to become the subject of my notice and as the effect is present and palpable your letter has furnished me with new reasons for requiring a definite reply i have the honor to be your obedient servant a burr new york june twenty second eighteen o four 
Sir, your first letter, in a style too peremptory, made a demand, in my opinion, unprecedented and unwarrantable. My answer, pointing out the embarrassment, gave you an opportunity to take a less exceptionable course. You have not chosen to do it, but by your last letter received this day containing expressions indecorous and improper, you have increased the difficulties to explanation intrinsically incident to the nature of your application. If by a definite reply you mean the direct avowal or disavowal required in your first letter, I have no other answer to give than that which has already been given. If you mean anything different, admitting of greater latitude, it is requisite you should explain. I have the honor to be, sir, your obedient servant, A. Hamilton. Van Ness to Pendleton, June 26, 1804. Sir, the letter which you yesterday delivered me and your subsequent communication in Colonel Burr's opinion evince no disposition on the part of General Hamilton to come to a satisfactory accommodation. The injury complained of and the reparation expected are so definitely expressed in his, Colonel Burr's, letter of the 21st instant that there is not perceived a necessity for further explanation on his part. The difficulty that would result from confining the inquiry to any particular times and occasions must be manifest. The denial of a specified conversation only would leave strong implications that on other occasions improper language had been used. When and where injurious expressions and opinions have been uttered by General Hamilton must be best known to him, and of him only does Colonel Burr think it proper to inquire. No denial or declaration will be satisfactory unless it be general so as to wholly exclude the idea that rumors derogatory to Colonel Burr's honor can have originated with General Hamilton or have been fairly inferred from anything he has said. A definite reply to a requisition of this nature is demanded in Colonel Burr's letter of the 21st instant. This being refused invites the alternative alluded to in General Hamilton's letter of the 20th instant. It was demanded by the position in which the controversy was placed by General Hamilton on the 22nd instant, and I was immediately furnished with a communication demanding a personal interview. The necessity of this measure has not, in the opinion of Colonel Burr, been diminished by the General's last letter or any subsequent communication which has been received, and I am again instructed to deliver you a message as soon as it may be convenient for you to receive it. I beg, therefore, you will have the politeness to inform me at what hour I shall wait on you. Your most obedient and very humble servant, W.P. Van Ness. End of the Hamilton Burr Duel Correspondences by Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton, and William P. Van Ness. Read by Ryan Lohner. A Letter to a Hindu The Subjection of India, Its Cause and Cure by Leo Tolstoy, with an introduction by M. K. Gandhi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction The letter printed below is a translation of Tolstoy's letter written in Russian in reply to one from the editor of Free Hindustan. After having passed from hand to hand, this letter at last came into my possession through a friend who asked me, as one much interested in Tolstoy's writings, whether I thought it worth publishing. I at once replied in the affirmative, and told him I should translate it myself into Gujarati, and induce others to translate and publish it in various Indian vernaculars. The letter, as received by me, was a typewritten copy, it was therefore referred to the author, who confirmed it as his, and kindly granted me permission to print it. To me, as a humble follower of that great teacher whom I have long looked upon as one of my guides, it is a matter of honor to be connected with the publication of his letter, such especially as the one which is now being given to the world. It is a mere statement of fact to say that every Indian, whether he owns up to it or not, has national aspirations. But there are as many opinions as there are Indian nationalists as to the exact meaning of that aspiration, and more especially as to the methods to be used to attain the end. One of the accepted and quote-unquote time-honored methods to attain the end is that of violence. The assassination of Sir Curzon Wiley was an illustration of that method at its worst and most detestable form. Tolstoy's life has been devoted to replacing the method of violence for removing tyranny or securing reform 
by the methods of non-resistance to evil. He would meet hatred expressed in violence by love expressed in self-suffering. He admits of no exception to whittle down this great and divine law of love. He applies it to all the problems that trouble mankind. When a man like Tolstoy, one of the clearest thinkers in the Western world, one of the greatest writers, one who as a soldier has known what violence is and what it can do, condemns Japan for having blindly followed the law of modern science, falsely so called, and fears for that country, quote unquote, the greatest calamities, it is for us to pause and consider whether, in our impatience of English rule, we do not want to replace one evil by another and a worse. India, which is the nursery of the great faiths of the world, will cease to be a nationalist India, whatever else she may become, when she goes through the process of civilization in the shape of reproduction on that sacred soil of gun factories and the hateful industrialism which has reduced the people of Europe to a state of slavery, and all but stifled among them the best instincts which are the heritage of the human family. If we do not want the English in India, we must pay the price. Tolstoy indicates it. Quote, do not resist evil, but also do not yourself participate in evil, in the violent deeds of the administration of the law courts, the collection of taxes, and, what is more important, of the soldiers, and no one in the world will enslave you, passionately declares the sage of Yasna Palana. Who can question the truth of what he says in the following? Quote, a commercial company enslaved a nation comprising two hundred millions. Tell this to a man free from superstition, and he will fail to grasp what these words mean. What does it mean that thirty thousand people, not athletes, but rather weak and ordinary people, have enslaved two hundred millions of vigorous, clever, capable, freedom-loving people? Do not the figures make it clear that not the English but the Indians have enslaved themselves? End quote. One need not accept all that Tolstoy says. Some of his facts are not accurately stated. To realize the central truth of his indictment of the present system, which is to understand and act upon the irresistible power of the soul over the body, of love, which is an attribute of the soul over the brute or body force generated by the stirring in us of evil passions. There is no doubt that there is nothing new in what Tolstoy preaches, but his presentation of the old truth is refreshingly forceful, his logic is unassailable, and above all he endeavors to practice what he preaches, he preaches to convince, he is sincere and in earnest, he commands attention. 19th November, 1909, M. K. Gandhi A Letter to a Hindu by Leo Tolstoy Quote, All that exists is one. People only call this one by different names. The Vedas. Quote, God is love, and he that abideth in love abideth in God, and God abideth in him. 1st John chapter 4 verse 16 Quote, God is one whole, we are the parts. Exposition of the teaching of the Vedas by Vivekananda 1. Quote, Do not seek quiet and rest in those earthly realms where delusions and desires are engendered. For if thou dost, thou wilt be dragged through the rough wilderness of life, which is far from me. Whenever thou feelest that thy feet are becoming entangled in the interlaced roots of life, know that thou hast strayed from the path to which I beckon thee, for I have placed thee in the broad, smooth paths which are strewn with flowers. I have put a light before thee, which thou canst follow, and thus run without stumbling. Krishna I have received your letter and two numbers of your periodical, both of which interest me extremely. The oppression of a majority by a minority and the demoralization 
inevitably resulting from it, is a phenomenon that has always occupied me, and has done so most particularly of late. I will try to explain to you what I think about that subject in general, and particularly about the cause from which the dreadful evils of which you write in your letter and in the Hindu periodical you have sent me have arisen and continue to arise. The reason for the astonishing fact that a majority of working people submit to a handful of idlers who control their labor and their very lives is always and everywhere the same, whether the oppressors and oppressed are of one race or whether, as in India and elsewhere, the oppressors are of a different nation. This phenomenon seems particularly strange in India, for there are more than 200 million people, highly gifted both physically and mentally, find themselves in the power of a small group of people, quite alien to them in thought, and immeasurably inferior to them in religious morality. From your letter and the articles in Free Hindustan, as well as from the very interesting writings of the Hindu Swami Vivekananda and others, it appears that, as is the case in our time with the ills of all nations, the reason lies in the lack of reasonable religious teaching which, by explaining the meaning of life, would supply a supreme law for the guidance of conduct and would replace the more than dubious precepts of pseudo-religion and pseudo-science with the moral conclusions deduced from them and commonly called civilization. Your letter, as well as the articles in Free Hindustan and Indian political literature generally, shows that most of the leaders of public opinion among your people no longer attach any significance to the religious teachings that were and are professed by the peoples of India, and recognize no possibility of freeing the people from the oppression they endure except by adopting the irreligious and profoundly immoral social arrangements under which the English and other pseudo-Christian nations live today. And yet the chief, if not the sole cause, of the enslavements of the Indian peoples by the English lies in this very absence of a religious consciousness and of the guidance for conduct which should flow from it, a lack common in our day to all nations East and West, from Japan to England and America alike. 2. Quote, o ye who see perplexities over your heads, beneath your feet, and to the right and left of you, ye will be an eternal enigma unto yourselves, until ye become humble and joyful as children. Then will ye find me, and having found me in yourselves, ye will rule over worlds, and looking out from the great world within to the little world without, ye will bless everything that is, and find all is well with time and with you. Krishna. To make my thoughts clear to you, I must go farther back. We do not, cannot, and I venture to say need not, know how men lived millions of years ago and even ten thousand years ago, but we do know positively that as far back as we have any knowledge of mankind, it has always lived in special groups of families, tribes, and nations, in which the majority, in the conviction that it must be so, submissively and willingly bow to the rule of one or more persons, that is, to a very small minority. Despite all varieties of circumstances and personalities, these relations manifested themselves among the various peoples of whose origin we have any knowledge. And the farther back we go, the more absolutely necessary did this arrangement appear, both to the rulers and the ruled, to make it possible for people to live peacefully together. So it was everywhere. But though this external form of life existed for centuries, very early, thousands of years before our time, amid this life based on coercion, one and the same thought constantly emerged among different nations, namely that in every individual a spiritual element is manifested that gives life to all that exists, 
and that this spiritual element strives to unite with everything of a like nature to itself and attains this aim through love. This thought appeared in most various forms at different times and places with varying completeness and clarity. It found expression in Brahmanism, Judaism, Mazdaism, the teachings of Zoroaster, in Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, and in the writings of Greek and Roman sages, as well as in Christianity and Mohammedanism. The mere fact that this thought has sprung up among different nations and at different times indicates that it is inherent in human nature and contains the truth. But this truth was made known to people who considered that a community could only be kept together if some of them restrained others, and so it appeared quite irreconcilable with the existing order of society. Moreover, it was at first expressed only fragmentarily, and so obscurely that, though people admitted its theoretic truth, they could not entirely accept it as guidance for their conduct. Then, too, the dissemination of the truth in a society based on coercion was always hindered in one and the same manner, namely, those in power, feeling that the recognition of this truth would undermine their position consciously or sometimes unconsciously perverted it by explanations and additions quite foreign to it, and also opposed it by open violence. Thus the truth, that his life should be directed by the spiritual element which is its basis, which manifests itself as love, and which is so natural to man, this truth, in order to force a way to man's consciousness, had to struggle not merely against the obscurity with which it was expressed and the intentional and unintentional distortions surrounding it, but also against deliberate violence, which, by means of persecutions and punishments, sought to compel men to accept religious laws authorized by the rulers and conflicting with the truth. Such a hindrance and misrepresentation of the truth which had not yet achieved complete clarity, occurred everywhere, in Confucianism and Taoism, in Buddhism and in Christianity, in Mohammedanism and in your Brahmanism. 3. Quote, My hand has sowed love everywhere, giving unto all that will receive. Blessings are offered unto all my children, but many times in their blindness they fail to see them. How few there are who gather the gifts which lie in profusion at their feet! How many there are who in willful waywardness turn their eyes away from them, and complain with a wail that they have not that which I have given them! Many of them defiantly repudiate not only my gifts, but me also, me the source of all blessings, and the author of their being. Krishna Quote, I tarry a while from the turmoil and strife of the world. I will beautify and quicken thy life with love and with joy, for the light of the soul is love. Where love is, there is contentment and peace, and where there is contentment and peace, there am I also in their midst. Krishna Quote, The aim of the sinless one consists in acting without causing sorrow to others, although he could attain to great power by ignoring their feelings. The aim of the sinless one lies in not doing evil unto those who have done evil unto him. If a man causes suffering even to those who hate him without any reason, he will ultimately have grief not to be overcome. The punishment of evildoers consists in making them feel ashamed of themselves by doing them a great kindness. Of what use is superior knowledge in the one if he does not endeavor to relieve his neighbor's want as much as his own? If in the morning a man wishes to do evil unto another, in the evening the evil will return to him. The Hindu Kural Thus it went on everywhere. 
The recognition that love represents the highest morality was nowhere denied or contradicted, but this truth was so interwoven everywhere with all kinds of falsehoods which distorted it, that finally nothing of it remained but words. It was taught that the highest morality was only applicable to private life, for home use, as it were, but that in public life all forms of violence, such as imprisonment, executions, and wars, might be used for the protection of the majority against a minority of evildoers, though such means were diametrically opposed to any vestige of love. And, though common sense indicated that if some man claimed to decide who is to be subjected to violence of all kinds for the benefit of others, these men to whom violence is applied may, in turn, arrive at a similar conclusion with regard to those who have employed violence to them. And, though the great religious teachers of Brahmanism, Buddhism, and above all of Christianity, foreseeing such a perversion of the law of love, have constantly drawn attention to the one invariable condition of love, namely, the enduring of injuries, insults, and violence of all kinds, without resisting evil by evil. People continued, regardless of all that leads man forward, to try to unite the incompatibles, the virtue of love and what is opposed to love, namely, the restraining of evil by violence. And such a teaching, despite its inner contradiction, was so firmly established that the very people who recognize love as a virtue accept as lawful, at the same time, an order of life based on violence and allowing men not merely to torture, but even to kill one another. For a long time, people lived in this obvious contradiction without noticing it. But a time arrived when this contradiction became more and more evident to thinkers of various nations. And the old and simple truth that it is natural for men to help and to love one another, but not to torture and to kill one another, became ever clearer, so that fewer and fewer people were able to believe the sophistries by which the distortion of the truth had been made so plausible. In former times, the chief method of justifying the use of violence and thereby infringing the law of love was by claiming a divine right for the rulers, the tsars, sultans, rajas, shahs, and other heads of state. But the longer humanity lived, the weaker grew the belief in this peculiar, God-given right of the ruler. That belief withered in the same way and almost simultaneously in the Christian and the Brahman world, as well as in Buddhist and Confucian spheres, and in recent times it has so faded away as to prevail no longer against man's reasonable understanding and the true religious feeling. People saw more and more clearly, and now the majority see quite clearly, the senselessness and immorality of subordinating their wills to those of other people just like themselves, when they are bidden to do what is contrary not only to their interests, but also to their moral sense. And so one might suppose that having lost confidence in any religious authority for a belief in the divinity of potentates of various kinds, people would try to free themselves from subjection to it, but, unfortunately, not only were the rulers, who were considered supernatural beings, benefited by having the peoples in subjection, but as a result of the belief in, and during the rule of, these pseudo-divine beings, ever larger and larger circles of people grouped and established themselves around them, and, under an appearance of governing, took advantage of the people. And when the old deception of a supernatural and God-appointed authority had dwindled away, these men were only concerned to devise a new one, which, like its predecessor, should make it possible to hold the people in bondage to a limited number of rulers. 4. Quote, Children, do you want to know by what your hearts should be guided? Throw aside your longings and strivings after that which is null and void. 
Get rid of your erroneous thoughts about happiness and wisdom, and your empty and insincere desires. Dispense with these, and you will know love. Krishna Quote, Be not the destroyers of yourselves. Arise to your true being, and then you will have nothing to fear. Krishna New justifications have now appeared in place of the antiquated, obsolete religious ones. These new justifications are just as inadequate as the old ones, but as they are new, their futility cannot immediately be recognized by the majority of men. Besides this, those who enjoy power propagate these new sophistries and support them so skillfully that they seem irrefutable even to many of those who suffer from the oppression these theories seek to justify. These new justifications are termed scientific, but by the term scientific is understood just what was formerly understood by the term religious, just as formerly everything called religious was held to be unquestionable simply because it was called religious, so now all that is called scientific is held to be unquestionable. In the present case, the obsolete religious justification of violence, which consisted in the recognition of the supernatural personality of the God-ordained ruler, quote, there is no power but of God, end quote, has been superseded by the quote-unquote scientific justification, which puts forward first the assertion that because the coercion of man by man has existed in all ages, it follows that such coercion must continue to exist. This assertion that people should continue to live as they have done throughout past ages, rather than as their reason and conscience indicate, is what quote-unquote science calls the historic law. A further quote-unquote scientific justification lies in the statement that as among plants and wild beasts there is a constant struggle for existence which always results in the survival of the fittest, a similar struggle should be carried on among human beings. Beings, that is, who are gifted with intelligence and love, faculties lacking in the creatures subject to the struggle for existence and survival of the fittest. Such is the second, quote-unquote, scientific justification. The third, most important, and unfortunately most widespread justification is at the bottom the age-old religious one, just a little altered. That in public life, the suppression of some for the protection of the majority cannot be avoided. So that coercion is unavoidable, however desirable, reliance on love alone might be in human intercourse. The only difference in this justification by pseudoscience consists in the fact that to the question why such and such people and not others have the right to decide against whom violence may and must be used, pseudoscience now gives a different reply to that given by religion, which declared that the right to decide was valid because it was pronounced by persons possessed of divine power. Quote unquote, science says that these decisions represent the will of the people, which, under a constitutional form of government, is supposed to find expression in all the decisions and actions of those who are at the helm at the moment. Such are the scientific justifications of the principle of coercion. They are not merely weak, but absolutely invalid. Yet they are so much needed by those who occupy privileged positions that they believe in them as blindly as they formerly believed in the Immaculate Conception, and propagate them just as confidently. And the unfortunate majority of men, bound to toil, is so dazzled by the pomp with which these quote-unquote scientific truths are presented, that under this new influence it accepts the scientific stupidities for holy truth, just as it formerly accepted the pseudo-religious justifications and it continues to submit to the present holders of power, who are just as hard-hearted, but rather more numerous than before. 5. Quote, who am I? I am that which thou hast searched for, 
since thy baby eyes gazed wonderingly upon the world, whose horizon hides this real life from thee. I am that which in thy heart thou hast prayed for, demanded as thy birthright, although thou hast not known what it was. I am that which has lain in thy soul for hundreds and thousands of years. Sometimes I lay in thee grieving, because thou didst not recognize me. Sometimes I raised my head, opened my eyes, and extended my arms, calling thee either tenderly and quietly, or strenuously, demanding that thou shouldst rebel against the iron chains which bound thee to the earth. Krishna So matters went on, and still go on, in the Christian world. But we might have hoped that in the immense Brahman, Buddhist, and Confucian worlds, this new scientific superstition would not establish itself, and that the Chinese, Japanese, and Hindus, once their eyes were opened to the religious fraud justifying violence, would advance directly to a recognition of the law of love inherent in humanity, and which had been so forcibly enunciated by the great Eastern teachers. But what has happened is that the scientific superstition replacing the religious one has been accepted and secured a stronger and stronger hold in the East. In your periodical, you set out as the basic principle which should guide the actions of your people the maxim that resistance to aggression is not simply justifiable but imperative. Non-resistance hurts both altruism and egotism. Love is the only way to rescue humanity from all ills, and in it you too have the only method of saving your people from enslavement. In very ancient times, love was proclaimed with special strength and clearness among your people to be the religious basis of human life. Love and forcible resistance to evildoers involves such a mutual contradiction as to destroy utterly the whole sense and meaning of the conception of love. And what follows? With a light heart and in the twentieth century, you, an adherent of a religious people, deny their law, feeling convinced of your scientific enlightenment and your right to do so. And you repeat, do not take this amiss, the amazing stupidity indoctrinated in you by the advocates of the use of violence, the enemies of truth, the servants first of theology and then of science, your European teachers. You say that the English have enslaved your people and hold them in subjection because the latter have not resisted resolutely enough and have not met force by force. But the case is just the opposite. If the English have enslaved the people of India, it is just because the latter recognized, and still recognize, force as the fundamental principle of the social order. In accord with that principle, they submitted to their little rajas, and on their behalf struggled against one another, fought the Europeans, the English, and are now trying to fight with them again. A commercial company enslaved a nation comprising two hundred millions. Tell this to a man free from superstition, and he will fail to grasp what these words mean. What does it mean that thirty thousand men, not athletes but rather weak and ordinary people, have subdued two hundred million vigorous, clever, capable, and freedom-loving people? Do not the figures make it clear that it is not the English who have enslaved the Indians, but the Indians who have enslaved themselves. When the Indians complain that the English have enslaved them, it is as if drunkards complained that the spirit dealers who have settled among them have enslaved them. You tell them that they might give up drinking, but they reply that they are so accustomed to it that they cannot abstain, that they must have alcohol to keep up their energy. Is it not the same thing with the millions of people who submit to thousands or even hundreds of others of their own or other nations? If the people of India are enslaved by violence, it is only because they themselves live and have lived by violence, 
and do not recognize the eternal law of love inherent in humanity. Quote, Pitiful and foolish is the man who seeks what he already has, and does not know that he has it. Yes, pitiful and foolish is he who does not know the bliss of love which surrounds him and which I have given him. Krishna As soon as men live entirely in accord with the law of love natural to their hearts and now revealed to them, which excludes all resistance by violence, and therefore hold aloof from all participation in violence, as soon as this happens, not only will hundreds be enabled to enslave millions, but not even millions will be able to enslave a single individual. Do not resist the evil doer and take no part in doing so, either in the violent deeds of the administration, in the law courts, the collection of taxes, or above all in soldiering, and no one in the world will be able to enslave you. 6. Quote, o ye who sit in bondage, and continually seek and pant for freedom, seek only for love. Love is peace in itself, and peace which gives complete satisfaction. I am the key that opens the portal to the rarely discovered land where contentment alone is found. Krishna What is now happening to the people of the East as of the West is like what happens to every individual when he passes from childhood to adolescence and from youth to manhood. He loses what had hitherto guided his life and lives without direction, not having found a new standard suitable to his age, and so he invents all sorts of occupations, cares, distractions, and stupefactions to divert his attention from the misery and senselessness of his life. Such a condition may last a long time. When an individual passes from one period of life to another, a time comes when he cannot go on in senseless activity and excitement as before, but has to understand that although he has outgrown what before used to direct him, this does not mean that he must live without any reasonable guidance, but rather that he must formulate for himself an understanding of life corresponding to his age, and having elucidated it, must be guided by it. And in the same way, a similar time must come in the growth and development of humanity. I believe that such a time has now arrived, not in the sense that it has come in the year 1908, but that the inherent contradiction of human life has now reached an extreme degree of tension. On the one hand, there is the consciousness of the beneficence of the law of love, and on the other, the existing order of life, which has for centuries occasioned an empty, anxious, restless, and troubled mode of life, conflicting as it does with the law of love and built on the use of violence. This contradiction must be faced, and the solution will evidently not be favorable to the outlived law of violence, but to the truth which has dwelt in the hearts of men from remote antiquity, the truth that the law of love is in accord with the nature of man. But man can only recognize this truth to its full extent when they have completely freed themselves from all religious and scientific superstitions, and from all the consequent misrepresentations and sophistical distortions by which its recognition has been hindered for centuries. To save a sinking ship, it is necessary to throw overboard the ballast, which, though it may once have been needed, would now cause the ship to sink. And so it is with the scientific superstition which hides the truth of their welfare from mankind. In order that men should embrace the truth, not in the vague way they did in childhood, nor in the one-sided and perverted way presented to them by their religious and scientific teachers, but embrace it as their highest law, the complete liberation of this truth from all and every superstition, both pseudo-religious and pseudo-scientific, by which it is still obscured, is essential. Not a partial, timid attempt, reckoning with traditions sanctified by age and with the habits of the people, 
Not such as was affected in the religious sphere by Guru Nanak, the founder of the sect of the Sikhs, and in the Christian world by Luther, and by similar reformers in other religions, but a fundamental cleansing of religious consciousness from all ancient religious and modern scientific superstitions. If only people freed themselves from their beliefs in all kinds of Ormuzds, Brahmas, Sabayaths, and their incarnation as Krishnas and Christs, from beliefs in paradises and hells, in reincarnations and resurrections, from the belief in the interference of the gods in the external affairs of the universe, and above all, if they free themselves from belief in the infallibility of all the various Vedas, Bibles, Gospels, Tripitakas, Qurans, and the like, and also free themselves from blind belief in a variety of scientific teachings about infinitely small atoms and molecules, and in all the infinitely great and infinitely remote worlds, their movements and origin, as well as from faith in the infallibility of the scientific law to which humanity is at present subjected, the historic law, the economic laws, the law of struggle and survival, and so on, if people only freed themselves from this terrible accumulation of futile exercises for lower capacities of mind and memory, called the sciences, and from the innumerable divisions of all sorts of histories, anthropologies, homiletics, bacteriologics, jurisprudences, cosmographies, strategies, their name is legion, and free themselves from all this harmful, stupefying ballast. The simple law of love, natural to man, accessible to all, and solving all questions and perplexities, would of itself become clear and obligatory. 7. Quote, Children, look at the flowers at your feet, do not trample upon them. Look at the love in your midst, and do not repudiate it. Krishna. Quote, there is a high reason which transcends all human minds. It is far and near. It permeates all the worlds, and at the same time is infinitely higher than they. A man who sees that all things are contained in the higher spirit cannot treat any being with contempt. For him to whom all spiritual beings are equal to the highest, there can be no room for deception or grief. Those who are ignorant and are devoted to the religious rites only are in a deep gloom, but those who are given up to fruitless meditations are in a still greater darkness. Upanishads from Vedas Yes, in our time, all these things must be cleared away in order that mankind may escape from self-inflicted calamities that have reached an extreme intensity. Whether an Indian seeks liberation from subjection to the English, or anyone else struggles with an oppressor, either of his own nationality or of another, whether it be a Negro defending himself against the North Americans, or Persians, Russians, or Turks against the Persian, Russian, or Turkish governments, or any man seeking the greatest welfare for himself and for everybody else, they do not need explanations and justifications of old religious superstitions such as have been formulated by your Vivekanandas, Baba Bharatis, and others, or in the Christian world by a number of similar interpreters and exponents of things that nobody needs, nor the innumerable scientific theories about matters not only unnecessary but for the most part harmful. In the spiritual realm nothing is indifferent. What is not useful is harmful. What are wanted for the Indian, as for the Englishman, the Frenchman, the German, and the Russian, are not constitutions and revolutions, nor all sorts of conferences and congresses, nor the many ingenious devices for submarine navigation and aerial navigation, nor powerful explosives, nor all sorts of conveniences to add to the enjoyment of the rich ruling classes, nor new schools and universities with innumerable faculties of science, nor an augmentation of papers and books, nor gramophones and cinematographs, nor those childish and for the most part corrupt stupidities termed art, 
but one thing only is needful, the knowledge of the simple and clear truth which finds place in every soul that is not stupefied by religious and scientific superstitions, the truth that for our life one law is valid, the law of love, which brings the highest happiness to every individual as well as to all mankind. Free your minds from those overgrown, mountainous imbecilities which hinder your recognition of it, and at once the truth will emerge from amid the pseudo-religious nonsense that has been smothering it. The indubitable, eternal truth inherent in man, which is one and the same in all the great religions of the world, it will in due time emerge and make its way to general recognition and the nonsense that has obscured it will disappear of itself, and with it will go the evil from which humanity now suffers. Quote, Children, look upwards with your beclouded eyes, and a world full of joy and love will disclose itself to you, a rational world made by my wisdom, the only real world. Then you will know what love has done with you, what love has bestowed upon you, what love demands from you. Krishna. Yasna Palana, December 14th, 1908. End of A Letter to a Hindu by Leo Tolstoy. Stories of Inventors by Russell Doubleday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by J. Randolph A machine that thinks. A typesetting machine that makes mathematical calculations. For many years it was thought impossible to find a shortcut from the author's manuscript to printing press, that is, to substitute a machine for the skilled hands that set the type from which a book or magazine is printed. Inventors have worked at this problem, and a number have solved it in various ways. To one who has seen the slow work of hand typesetting as the compositor builds up a long column of metal, piece by piece, letter by letter, picking up each character from its allotted space in the case, and placing it in its proper order and position, and then realizes that much of the printed matter he sees is so produced, the wonder is how the enormous amount of it is ever accomplished. In a page of this size there are more than a thousand separate pieces of type, which, if set by hand, would have to be taken one by one and placed in the compositor's stick then when the line is nearly set it would have to be spaced out or justified to fill out the line exactly then when the compositor's stick is full or two and a half inches have been set the type has to be taken out and placed in a long channel or galley each of these three operations requires considerable time and close application and with each change there is the possibility of error it is a long, expensive process. A perfect typesetting machine should take the place of the hand compositor, setting the type letter by letter automatically, in proper order, at a maximum speed and with a minimum chance of error. These three steps of hand composition, slow, expensive, open to many chances of mistake, have been covered at one stride, at five times the speed, at one-third the cost, and much more accurately by a machine invented by Mr. Tolbert Lanston. The operator of the Lanston machine sits at a keyboard, much like a typewriter in appearance, containing every character in common use, 225 in all, and at a speed limited only by his dexterity, he plays on the keys exactly as a typewriter works his machine. This is the sum total of human effort expended. The machine does all the rest of the work, makes the calculations, and delivers the product in clean, shining new type, each piece perfect, each in its place, each line of exactly the right length, 
and each space between the words mathematically equal, absolutely justified. It is practically hand composition with the human possibility of error, of weariness, of inattention, of ignorance, eliminated, and all accomplished with a celerity that is astonishing. This machine is a typecasting machine as well as a typesetter. It casts the type, individual characters it sets, perfect in face and body, capable of being used in hand composition or put to press directly from the machine and printed from. As each piece of type is separate, alterations are easily made. The type for correction, which the machine itself casts for the purpose, a lot of A's, B's, etc., is simply substituted for the words misspelled or incorrectly used, as in hand composition. The Lanston machine is composed of two parts, the keyboard and the casting setting machine. The keyboard part may be placed wherever convenient, away from noise or anything that is likely to distract or interrupt the operator, and the perforated roll of paper produced by it, which governs the setting machine, may be taken away as fast as it is finished. In the setting casting machine is located the brains. The five-inch roll of paper, perforated by the keyboard machine, a hole for every letter, gives the signal by means of compressed air to the mechanism that puts the matrix, or type mold, in position and casts the type letter by letter, each character following the proper sequence as marked by the perforations of the paper ribbon. By means of an indicator scale on the keyboard, the operator can tell how many spaces there are between the words of the line and the remaining space to be filled out to make the line the proper width. This information is marked by perforations on the paper ribbon by the pressure of two keys, and when the ribbon is transferred to the casting machine, these space perforations so govern the casting that the line of type delivered at the galley complete shall be of exactly the proper length, and the spaces between the words be equal to the infinitesimal fraction of an inch. The casting machine is an ingenious mechanism of many complicated parts. In a word, the melted metal, a composition of zinc and lead, is forced into a mold of the letter to be cast. 225 of these molds are collected in a steel frame about 3 inches square, and cool water is kept circulating about them, so that almost immediately after the molten metal is injected into the lines and dots of the letter cut in the mold, it hardens and drops into its slot, a perfect piece of type. All this is accomplished at a rate of four or five thousand m's per hour of the size of type used on this page. The letter m is the unit of measurement when the amount of any piece of composition is to be estimated, and it is written em. If this page were set by hand, taking a compositor of more than average speed as a basis for figuring, at least one hour of steady work would be required. But this page set by the Lanston machine, the operator being of the same grade as the hand compositor, would require hardly more than fifteen minutes from the time the manuscript was put into the operator's hands to the delivery complete of the newly cast type in galleys ready to be made up into pages, if the process were carried on continuously. This marvelous machine is capable of setting almost any size of type, from the minute agate to and including pica, a letter more than one-eighth of an inch high, and a line of almost any desired width, the change from one size to any other requiring but a few minutes. The Lanston machine sets up tables of figures, poetry, and all those difficult pieces of composition that so try the patience of the hand compositor. It is called the monotype because it casts and sets up the type piece by piece. Another machine, invented by Mergenthaler, practically sets up the molds, by a sort of typewriter arrangement, for a line at a time, and then a casting is taken of a whole line at once. This machine is used much in newspaper offices, where the cleverness of the compositor has to be depended upon, and there is little or no time for corrections. Several other machines set the regular type that is made in type foundries, 
the type being placed in long channels, all of the same sort, in the same grooves, and slipped or set in its proper place by the machine operated by a man at the keyboard. These machines require a separate mechanism that distributes each type in its proper place after use, or else a separate compositor must be employed to do this by hand. The machines that set foundry type, moreover, require a great stock of it, just as many hundred pounds of expensive type are needed for hand composition. Though a machine has been invented that will put an author's words into type, no mechanism has yet been invented that will do away with type altogether. It is one of the problems still to be solved. End of A Machine That Thinks From Stories of Inventors by Russell Doubleday Not Revolution, but Evolution Excerpt from Tython and Aurora by Johann Gottfried Herder, 1744-1803. to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tython and Aurora beginning on page 244. Let us now speak of waking and rejuvenescence. How is this brought about? By revolution? I confess that among the misused words of our modern fashionable vocabulary, few are so displeasing to me as this, because it is entirely departed from its original pure signification and carries with it the most mischievous confusion of thought in astronomy we call revolution a movement of the great world bodies which returns to itself determined by measure number and forces a movement which is not only the most peaceful order in itself but in connection with other harmonious powers establishes the kingdom of eternal order thus the earth revolves around itself and makes day and night and by means of these arranges and regulates the sleep and the waking of its creatures their time for rest and the circle of their occupations thus the earth moves around the sun and makes the year and by means of that the seasons and by means of them the changes of labor and of mortal enjoyment the revolution of the moon around our earth gives to the sea its ebb and flood determines the periods of diseases and perhaps of the growth of plants in this sense it is useful to notice revolutions for in them we observe a course of affairs which returns into itself and in that course of things the laws of a perpetual order in such a course there is nothing abrupt arbitrary without reason there is nothing of destruction in it but a gently vibrating thread of conservation revolutions of this kind are the dance of the hours around the throne of jupiter they are the chaplet of victory on the immortal head of the god after the conquest of chaos also if we draw down this idea of revolution from heaven to earth it can be no other than the idea of a silent progress of things of a reappearance of certain phenomena according to their peculiar nature consequently of the design of an ever-working wisdom order and goodness in this sense we speak of the revolution of arts and sciences that is a periodical return of them the causes of which we endeavor to investigate in history and as it were to calculate astronomically thus the pythagoreans spoke of the revolutions of the human soul that is of its periodical return into other forms thus have men investigated the laws of the revolution of human thoughts when they return from oblivion into remembrance when visions and desires when activities and passions which had gone to sleep reappear once more 
in all these things it has been attempted to discover the laws of a hidden silent order of nature but the meaning of this word has undergone a detestable change because in the barbarous centuries men knew of no other revolutions than conquests overturns oppressions confusions without motive aim or order then it was called revolution when the nethermost was made uppermost when by the so-called right of war a nation lost more or less of its property its laws its goods or when by the right of monarchy all those so-called rights were enforced which st thomas machiavel and naudi afterwards collected from actual events and brought together in one chapter then finally it was called a revolution when the ministers did what the rulers themselves would not do or when here and there the people undertook that which they could rarely execute so well as kings and ministers hence the numerous histories des revolutions a kind of book whose title is all the more popular that its contents are for the most part unintelligible or abominable the notion of an aim or object was almost lost sight of history became an exhibition of entanglements without a denouement for after the conclusion of each revolution so called the confusion in the kingdoms where they occurred was greater than before revolutions of this sort whencesoever they may derive their origin are signs of barbarism of an insolent force of a mad wilfulness the more reason and moderation increase among men the rarer they will become until at last they entirely disappear then the word revolution will revert to its pure and true meaning then it will mean in history also as elsewhere a course of things arranged according to laws a course of events which peacefully returns into itself in this view alone is history worth the study for as to the revolutions of wild elephants when they tear up trees and devastate villages from these there is not much to be learned not to mislead therefore with this abused word and not to make destructive violence a medicine for mortal ills we will keep the path of healing nature not revolutions but evolutions are the silent process of the great mother wherewith she awakens slumbering powers brings germs to maturity gives renewed youth to premature age and new life to seeming death let us see what this remedy comprehends and how it heals if we suppose nature to have an aim on the earth that aim can be no other than the development of her powers in all forms kinds and ways these evolutions proceed slowly often imperceptibly and for the most part they appear periodically after a night of sleep follows a morning of awakening under the shade of the former nature had recollected her powers in order to meet the latter with spirit in the ages of man childhood continues long body and mind advance with a slow growth until with collected energies the flower of youth breaks forth and the fruit of later years comes gradually to maturity very improperly have these periods of development been called revolutions there is nothing here that revolves but faculties are evolved developed ever the more recondite and deeper line come forth to view which without many a preceding one could not have been brought into action therefore nature made periods she gave the creature time to recover itself from one exertion gone through with in order to begin with joy and to accomplish another and more difficult for when the plant puts forth a flower or when the fruit is forming in it unquestionably more inward and finer forces are put in action than when the sap was entering the stem and the lowest leaves were brought forth in the ordinary course of things nature does not leave her work until all its physical powers have been brought into action 
the innermost as it were turned outward and the development which at every step is assisted by a kindly epigenesis has become as perfect as it could become under the given conditions men are accustomed to regard each individual object and especially each living individual as an isolated whole but a nearer view shows it to be connected with soil climate weather and with the periodical breath of all nature and that according to these it lasts for a longer or shorter time grows early old or easily renews its youth man a rational moral and political creature lives by means of these capacities and powers in a peculiar and infinitely extended element his reason is connected with the reason of others his moral culture with the conduct of others his capacity to constitute himself a free being both in himself and in connection with others is so intimately connected with the way of thinking the reasonableness the active enterprise of many that out of this element he must needs be like a fish on dry land or a bird in a space destitute of air his best powers die out his capacity remains a dead capability and all effort out of time and place and without the cooperation of the elements is like a flower in the midst of winter it is nature that makes seasons it is she that furthers capacities she furthers them also in human kind individual men classes corporations whole societies and nations can only advance with this stream they have done all if they steer wisely upon it let no one think that if all the regents of the earth from the proudest negro king to the mightiest khan of the tartars should combine to make to-day yesterday and to hinder forever the progressive development of the human race whether it lead to youth or to old age they could ever accomplish their aim this can never be an aim with wise rulers simply because there is no sense in such fruitless endeavour a wise ruler then will always regard himself as the householder not as the antagonist of nature he will improve every circumstance which she offers to the best issues here leaves are falling there a whole autumn of leaves lie already in their shrouds he will not attempt to restore them again to their former places on limb and twig can he give them back their former freshness and sap which made them a living whole with the tree on which they hung and if he cannot do this how then will he crown himself with a withered wreath of dried leaves because they were other once than they are now what nature could not keep will the gardener keep it and that too not in conformity with the ends of nature but in direct opposition to them infinitely more beautiful the task to follow nature to mark her times to awaken powers whenever they slumber to promote thought activity invention joy and love in whatsoever field of useful employment necessity comes at last and compels with iron sceptre he who obeys reason and measure will prevent necessity often he will need only to beckon with a lily staff of oberon and here new flowers will spring instead of the withered ones and there if the blossom time is past nourishing fruits will come to maturity he will come to the aid of the young shoot and take it under his protection against oppressive weeds the old wild tree he will not cut down but graft more genial fruits upon it and the rejuvenized tree will wonder itself at its nobler existence a slight anticipation of this kind by which one nation had got the start of another has often secured to it for centuries unattainable advantages england acquired the position which she now occupies by a somewhat earlier adoption and application of certain points of constitutional finance and commerce which had long before germinated in other countries but which folly and passion had suppressed 
after many violent revolutions, which passed over her like bloody thunder showers, it was given to the most peaceful and silent revolution to awaken her new activity, and thereby to establish for centuries the prosperity of a living constitution. If in the time of William the Third she had attempted to renew the feudal, military, and forest laws of William the Conqueror, where would she be now? All orders and arrangements of society are the children of time this ancient mother produced nourished educated them she adorned and fitted them out and after a longer or shorter term of life she buries them as she buries and renews herself whoever therefore confounds his own being with the duration of an order or institution gives himself unnecessary torment that which was before thee will be behind thee too if it is to be for thine own part, act understandingly and wisely. Time will proceed in its great course and accomplish its own. Be in thine own person more than thine order, and then, however that may grow old, thou wilt be for thyself and for others always young. Yea, the darker the night, the brighter shalt thou beam a star he who does not raise himself above the breastwork of his order is no hero within it an order as such makes only puppets personality makes worth and merit the more that idle dead hull which conceals the best as well as the poorest kernel falls away the more the fair and ripe fruit appears assuredly therefore it is no retrocession but an evolution of the times when the order ceases to be all and men demand to see in each order persons men active beings and since without a new incursion of barbarism and with the daily increasing necessities of europe this feeling must necessarily increase there remains only one counsel which can secure each one against the senescence of his order be something in your order, and then you will be the first to perceive, to avoid, and to amend its defects. Its old age will appear rejuvenized in you, precisely because there is something in you which would grace every form and live in all. The excellent Paolo Sarpi wrote a treatise the title of which attracted me exceedingly, How Opinions Are Born and Die in Us. I was very curious to become acquainted with its contents, and although I saw from Foscanari's extract of Grisellini that it was not likely to contain what I had supposed, this capital problem nevertheless has often been in my thoughts. Many are the ways in which from earliest childhood we arrive at opinions with which we clothe ourselves body and soul. Many of them cleave to us with great tenacity, and the silliest we generally keep concealed behind our innermost ninth skin, where let no one presume to touch them. Unfortunately, however, time will touch them, and often with very rude hands, and he who, in order to save his life, that is, his reason, peace, and the self-consciousness of internal worth, cannot yield the skin and hair of his opinions to the meddling satan is in bad hands for that which is mere opinion or even false opinion will assuredly perish in the fierce fire of purification but is it not something better that shall arise in its place instead of opinions received on authority or even as franklin relates from politeness knowledge from conviction reason approved by our own investigation and a self-acquired felicity shall be our portion the old man in us must die that a new youth may spring up but how may this be can a man return into his mother's womb and be born again to this doubt of old nicodemus the only answer that can be given is palingenesis not revolution but a happy evolution of the faculties which slumber in us and by means of which we renew our youth 
what we call outliving ourselves that is a kind of death is with souls of the better sort but sleep which precedes a new waking a relaxation of the bow which prepares it for new use so rests the fallow field in order to produce the more plentiful hereafter so dies the tree in winter that it may put forth and blossom anew in the spring destiny never forsakes the good as long as he does not forsake himself and ignobly despair of himself the genius which seemed to have departed from him returns to him again at the right moment bringing new activity fortune and joy sometimes the genius comes in the shape of a friend sometimes in that of an unexpected change of times sacrifice to this genius even though you see him not hope in back-looking returning fortune even when you deem her far off if the left side is sore lay yourself on the right if the storm has bent your sapling one way bend it the other way until it attains once more the perpendicular medium you have wearied your memory then exercise your understanding you have striven too diligently after seeming and it has deceived you now seek being that will not deceive unmerited fame has spoiled you thank heaven that you are rid of it and seek in your own worth a fame which cannot be taken away nothing is nobler and more venerable than a man who in spite of fate perseveres in his duty and who if he is not happy outwardly at least deserves to be so he will certainly become so at the right season the serpent of time often casts her slough and brings to the man in his cave if not the fabled jewel on her head and the rose in her mouth at least medicinal herbs which procure him oblivion of the past and restoration to new life end of excerpt from tython and aurora by johann gottfried herder seventeen forty three to eighteen hundred and three on being bored unattributed from the popular magazine december seventh nineteen twenty this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. On Being Bored An old Chinese proverb says, A man seldom affects to despise the world unless the world is regardless of him. Which is another way of explaining that, when you are bored, you're a weakling. You are unable to get out of the world the entertainment and pleasure to which you are entitled. To say that you are bored is to confess that you cannot think keenly enough or feel vividly enough to appreciate what is going on around you. Men like Thomas A. Edison and Charles M. Schwab are never bored. Village loafers and lazy clerks frequently are there are also types of high society and disappointed young men who make a show of their boredom nothing is worth their attention nothing ever happens everybody else is so infernally stupid don't you know this town was buried ten years ago and doesn't know it the real trouble with fellows of that sort is that they are too lazy to work for the good things of life they refuse to take the trouble to know the people by whom they are surrounded or to attain that proficiency and skill in games and recreations essential to enjoyment taking the selfish view that the world owes them a laugh every hour they are blind to the fact that everything in this life is bought at a price usually at the price of exertion if you don't believe this the next time you are bored dissatisfied or discontented 
set yourself to work on the people you meet compel yourself to look for the interesting things in their conversation there is no individual so commonplace or so dull that you cannot discover in his experiences and opinions something highly diverting or intensely interesting that goes also for recreations the theatre books music and sports in all these things as in every other element of life the world gives you exactly what you expect to find in the world the end of on being bored public health assessment for ottawa illinois radiation areas july twenty fifth two thousand six by the u s department of health and human services agency for toxic substances and disease registry excerpt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org public health assessment ottawa radiation areas ottawa la salle county illinois epa facility id ild nine eight zero six zero six seven five zero prepared by the illinois department of public health under cooperative agreement with the u s department of health and human services agency for toxic substances and disease registry purpose a petitioned public health assessment p h a was prepared for the ottawa radiation areas in nineteen ninety three by the agency for toxic substances and disease registry a t s d r to update activities that have occurred since nineteen ninety three the illinois department of public health idph has prepared an updated public health assessment to determine whether radiation exposure is currently a public health hazard at the ottawa radiation areas site background site location the ottawa radiation areas ora site consists of fourteen areas of contamination named npl one through npl fourteen located throughout the city of ottawa in la salle county illinois the majority of the sites are located in residential areas others are within the ottawa business district or in light industrial areas a few sites are outside the city limits in unincorporated locations site history radium dial incorporated began operation in ottawa illinois in the late nineteen tens the company occupied the former ottawa high school located at columbus and washington streets the building was the ottawa high school from eighteen eighty until nineteen sixteen when the high school moved to its present location radium dial incorporated operated in this building until nineteen thirty when it moved to the corner of columbus and washington streets in ottawa and changed the name of the company to luminous processes incorporated between nineteen thirty and nineteen sixty eight the original radium dial building was used as a meat packing plant and was later occupied by farmers co-op this building was demolished in nineteen sixty eight employees of both radium dial and luminous processes used radium containing luminous glow-in-the-dark paints to coat the dials and faces of clocks and watches during world war ii the company prepared luminous dials for military purposes most of the employees were women and in nineteen sixteen radium dial incorporated employed ninety two women and five men after luminous processes ceased operations in nineteen seventy eight the building remained empty although residents and city officials reported that it was used as a meat locker for several years until nineteen sixty radium was the only radioactive material used at the facility 
radium was mixed with zinc sulfide as the base for the luminous paints the exact amount of radium used at the facility between 1934 and 1957 is not known because no federal or state regulations existed at that time for the receipt, use, and distribution of radium in consumer products. In 1957, the state of Illinois passed a radioactive materials law which required users of radioactive material to register with the state and to provide information about the types and quantities of radioactive materials used. When luminous processes registered with the state in December 1957, the company indicated an average annual radium use of 700 milligrams. Tritium became available for use in luminous paints in the 1970s and replaced radium. During operation, the building and the surrounding area became contaminated with radium-226. The building was demolished in 1985, and contaminated debris was transported for disposal at a commercial low-level waste disposal facility in Hanford, Washington. In 1986, a contractor for the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety, IDNS, removed contaminated soils foundations and sewer lines however local residents made several allegations about improper disposal of radioactive material these allegations included improper disposal practices the migration of dust particles during demolition and contamination of water when waste water from hosing down the foundation ran off into the sewer in 1986, at the request of Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety, the U.S. Department of Energy conducted an aerial survey of the city of Ottawa to detect radium-contaminated areas. The survey identified approximately 11 areas that contained varying levels of below-ground radium contamination. Because radium naturally decays to form radon gas, in August 1986, Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety conducted radon screenings of homes in the Ottawa area. Radon detecting equipment was placed in basements or low areas in homes to measure radon levels. Two homes had radon levels greater than the U.S. EPA's standard of four picocuries per liter of air. Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety removed approximately 800 cubic feet of soil from around one of the homes. Another home had a radon system installed to remove the radon. In December 1986, Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety requested U.S. EPA's assistance to perform site inspections, evaluate possible movement of radium contamination, and supervise the cleanup plan. Removal activities. Several activities have occurred at the site to clean up contaminated areas. In 1988, radon reduction systems were installed in two homes and one business by US EPA. In 1990, US EPA, working with the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety, began removing radium-contaminated soil from the radiation areas. The material was transported to a low-level radioactive hazardous waste disposal facility in Utah. Of the 14 areas, U.S. EPA prioritized residential properties and properties near residential areas because they posed a greater risk to the public. Between 1993 and 1997, U.S. EPA conducted removal activities on 12 of the 14 sites. As part of the removal actions, U.S. EPA excavated contaminated soil greater than 6.2 picocuries per gram radium in these residential areas, including parts of NPL 11. U.S. EPA removed a total of 4,176 tons of radium-contaminated soil at NPL 11 in 1996. The NPL 11 excavation 
was terminated due to the difficulties of excavating material located below the water table a record of decision was signed in september two thousand recommending complete removal of radium contaminated soil from three of the sites where future residential use is likely and removal to ten feet below ground surface at one site where future recreational use is planned remediation of the remaining properties is scheduled to take place beginning in two thousand seven and continuing through two thousand ten discussion chemicals of interest illinois department of public health compared the maximum concentration of each contaminant detected during environmental sampling with appropriate screening values to select contaminants for further evaluation for carcinogenic and non-carcinogenic health endpoints chemicals that exceeded comparison values were selected for further evaluation comparison values are used only to screen for contaminants that should be evaluated further and do not represent thresholds of toxicity though some of these chemicals may exist at levels greater than comparison values they can only affect someone who is exposed and receives a high enough dose for adverse health effects to occur whether exposure to a chemical will cause adverse health effects depends on how much has entered the body the duration of the exposure how the chemical entered the body and how the body responds the chemical of interest at this site is radium 226 exposure pathways adverse health effects may occur when a contaminant reaches a receptor population through an exposure pathway these pathways are separated into completed and potential pathways completed exposure pathways consist of five elements one a source of contamination two transport through an environmental medium three a point of exposure four a route of human exposure and five a receptor population potential exposure pathways have at least one element missing but the missing element could exist potential exposure pathways suggest that exposure could have occurred in the past could be occurring or could occur in the future an exposure pathway is eliminated if one or more of the elements are missing and will never be present completed exposure pathways as part of the record of decision u s e p a calculated exposure estimates for the two unremediated areas n p l eight frontage property and n p l eleven surface and subsurface soils have been contaminated with radioactive wastes in addition some buildings in the ottawa area contain elevated levels of radon gas for n p l eleven a residential scenario was used to calculate exposure estimates the risk at npl 11 is primarily to residents construction workers and people walking through the area they could be exposed to contamination by inhaling radon gas escaping from the ground by touching radium contaminated soil or from gamma radiation emitted by the contaminated soil they also could get small particles of contaminated soil in their mouths by hand-to-mouth activity the most contaminated soil is located several feet below the surface and would not be contacted unless digging or excavation activities were occurring u.s epa estimated that there would be a low increased risk of cancer from exposure to radioactive contaminants at npl 11 no non-cancer health effects would be expected currently for the npl 8 frontage property people who walk through the area 60 days or more of the year could have a low increased risk of cancer no non-cancer health effects would be expected 
proposed plans for this property are for a commercial or industrial site the property will be remediated before any construction activities occur toxicological evaluation radium radium is naturally present in the environment at very low levels radium gives off gamma radiation that can cause adverse health effects at elevated levels at the remaining two areas of contamination in ottawa people exposed to the low levels of radiation could have an increased risk of cancer however no studies exist to show what specific health effects may occur from being exposed to low levels of radium for a long period of time at higher levels radium has been shown to cause effects on the blood anemia and eyes cataracts it also has been shown to affect the teeth causing an increase in broken teeth and cavities patients who were injected with radium in germany from 1946 to 1950 for the treatment of certain diseases including tuberculosis were significantly shorter as adults than people who were not treated exposure to high levels of radium results in an increased incidence of bone liver and breast cancer u s epa and the national academy of sciences committee on biological effects of ionizing radiation have stated that radium is a known human carcinogen health outcome data illinois department of public health division of epidemiological studies reviewed the incidence of cancer for the ottawa zip code 61350 from 1991 to 2000 in females an increased risk of thyroid cancer was found in two cases expected and seven cases observed no other types of cancer were elevated for either males or females the most common types of cancer caused by exposure to radium are bone liver and breast the presence of an increase in thyroid cancer does not appear to be related to contaminants from this site community health concerns illinois department of public health staff attended a public meeting held to discuss remediation activities the meeting was held on july thirtieth two thousand three at ottawa city hall representatives from u s epa illinois department of public health city officials and the contractor for u s epa performing sampling and remediation work were present at the meeting the meeting was held to discuss cleanup of two properties and to propose different options for remediation community concerns included concern about children playing in contaminated soil health risks from contaminated soil cancer rates in the community illinois department of public health answered health related questions and informed residents that the division of epidemiological studies would be evaluating cancer data to see if there was an increased rate of cancer in the ottawa zip code this public health assessment was available for public comment from march eighth two thousand six to april twenty second two thousand six no comments were received child health considerations illinois department of public health and atsdr the agency for toxic substances and disease registry recognize that children are especially sensitive to some contaminants for this reason illinois department of public health includes children when evaluating exposures to contaminants children are the most sensitive population considered in this health assessment because of their frequent hand-to-mouth play habits children could have a low increased risk of cancer from exposure to radium in the soil at npl eleven and npl eight conclusions elevated levels of radium two twenty six exist in soil and exposure may occur in the future if they are not removed u s epa estimated that residents workers and trespassers have a low increased risk of cancer from exposure to contaminated soil 
based on current site conditions illinois department of public health concludes that exposure to radium 226 in soil at npl 11 and npl 8 poses a public health hazard us epa is planning to clean up these two remaining areas of contamination this should eliminate the exposure pathway and prevent future exposures recommendations illinois department of public health recommends that one us epa implement its plan to remediate npl 8 frontage property and npl 11 two residents take steps to limit their exposure to contaminated soil until remediation is complete public health action plan u.s epa prioritized residential properties near residential areas because they posed a greater risk to the public between 1993 and 1997 u.s epa conducted removal activities on 12 of the 14 sites on july 30th 2003 illinois department of public health staff attended a public meeting held to discuss remediation activities the meeting was held to discuss cleanup of two properties and to propose different options for remediation. Illinois Department of Public Health also provided recommendations on how to reduce exposure to contaminants in soil to residents who had concerns. In November 2004, the Illinois Department of Public Health Division of Epidemiological Studies reviewed the incidence of cancer for the Ottawa zip code 61350 from 1991 to 2000 the two remaining contaminated areas are scheduled to be cleaned up as soon as the final remedial design report is approved currently it is estimated that the remaining contaminated properties will be cleaned up beginning in 2007 and continuing through 2010 the illinois department of public health will continue to monitor U.S. EPA activities at the Ottawa Radiation Area's site. An updated health consultation will be completed once remediation of NPL 11 and NPL 8 frontage properties is complete. End of Public Health Assessment for Ottawa, Illinois Radiation Areas, July 25, 2006 by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Rocks for Homes by Charles Barnard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rocks for Homes by Charles Barnard The first poems were trees. There are many good people who would feel dreadfully hurt if you were to tell them that they came from the lowest kind of savages, that their foreparents fought with wild beasts for food, and crept into trees for sleep and rest. It is in one sense humiliating, in another it should make us proud of our race. The first men were, no doubt, poor, ill-fed, ill-clothed, badly sheltered creatures from whom, could we see them, we should shrink in mingled pity and horror. Yet they were men. The seeds of civilization were in their hearts. A million years or more, it is now thought, have passed since the primeval men gave up living in trees and founded the first homes in caves. It is so long ago we must call it the Stone Age, not knowing exactly how many hundred years an age may be. In some fashion it was discovered they could use the stones of the field as tools and arms. When the first men found that the limb of a tree would make a club with which they could conquer the wild beasts about them, the first great step in advance was made. The club was a weapon. Another stick, at last, grew to be a bow. A sharp stone became an arrowhead. A rounded stone became a hammer and these arms and tools mark the great advance of the race in what we, in a vague and general way, call the Stone Age. The weathering of rocks left rifts and caves in the rocky hills. Into these holes the Stone Age men crept for shelter. The loose boulders of the field were picked up and piled rudely around the entrance of the caves, and the first walls appeared. 
Today we explore these old caves long filled with sand and rubbish and pick out of the gravel the cracked bones of prehistoric animals and the tools and arms of these poor, starved, and wretched creatures and wonder at the pitiable scenes they suggest. These poor fellows crack the very bones of their wild enemies to eat the marrow. Their arms were chipped flints, their needles, thorns, their dress, the skins of animals, their homes, a cave. The idea of picking up loose stones and fragments of rock and piling these about the entrance of a cave was the first glimmer of light, the first vague hint that men were builders. There were no stone-cutting tools, not even so simple a tool as a crowbar. Every stone used was so small it could be lifted by two men. The stones were placed in a line and other stones were piled on top. So rude and frail were these first walls that no trace of them exists. Hundreds of years probably passed before the men appeared who laid the walls whose remains we can faintly trace today. We may read with wonder of the discovery of ancient walls built before history began, but these remains are comparatively modern beside the perished work of the first stonemasons. The history of house building is the history of civilization. From the rude wall about the mouth of the cave sprang the walled hut with a roof of wood and thatch, and this was the first house. Huts of wood and tents of skins perhaps appeared even sooner, but these were temporary dwellings. The first permanent homes were, no doubt, built largely of stones and boulders picked up in the fields. The next great step was the discovery of mortar or cement for binding the stones together. When and where it was first used we have no means of knowing. Stone-cutting tools for shaping and fitting stones together mark the next great advance. Their use may have preceded the use of mortar. Of these things there is great uncertainty, and only students of the history of architecture are really interested in the matter. For us, in our studies of the rocks, we have only to observe this. The stones and boulders of the field made the materials of the first permanent homes. Today, natural stone is the foundation of every house, and will be more and more used for the chief material of all our buildings. It is in more senses than one that we build our homes upon a rock. When the first house builders began to use stones for their walls, they took no heed of the color or the character of the stones. It was not till architecture became an art, it was not till really great buildings like the pyramids and temples of Egypt appeared, that the builders began to see that certain stones are better for building than others. Only when modern tools and steam power appeared did it become possible to use building stones cheaply, so that not only cathedrals could be built of fine stones, but also the dwellings of the common people. When the great science of geology grew up, a vast deal of knowledge concerning building stones was gathered, so that today we use the rocks to build cheaper, more substantial, and more beautiful homes than ever before. Besides this, we have a goodly inheritance in the rocky hills of our country. Nowhere in the world can be found a greater variety and abundance of beautiful building stones. Our rivers, coasts, and railroads make it possible to bring these stones from their native beds to all parts of the Union quickly and cheaply. Today, the public buildings in nearly every state shine with the gray granite of the Bay State, and our dead sleep beside white marble from Vermont. Procure a piece of granite, a piece of sandstone, and a piece of chalk. Here are three rocks, each representing, as we may have already learned from our studies in geology, the three great classes into which all rocks are divided. Examine each piece carefully and make full notes of its character. The granite is composed of bits of feldspar, sharp crystals of quartz, and scales and flakes of mica. These white, gray, and black materials are mixed together in the wildest confusion, interlaced without any regular order. Hold the stone in a bright light and move it about, and some parts will reflect the light like glass. With a hammer, break the stone into pieces. The stone breaks with an irregular fracture, leaving sharp edges. Lay some of the small pieces on iron or other hard surfaces and grind it up into fine dust with the hammer. Examine this dust with a magnifying glass, and the fine fragments are sharp and jagged and of irregular shapes. With the proper tools, we can cut the granite and give it a smooth surface that will take a high polish. In color, the stone will be gray or red, ranging from a very light gray to a dark bluish gray or some shade of red or reddish gray. 
the sandstone will present wholly different qualities it is much softer than the granite and when rubbed against any hard substance a fine dust comes off this dust under the magnifying glass is found to be sand this sand if closely examined is much like the quartz in the granite the stone breaks much more easily than the other it seems to split as if the sand of which it is composed is placed in layers a close examination shows this is so the sand is laminated or arranged in layers the color will range from dark red or yellow to very light shades of red and pale yellow the piece of chalk will be quite a different rock it is so soft that it easily rubs off into a fine white powder if this is examined under a powerful microscope it will be found to consist of the broken remains of shells and the bony fragments of minute marine creatures that were once alive in some ancient sea the chalk breaks up into dust very easily and appears to have no particular structure these three stones represent the three great classes of rocks the igneous rocks of which the crystalline granite is an example the sandstones and the organic rocks the chalk represents the last class because composed of organic remains the igneous or fire formed stones represent the oldest rocks the sandstones and organic rocks represent the sedimentary or water formed rocks the sandstones are formed of the remains of the old granites weathered away and turned to sand this sand was laid down in water in layers and in time turned to stone the limestones or organic rocks represented by the chalk are composed of the remains of animals and were also formed under water so all rocks are in one of two classes the igneous or sedimentary the last class being divided into sandstones and organic rocks our building stones are found chiefly in the first two of these classes not all rocks are fit for building materials chalk we can easily see is too soft and if piled up to form a wall would crush and break by its own weight some stones are too brittle others too loose so that they are easily broken or easily worn away by the weather mica is a stone so is coal yet neither is fit for building materials they would be quite as useless as chalk some sandstones are so soft that they crumble into dusty sand the moment we try to cut them into shape to fit the walls of our homes countless experiments with all kinds of rock have shown that only certain kinds are fit for building materials a home is a shelter from the weather it must stand beating rains must be strong enough to hold up the weight of snow on the roof and the contents of its floors it should be fireproof and it should also be beautiful in color the different properties of building stone stand in this order toughness or solidity to resist crushing under heavy weights hard enough to resist weathering not easily injured by fire and its texture should be such that it is easily worked or cut and when cut or polished will keep its shape and fine surface the best building stones are granite sandstone slate and marble the granite belongs to the igneous class the slate and sandstone to the sedimentary rocks the slate being composed of fine soft silt instead of sand the marble is a limestone having a crystalline character it does not however show any traces of the organic remains of which it is thought it was once composed the limestone is an organic sedimentary rock these rocks are hard strong and durable and from them men have built their homes for centuries the study of these building stones is well worth our attention because the quarrying of the stone from the earth forms one of our greatest sources of wealth and the work gives employment to great numbers of men nothing seemed to the early settlers on the shores of massachusetts bay more worthless than the red rocks of cohasset and the rough range of hills just south of boston known as the blue hills yet from these hills have been taken millions and millions of money in beautiful granite the red rocks behind old minot's light have been the scene of many a shipwreck yet these lovely red granites round which the waves beat in storms are the most valuable building stones we have at one time there were quarries at cohasset but as often happens other and more beautiful stones have been found now in other places moreover while we as a nation live in wooden houses even our wooden houses must rest on stone foundations these building stones are many of them of great beauty and it is for this if for no other reason we should study them that whenever we see them we shall recognize the different kinds 
and in building a home learn to use them with taste and with due regard to their artistic value in building a home the first and most important part is the foundation the ground is always damp and a wooden house built directly on the earth would soon decay and fall to pieces stones that will resist moisture must be used as a foundation on which to rest the wooden sills of the house the igneous rocks like the granites are the best soft red sandstones are often not much better than wood the red color of sandstone comes from the iron it contains the iron binds the sand together and often the iron will rust and turn to dust and the stone will rapidly turn into a heap of red sand the best test in selecting a stone for foundation is the appearance of the stone after long exposure to the weather a hard stone will have a smooth surface with weather stains a soft stone will be dusty and loose on the outside like the red rotten stone so common in the fields of new england boulders and water washed stones loose in the fields relics of the ice age are all good granites that are very heavy and that turn red or brown when exposed to the weather contain iron and like the sandstones will rust and fall to pieces there are however red sandstones that are excellent but as a general rule sandstones will not stand much moisture in a wall where the rain will run off and leave them dry they are very good but great pains should be taken to see that all the upper surfaces slope downward so that the rain and snow water will run off red sandstone of a very inferior quality was once used in new york city for houses but it soon decayed over the doors and windows wherever the water would stand after a rain and had to be given up stones for floors hearths sidewalks and pavements have to be considered in quite another aspect at one time the sidewalks in boston were covered with a beautiful silvery white sandstone it split easily into thin slabs and made a cheap and handsome walk but very soon it began to wear down under the footsteps of the passers the mica in the stone was so brittle it quickly broke off in fine scales and dust and the stone was soon full of ruts and holes this is the mechanical side of the matter had the stone been used on edge instead of in the natural layers it would have resisted the wear and tear of passing feet to cut it in this way as if it were across the grain would be too expensive so the stone beautiful as it was had to be given up the test for such stones is likewise a matter of observation sandstones as a rule are entirely unsuited for floors and pavements slate and marble are far better granite is perhaps too hard and unless made very smooth is unpleasant for the feet on account of its roughness and hardness for walls nearly all rocks are useful provided they are strong enough to resist crushing under heavy weights and will not decay if properly cut and placed in the wall so that they will shed the rain we can use granites sandstones marbles and limestones for roofs floors and stairs slate is the best as it can be split into thin light slabs in the selection of stones for building a home we need not fear to go astray the character of all our native building stones is being better known every year there have been made through scientific tests of the endurance of these stones their power to resist crushing under weight and their ability to withstand our severe climates some of our museums contain examples of all our best stones and the dealers and quarrymen are now very thorough in their tests of all the stones cut out of our mountains formerly anything that was a hard stone was thought to be good enough for building purposes and great quantities of poor stones were formerly sold and used notably in new york city architects are more particular now and there is very little danger of being deceived in the matter the chief thing we should do in this country is to pay more attention to the color and artistic effects of stones in our houses quincy granite is a fine dark gray stone admirable for a county jail or a lighthouse for a home it is too heavy and somber a dwelling should be more cheerful and attractive and a lighter colored granite and one with a finer texture would be better the brown stone or red sandstone so much used in new york city is soft easily worked and cheap it is fairly durable but its color is very bad as it makes the streets dark and gloomy the peculiar wavy appearance caused by the irregular layers of the sand make this stone one of the most beautiful we have and if used with granite or with lighter colored stones it can be made very artistic the buff and yellow sandstones have a fine color and are very much in favor on this account marbles are of course the most beautiful stones we have 
both for interior and exterior work, and for floors. There are also some limestones that are occasionally used for dwellings. The best plan is to use two or even three different stones and to use the colors together to form agreeable artistic effects. There is no guide in this matter. Each must be a guide unto himself or leave the matter entirely to the architect. Every year there is a disposition to greater variety and greater freedom in the use of our building stones. The colors are durable and the tones and shades sufficiently varied to give us a chance to produce the most excellent results. Within the past few years, a number of houses have been built in Massachusetts of the common stones of the field, picked up with all the moss and weather stains still on them, and carefully worked into the walls just as they are. The effect is very picturesque in small, low houses like lodges and seaside cottages. The buildings appear to be part of the fields in which they stand, and the irregular size and shape of the stones give an air of old-fashioned solidity that is very attractive. Every year, more and more stone houses are built. They are warmer in winter and cooler in summer than wooden houses. They need no painting and are far more durable than a house of wood. One very good style has appeared lately, and that is a two-story house, having the first story of rough stone in two colors and the second story of wood. The future promises still greater improvement and advance in this great branch of our nation's industry. End of Rocks for Homes by Charles Barnard A series of ascending forms and powers prevails in our earthly creation. Excerpt from Chapter 1, Book 5 of The Philosophy of History by Johann Gottfried Herder, 1744-1803. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A series of ascending forms and powers prevails in our earthly creation. 1. From stones to crystals, from crystals to metals, from these to plants, from plants to brutes, and from brutes to man. We have seen the form of organization ascend, and with this the powers and propensities of the creature have become more various, till at length they have all united in the human frame, at least as far as they were susceptible of being comprised in it. Here the series stops. We know no creature above man, organized with more diversity and art, he seems the highest point attainable by terrestrial organization. 2. Throughout this series of beings we observe, as far as the particular definition of the creature admits it, a predominant similitude of the principal form, which, varying in numberless ways, more and more approaches that of man. 3. As we have observed the forms of other creatures to approach man's, so also have we seen these faculties and propensities. From the powers of nourishment and propagation in plants, they ascend to the mechanic arts of insects, the domestic economy and maternal care of birds and quadrupeds, and at length to thoughts almost human and self-acquired capacities till all ultimately concenter in the reasoning faculty, liberty, and humanity of man. 4. The period of each creature's life also is regulated by the end nature has designed it to answer. The plant quickly blossoms and the tree grows tardily. The insect, which brings its art into the world with it and speedily and abundantly multiplies its species, soon departs on beasts that are longer growing up bring forth few at a time or lead a life of domestic economy bordering upon reason a more extended period of existence is bestowed and on man comparatively the most extensive in this however nature attends not to the individual but to the maintenance of the species and the other species that are above it the inferior regions are not only peopled in abundance,
but the lives of the creatures are of longer duration where the purpose of their existence admits it the sea that inexhaustible source of life longest supports its inhabitants whose vital powers are very tenacious and the amphibia who half live in water approach these in longevity the inhabitants of the air less loaded with terrestrial nutriment which gradually indurates quadrupeds live upon the whole longer than beasts air and water therefore seem to be the grand storehouses of living beings which the earth afterwards consumes and destroys in quicker transitions five the more elaborate the organization of a creature is the more its structure is compounded from the inferior kingdoms this complexness begins underneath the earth and grows up through plants and animals to the most complicated of all creatures man his blood and various component parts are a compendium of the world earths and salts acids and alkalis oil and water the powers of vegetation of irritability and of sensation are organically combined in him and interwoven together either we must consider these things as sports of nature and intelligent nature never sports without design or we shall be led to admit a kingdom of invisible powers standing in the same close connection and blending by such imperceptible transitions as we perceive in the external appearance of things the more we learn of nature the more we observe these indwelling powers even in the lowest orders of creatures as mosses funguses and the like in an animal which almost inexhaustibly reproduces its own likeness in the muscle which moves briskly and variously by its own irritability the existence of these powers cannot be denied and thus all things are full of organically operating omnipotence we know not where this begins or where it ends for throughout the creation wherever effect is there is power wherever life displays itself there is internal vitality thus there prevails in the invisible realm of creation not only a connected chain but an ascending series of powers as we perceive these acting before us in organized forms in its visible kingdom nay this invisible chain must be infinitely more close firm and progressive than the series of external forms cognizable by our dull senses can show for what is organization but a mass of infinitely more compressed powers the greater part of which even in consequence of their connection are limited or suppressed by other powers or at least are so concealed from our sight that as the drops of water appear to us only in the form of a cloud we perceive not the individual parts but the general figure as the wants of the whole have required it to be organized how different must the true chain of creatures be in the eye of omniscience from that of which men speak we arrange forms which our sight is unable to penetrate and class them like children by particular limbs or other marks the sovereign father sees and holds the chain of powers closely pressing on each other what is this to the immortality of the soul everything and not to the immortality of our soul alone but the duration of all the acting and living powers of creation no power can perish for what is the meaning of a power's perishing we have no instance of it in nature nay we have no idea of it in our minds it is a contradiction that something should be or become nothing it is more than a contradiction that a living acting somewhat in which the creator himself is present in which by energies divine he manifests his residence should be converted into nothing the implement may be destroyed by external circumstances but as not a single atom of it can be lost or annihilated so neither can the invisible power which operates in this atom 
since in every species of organization we perceive that its operative powers are chosen with wisdom arranged with art and accurately adapted to their common duration and the perfection of the principal power it should be absurd to suppose of nature that the moment when a combination of these powers that is an external form ceases she should suddenly depart from this care and wisdom which alone constitute her divine nature and not only so but turn against herself with her whole omnipotence for nothing less could suffice to annihilate a single part of the living whole in which she herself lives eternally active what the all vivifying calls into life lives whatever acts acts eternally in his eternal whole as this is not the place to pursue these principles further let us consider some examples of them the flower blows and fades that is to say this instrument is no longer fit to continue the operation of its vegetative power the tree when it has produced its stock of fruit dies the machine has perished and the component parts separate but it by no means follows from this that the power which animated these parts that could vegetate and so powerfully propagate itself has died with this composition that power which in this organization ruled over a thousand powers it had attracted each atom of the dissolved machine retains its inferior power how much more then must the more potent remain which in this form directed them all to one end and acted in its narrow limits with omnipotent natural qualities the chain of thoughts breaks when we think it natural that a living creature should now possess in each of its limbs that powerful self-restoring irritable spontaneity which it displays to our eyes in the very next moment all these powers the living proofs of an indwelling organic omnipotence should so vanish from the chain of beings from the sphere of reality as if it had never been and shall this contradiction in thought take place with respect to the purest and most active power we know upon earth the human mind a power so far raised above all the capacities of inferior organizations as not only to rule with sovereign sway the numberless organic powers of my body with a kind of omnipotence and ubiquity but also most wonderful of wonders to be capable of inspecting and governing itself not here below can exceed the subtlety swiftness and efficacy of a human thought not the energy purity and warmth of a human volition let man's thoughts be as devoid of reason as possible still on every occasion when he thinks he imitates the disposing deity in whatever he wills and performs he imitates the creating god the similitude lies in the thing itself it is grounded on the essence of his mind shall the power that is capable of knowing loving and imitating god nay that from the very essence of its reason is compelled to know and imitate him as it were against its will since even its very faults and errors arise only from weakness and illusion be no more and the most powerful sovereign upon earth perish because an external circumstance of composition is changed and some of its lowest subjects have revolted does the artist no longer exist because the tools have dropped from his hand if so where is the concatenation of our thoughts End of Book 5, Chapter 1 of The Philosophy of History A series of ascending forms and powers prevails in our earthly creation by Johann Gottfried Herder, 1744-1803
spectropia, or surprising spectral illusions showing ghosts everywhere and of any color, by J. H. Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Spectropia, or Surprising Spectral Illusions Showing Ghosts Everywhere and of Any Color, by J. H. Brown. Introduction The following illusions are founded on two well-known facts, namely the persistency of impressions and the production of complementary colors on the retina. The explanations are divided into two parts. The first consists of directions for seeing the spectres. The second, a brief and popular as well as a scientific description of the manner in which the spectres are produced and is intended for the use of those who may wish to know more of this subject than is contained in the first part. As an apology for the apparent disregard of taste and fine art in the plates, such figures are selected as best serve the purpose for which they are intended. J. H. Brown, Old Stein, Brighton Directions To see the spectres, it is only necessary to look steadily at the dot or asterisk which is to be found on each of the plates for about a quarter of a minute or while counting about twenty, the plate being well illuminated by either artificial or daylight then turning the eyes to the ceiling the wall the sky or better still to a white sheet hanging on the wall of a darkened room not totally dark and looking rather steadily at any one point the spectre will soon begin to make its appearance increasing in intensity and then gradually vanishing to reappear and again vanish it will continue to do so several times in succession, each reappearance being fainter than the one preceding. Winking the eyes or passing a finger rapidly to and fro before them will frequently hasten the appearance of the spectre, especially if the plate has been strongly illuminated. Those who use gaslight will find it convenient, after having looked at the plate as above described, to extemporize a darkened room by having the gaslight turned low, or one end of the room may be darkened by placing a screen before the gas lamp or candlelight. The spectres may be easily made to appear life-sized or colossal by having the plate nearer the eyes while receiving the impression and by increasing the distance between the observer and the surface against which they are seen. As a general rule, the observer should be about 8 to 20 feet from the surface. When the spectres are seen against opposite houses, the sky and other distant surfaces, they will appear colossal. Should anyone not be able to see the spectre's features, the reason will be either that the eyes have been allowed to wander or the head to move while looking at the plate. Many persons will see some one colored spectre better than the others in consequence of their eyes not being equally sensitive to all colors. The colors in the plate will be found to reverse themselves in the spectres, as explained elsewhere, the spectre is always appearing of the complementary colors to that of the plate from which it is obtained. Thus, blue will appear orange, and orange blue, and so on. A popular and scientific description. It is a curious fact that, in this age of scientific research, the absurd follies of spiritualism should find an increase of supporters. But mental epidemics seem at certain seasons to affect our minds, and one of the oldest of these moral afflictions, witchcraft, is once more prevalent in this nineteenth century under the contemptible forms of spirit rapping and table turning. The modern professor of these impostures, like his predecessors in all such disreputable arts, is bent only on raising the contents of the pockets of the most gullible portions of humanity and not the spirits of the departed over which, as he well knows, notwithstanding his profane assumption, he can have no power. One thing we hope in some measure to further in the following pages is the extinction of the superstitious belief that apparitions are actual spirits, 
by showing some of the many ways in which our senses may be deceived and that in fact no so-called ghost has ever appeared without its being referable either to mental or physiological deception or in those instances where several persons have seen a spectre at the same time to natural objects as in the case mentioned by dr Abercrombie in his work on the intellectual powers Quote, a whole ship's company were thrown into the utmost consternation by the apparition of a cook who had died a few days before he was distinctly seen walking ahead of the ship with a peculiar gait by which he was distinguished when alive from having one of his legs shorter than the other on steering the ship toward the object it was found to be a piece of floating wreck End quote. A ghost, according to the general descriptions of those who fancy they have been favoured with a sight of one, appears to be of a pale phosphorescent white or bluish white colour, usually indistinct and so transparent that objects are easily seen through it. When moving, it glides in a peculiar manner, the legs not being necessary to its locomotion. All the senses are more or less subject to deception, but the eye is preeminently so especially in the case of individuals who are in ill health because the sensibility of the retina is then generally much exalted as is also the imagination we may divide the illusions to which the sense of sight is liable into four kinds first mental or those arising in the brain itself and only referred to the eye second those produced by the structure of the eye third those arising from the impressions of outward objects on the retina fourth those produced by various combinations of the foregoing it is only the second and third we shall have occasion to touch upon but before we can well understand their nature it will be necessary to get a slight knowledge of the structure of the eye and some idea respecting the nature of light with perhaps the exception of the ear the eye is the most wonderful example of the infinite skill of the creator a more exquisite piece of mechanism it is impossible for the human mind to conceive the annexed diagram of a horizontal section of this organ will give a better idea of its general structure than whole pages of letterpress it will be seen to consist of a globe of three envelopes or coats which are kept distended by three transparent humours or lenses the aqueous the crystalline and the vitreous the outer coat is dense white and fibrous in front of the eye it gives place to a perfectly transparent one called the cornea the next coat the choroid is vascular very black on its internal surface in order that light falling on it through the pupil may not be reflected the pupil is an opening through a diaphragm which is called the iris from its color varying in different individuals it has the power of expanding and contracting the pupil for the purpose of regulating the supply of light to the retina or third and last coat which lies immediately on the choroid it is transparent very complex and the only part of the eye we shall carefully consider the following diagram represents a section of it magnified two hundred and fifty diameters a is called the limitary membrane and forms its innermost surface or that which is next the vitreous humour b consists of the layer of optic nerve fibres c is a layer of grey nerve cells d two layers in which the principal retinal blood vessels are spread out e two layers of granular matter f jacob's membrane or layer of rods and cones figure three will give some idea of the supposed connection between these various parts the same letters referring to the same parts as in figure two when a ray of light enters the eye it passes through the humours or lenses and is formed by them into an image on the choroid of the object looked at the extremities of the rods and cones have the power of appreciating the image then formed and conveyed up through the ultimate parts of the retina thence along the optic nerve fibres to the brain we are inclined to regard the extremities of the rods and cones as the true seat of perception in consequence of observing a considerable distance between the retinal blood vessels and the choroid when performing Purkinje's experiment. Footnote. 
This distance can easily be perceived by getting an impression on the retina according to the directions, page 4, and then, on performing the above experiment, the arterial ramifications in the central spot will be distinctly perceived to move over the spectral figure. End of footnote. This experiment consists in passing a lighted candle slowly to and fro before the eyes at about two or three inches from the nose, when the retinal vessels will exhibit themselves before the observer not unlike branching trees. They may be seen by daylight, by passing the large teeth of an ordinary comb slowly backwards and forwards before the eye, whilst looking on a smooth sheet of paper or upon the sky. Figure 4 represents those of the left eye as seen by candlelight. The spot marked K is the exact center of the retina. It is the seat of most distinct vision. J is the entrance of the optic nerve, from the center of which the retinal artery will be seen emerging and spreading over the entire retina. But in the diagram that part only is represented, which could be seen tolerably distinct. The background to the artery appears of a pale red, except at the part occupied by the optic nerve, where it is white. After this rapid glance at so complicated a structure, and bearing in mind that some persons can see several parts with vastly greater facility than others, it cannot be a matter of surprise that individuals, not aware of these facts, are now and then, especially at night and when carrying a light about, startled by what they fancy an apparition, but which is, in reality, nothing more than some part of the structures above considered. A lady assures us that she saw the ghost of her husband as she was going downstairs with a lighted candle in her hand. The spot K, figure 4, when seen against a wall, a few feet distant, appears about the size of a human head, and wants very little to furnish it with features. Figured paper on the wall, and a host of other things, may supply them, or even the retinal artery, which often lends body and limbs. Beside the above-mentioned structures, there are others which may play an important part in these illusions, especially the common musque volantes, so called from their resemblance to flying flies. They consist of cells and filaments, the debris of the structures of the eye, and float about in its humours. That some of them exist very near the retina appears evident from the fact that, on placing the eyes close to a gauze wire blind, distinct miniature images of parts of the gauze will be seen in them. We now pass on to consider some of the leading properties of light. There have been many theories propounded from time to time in order to explain the various phenomena connected with this subject, but only one accords well with all, and that is called the undulatory or vibratory theory, which, from its numerous complications, will compel us to confine ourselves to a consideration of that part only which is necessary to our present use. This theory regards light as the vibrations of an imponderable ether pervading all space, the number of these vibrations varying in a given time for each of the three primary colors, blue, yellow, and red, the greatest number producing blue, the least red, and an intermediate number yellow, all other colors being produced by the combination of these in various proportions. Any two of the three primary colors mixed together makes the complementary color to the third, and the third is also complementary to it. Thus, blue and yellow make green, which is the complementary color to red. Red and blue make purple, complementary to yellow. Yellow and red make orange, complementary to blue. When the three primary colors are mixed together, white is the result, so that when a ray of white light falls upon a piece of paper and all the vibrations are equally reflected, the paper will appear white. And if they are all absorbed, it will appear black. But if the paper absorbs some and reflects others, it will appear colored. Thus, if it absorbs those producing red, it will appear green from the mixture of the vibrations producing blue and yellow. And if it absorbs blue and yellow and reflects red, then it will appear red. In this manner, any object we look at will appear of any particular color according to which vibrations it absorbs and which it reflects.
The retina is so admirably constructed that it is susceptible of different impressions of color by these different vibrations, except in the case of a few individuals who are either blind to all color and therefore see everything black or white and their intermediate shades, or who are blind to only one or two colors. When we look steadily at a red object for a few seconds, that part of the retina on which the image impinges begins to get less sensitive to vibrations producing red, but more sensitive to those producing blue and yellow, so that, on turning the eye away from the red object and permitting a little white light to enter it, that part of the retina which received the red image will, in consequence of its diminished sensibility to that color and its exalted sensibility to blue and yellow, be able to perceive the two latter colors best and by their mixture will give rise to a green image of the red object. The same thing will be observed with all the other colors, the secondary image or specter always appearing of the complementary color to the object from which the impression is obtained. The duration and vividness of these impressions on the retina vary greatly in different individuals and can be procured from almost any object. A person may, after looking steadily and as often happens unconsciously for a short time at printed or painted figures on paper, porcelain, etc., see, on turning the head in some other direction, a life-sized or colossal spectre The spectre appears larger the greater the distance of the surface against which it is seen and there can be little doubt but that many of the reputed ghosts originate in this manner end of spectropia or surprising spectral illusions showing ghosts everywhere and of any color by j h brown this troubled world 1938 by eleanor roosevelt this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Case as it Stands The newspapers these days are becoming more and more painful. I was reading my morning papers on the train not so long ago and looked up with a feeling of desperation. Up and down the car people were reading, yet no one seemed excited. To me, the whole situation seems intolerable. We face today a world filled with suspicion and hatred. We look at Europe and see a civil war going on, with other nations participating not only as individual volunteers, but obviously with the help and approval of their governments. We look at the Far East and see two nations, technically not at war, killing each other in great numbers. Every nation is watching the others on its borders, analyzing its own needs, and striving to attain its ends with little consideration for the needs of its neighbors. Few people are sitting down dispassionately to go over the whole situation in an attempt to determine what present conditions are, or how they should be met. We know, for instance, that certain nations today need to expand because their populations have increased. Certain people will tell you that the solution of this whole question lies in the acceptance or rejection of birth control. That may be the solution for the future, but we can do nothing in that way about the populations that now exist. They are on this earth, and modern science has left us only a few places where famine or flood or disease can wipe out large numbers of superfluous people in one fell swoop. For this reason, certain nations need additional territory, to which part of their present populations may be moved. Other nations need more land on which to grow necessary raw materials. Or perhaps they may need mineral deposits, which are not to be found in their own country. You will say that these can be had by trade. Yes, but the nations possessing them will frequently make the cost too high to the nations which need them. It is not a question today of the free interchange of goods. If standards of living were approximately the same throughout the world, competition would be on an equal basis, and then there might be no need for tariffs. However, standards of living vary. The nations with higher standards have set up protective barriers, which served them well when they were self-contained, but not so well when they reached a point where they either wished to import or export. 
when you take all these things into consideration the size of this problem is apt to make you feel that even an attempt to solve it in the future by education is futile faint heart however ne'er won fair lady nor did it ever solve world problems peace plan after peace plan has been presented to me most of them i find are impractical or not very carefully thought out in nearly all of them some one can find a flaw i have come to look at them now without the slightest hope of finding one full-fledged plan but i keep on looking in the hope of finding here and there some small suggestion that may be acceptable to enough people to ensure an honest effort being made to study it and evaluate its possible benefits for instance one lady of my acquaintance brought me a plan this past spring which sounded extremely plausible her premises are we never again wish to send our men overseas we wish to have adequate defence we do not need a navy if we do not intend to go beyond our own shores submarines and airplanes can defend our shores with guns along our coast as an added protection therefore we do not need an army for our men are going to stay at home with our coast defences strong nobody will land here so why go to the expense of an army we do not need battleships or in fact any navy beyond submarines because we do not intend to own any outlying possessions in this way said the lady we will save vast sums of money which can be applied to all the social needs of the day better housing better schools old age pensions workmen's compensation care of the blind and crippled and other dependents there is no limit to what we might do with this money which we now spend on preparation for destruction it is a very attractive picture and i wish it were all as simple as that but it seems to be fairly well proved that guns along our coast are practically useless no one as far as i know has ever devised an adequate defence by submarines and airplanes or calculated whether the cost of the development of these two forces would really be any less than what we spend at present on our army and navy the greatest defence of value of the navy is that its cruising radius is great enough to allow it to contact an attacking force long before that force reaches our shores if we trusted solely to submarines and airplanes we would have to have them in sufficient number really to cover all our borders and this type of defence would seem to be almost prohibitive in cost for a nation with a great many miles of border to defend has any one sounded out the people of this country as to their willingness to wait until an attacking enemy comes within the cruising radius of our planes and submarines have we faced the fact that this would mean allowing an attacking enemy to come unmolested fairly near to our shores and would make it entirely possible for them to land in a nearby country which might be friendly to them without any interference on our part have our citizens been asked if they are willing to take the risk of going without trained men we have always had a small trained army forming the first line of defence in case somebody does land on our borders or attempts to approach us by land through a neighbouring country our army has not been thought of as an attacking force do we want to do away with it are all the people in this country willing also to give up the outlying islands which have come into our possession some of them cost us more than they bring in but others bring certain of our citizens a fair revenue can we count on those citizens to accept the loss of these revenues in the interests of future peace perhaps this is part of what we will have to make up our minds to pay some day as the price of peace but has any one as yet put it in concrete form to the american people and asked their opinion about it one of the things that is most frequently harped upon is the vast sums of money spent for war preparation in this country very frequently the statements are somewhat misleading it is true that in the past few years we have spent more than we have for a number of preceding years because we had fallen behind in our treaty strength but in a world which is arming all around us it is necessary to keep a certain parity and these expenditures should be analysed with a little more care than usual for instance few people realise that in the army appropriation is included all the work done under the army engineers on rivers and harbours on flood control etc 
one other consideration which is frequently overlooked is that because of the higher wages paid for labor in this country whatever we build costs us more than it does in the other nations one significant fact is that we only spend twelve per cent of our national income on our army and navy as against anywhere from thirty five to fifty five per cent of the national income spent by nations in the rest of the world it is well for us to realize these facts and not to feel that our government is doing something that will push us into a position which is incompatible with a desire for peace we are the most peace-loving nation in the world and we are not doing anything at present which would change that situation one very intelligent friend of mine developed an idea the other day which seems to me common sense for the present time at least why do we talk she asked about peace why don't we recognize the fact that it is normal and natural for differences to exist almost every family no matter how close its members may be is quarrelsome at times quarrelsome may be too strong a word so we might better say that differences of opinion arise in the family as to conduct or as to likes and dislikes why should we expect therefore that nations will not have these same differences and quarrels why do we concentrate on urging them not to have any differences why don't we simply accept the fact that differences always come up and concentrate on evolving some kind of machinery by which the differences may be recognized and some plan of compromise be worked out to satisfy at least in part all those concerned compromises of course have to be made they are made in every family there are usually some members of a family who by common consent are the arbitrators of questions that arise and who hold the family together or bring them together if relationships become strained the league of nations was an effort to find for the nations of the world a method by which differences between nations would automatically be brought before the court of public opinion some kind of compromise would be made and those involved would feel that substantial justice had been done even though they might not at any one time achieve all of their desires many of us have become convinced that the league of nations as it stands to-day cannot serve this purpose the reason for this is unimportant the important thing now is that we should concentrate on finding some new machinery or revamping what already exists so that every one will function within it and have confidence in its honesty the people of the united states have congratulated themselves on the fact that they had made a beginning towards the development of this machinery in their conferences with the representatives of the other american governments perhaps we have a right to feel a sense of satisfaction for as a nation we have made a small beginning we were cordially disliked throughout south america for years because we were the strongest nation on this continent we took the attitude of the big brother for a long time and constituted ourselves the defender of all the other nations we were not only the defender however we also considered it our duty to set ourselves up as the judge and the only judge of what should happen in the internal as well as the external affairs of our various neighbors to them it seemed a bullying patronizing attitude as they grew stronger they resented it but we went right on regardless of their feelings during the past few years we have put ourselves imaginatively into their situation the final result is that we have reached an amicable understanding and actually are in a fair way to get together and discuss subjects of mutual interest with little or no sense of suspicion and fear being involved in the discussion this can of course be spoiled at any time by the selfishness of individual citizens who may decide that as individuals they can exploit some other nation on the north or south american continents the restraint of these individuals will not be a question of government action but of the force of public opinion which it is to be hoped will be able to control and exert a potent influence because of the sense of responsibility acquired by our citizens this is satisfactory but there is still much to be done before we can feel that even here in the americas we have a thoroughly sound working basis for solving all misunderstandings 
we cannot be entirely satisfied with anything however which does not include the world as a whole for we are all so closely interdependent today that we can only operate successfully when we all cooperate we have had the experience and can profit by the mistakes and the difficulties through which the league of nations has passed every nation in the world still uses policemen to control its unruly element it may be that any machinery set up today to deal with international difficulties may require policemen in order to function successfully but even a police force should not be called upon until every other method of procedure has been tried and proved unsuccessful we have some economic weapons which can be used first and which may prove themselves very efficient as the guardians of peace ultimate objectives what are our ultimate objectives and how shall we achieve them first the most important thing is that any difficulties arising should automatically go before some body which will publish the facts to the world at large and give public opinion an opportunity to make a decision then a group of world representatives will have to decide with whom the fault lies if their decision is not accepted by the nations involved and either nation attempts to use force in coercing the other nation or nations in opposition to what is clearly the majority opinion of the world then and then only it seems to me the decision will be made that the nation using force is an aggressor nation being an aggressor the majority of nations in opposition would be obliged to resort to some method designed to make that nation realize that they could not with impunity flout the public opinion of the majority we need to define what an aggressor nation is we need to have a tribunal where the facts in any case may be discussed and the decision made before the world as to whether a nation is an aggressor or not then the steps decided upon could be taken in conjunction with other nations first of all trade should be withdrawn from that nation and they should be barred as traders in the countries disagreeing with them it would not seem probable that more than this economic weapon would have to be used but necessary in the end the police force could be called upon in the case of a clearly defined issue where the majority of nations agreed the police force would simply try to prevent bloodshed and aggression and it would be in a very different position from an army which was attempting to attack a country and subjugate it even the use of a police force which so many think of as tatamont to war would really be very different and there would be no idea of marching into a country or making the people suffer or taking anything from them it would simply be a group of armed men preventing either of the parties to a quarrel from entering into a real war of course i can imagine cases in which the police force might find itself in an unenviable position with two countries engaged in a heated quarrel trying to do away with the police so they could get at each other all we can hope is that this situation will not arise and that the non-aggressor party to the quarrel at least may be willing to sit peacefully by and see the police force repulse the enemy without wishing to turn into aggressors themselves with all our agitation about peace we lose sight of the fact that with the proper machinery it is easier to keep out of situations which lead to war than it is to bring about peace once war is actually going on i doubt very much whether peace is coming to us either through plans even my own as i have outlined it or through any of the theories or hopes we now hold what i have outlined is not real peace just a method of trying to deal with our difficulties a little better than we have in the past in the world as it is today we may of course be wiped off the face of the earth before we do even this our real ultimate objective must be a change in human nature for i have as i said yet to see a peace plan which is really practical and which has been thought through in every detail therefore i am inclined to believe that there is no perfect and complete program for bringing about peace in the world at the present moment i often wonder as i look around the world whether any of us even we women really want peace 
women should realize better than anyone else that the spirit of peace has to begin in the relationship between two individuals they know that a child alone may be unhappy because he is alone but there will be no quarrelling until another child appears on the scene and then the fur will fly if each of them desires the same thing at the same time women have watched this for generations and must know if peace is going to come about in the world the way to start is by getting a better understanding between individuals from this germ a better understanding between groups of people will grow in spite of this knowledge i am sure that women themselves are among the worst offenders when it comes to petty quarrels mrs j will refuse to speak to mrs c because mrs c's dog came through the hedge and must up mrs j's flower bed no one will deny that occurrences of this kind are irritating in the extreme but is it worth a feud between two neighbours perhaps old friends or even acquaintances who must live next door to each other and see each other almost every day at the moment we as a nation are looking across the atlantic and the pacific patting ourselves on the back and saying how fortunate we are to be away from all their excitements we feel a little self-righteous and forget that we ourselves have been engaged in a war on the average of every forty years since our nation was founded we even fought a civil war complicated by the alignment of other nations with one side or the other though no foreign soldiers actually came to fight on either side the people who settled in new england came here for religious freedom but religious freedom to them meant freedom only for their kind of religion they were not going to be any more liberal to others who differed with them in this new country than others had been with them in the countries from which they came this attitude seems to be our attitude in many situations to-day very few people in any nation to-day are inclined to be really liberal in allowing real freedom to other individuals like our forebears we want freedom for ourselves but not for those who differ from us to think and act as we please within the limits of course caused by the necessity for respecting the equal rights which must belong to our neighbours which seem to be almost a platitudinous doctrine yet we would frequently like to overlook these limits and permit no freedom to our neighbours if this is our personal attitude it is not strange that our national attitude is similar we are chiefly concerned with the rights and privileges of our own people and we show little consideration for the rights and privileges of others in this we are not very different from other nations both in the past and in the present i can almost count on the fingers of one hand the people whom i think are real pacifists by that i mean the people who are really making an effort in their personal lives to bring about an atmosphere which will be conducive to a solution of all of our difficulties in a peaceful manner the first step towards achieving this end is self-discipline and self-control the second is a certain amount of imagination which will enable us to understand situations in which other people find themselves we may learn to be less indignant at any slight or seeming slight and we may try to find some way by which to remove the cause of the troubles which arise between individuals if we become disciplined and cultivate our imaginative faculties once we achieve a technique by which we control our own emotions we certainly will be better able to teach young people how to get on together they may then find some saner way of settling questions under dispute than by merely punching each other's noses when we once control ourselves and submit personal differences to constituted authorities for settlement we can say that we have a will to peace between individuals before we come to the question of what may be the technique between nations however we must go a step farther and set our national house in order on every hand we see to-day miniature wars going on between conflicting interests as the example most constantly before us take capital and labour if their difficulties are settled by arbitration and no blood is shed we can feel we have made real strides towards approaching our international problems 
we are not prepared to do this however when two factions in a group having the same basic interests cannot come to an agreement between themselves their ability to obtain what they desire is greatly weakened until they can reach an understanding and work as a unit the basis of this understanding should not be hard to reach if the different personalities involved could forget themselves as individuals and think only of the objectives in view and of the best way to obtain them granted that they are able to do this then we can approach our second problem with the knowledge that more deeply conflicting interests are at stake but that those with common interests can state their case so the public may form their opinion here again if you could take it for granted that on both sides a real desire existed amongst those representing divergent interests to consider unselfishly ultimate goals and benefits for the majority rather than any individual gain or loss it would undoubtedly be possible to reach a peaceful agreement human beings however do not stride from peak to peak they climb laboriously up the side of the mountain the public will have to understand each case as it comes up and force divergent interests to find a solution the real mountain climber never gives up until he's reached the highest peak and the lure of the climb to this peak is always before him to draw him on that should be the way in human progress a peaceful quiet progress we cannot follow this way however until human nature becomes less interested in self acquires some of the vision and persistence of the mountain climber and realizes that physical forces must be harnessed and controlled by disciplined mental and spiritual forces when we have achieved a nation where the majority of the people is of this type then we can hope for some measure of success in changing our procedure when international difficulties arise what we have said really means that we believe in one actual way to peace making a fundamental change in human nature over and over again people will tell you that that is impossible i cannot see why it should be impossible when the record of history shows so many changes already gone through only the other day i heard it stated that there are only two real divisions which can be made between people the people who have good intentions and the people who have evil intentions the same man who made this distinction between people made the suggestion that eventually there should be in the government a department where business the business that wishes to be fair and square could lay its plans before a chosen group of men representing business the public and the government they could ask for advice as to whether the plans proposed were according to the best business interests of the country and the majority of the people and receive in return a disinterested honest opinion immediately the remonstrance was made that this would be impossible because it would be difficult for an advisory group to know if the plans laid before them were honestly stated and people of evil intentions could use such a group to promote plans for selfish interest rather than for the general welfare this is undoubtedly true and we are up against exactly the same situation in trying to obtain peace between groups within nations as we are in the international fronts human beings either must recognize the fact that what serves the people as a whole serves them best as individuals and through selfish or unselfish interests they become people of good intentions and honesty if not we will be unable to move forward except as we have moved in the past with recourse to force and constant suspicious watchfulness on the part of individuals and groups towards each other the preservation of our civilization seems to demand a permanent change of attitude and therefore every effort should be bent towards bringing about this change in human nature through education this is a slow way and in the meantime we need not sit with folded hands and feel that no steps can be taken to ward off the dangers which constantly beset us immediate steps we can begin and begin at once to set up some machinery our international difficulties will then automatically be taken up before they reach the danger point 
one of our great troubles is that it is nobody's business to try to straighten out difficulties between nations in the early stages if they are allowed to continue too long they grow more and more bitter and little things which might at first have been easily explained or settled take on the proportions of a bitter and important quarrel we do not scrap our whole judicial machinery just because we are not sure that the people who appear before the bar are telling the truth we go ahead and do our best to ascertain the truth in any given case and substantial justice seems to be done in a majority of situations this same thing would have to satisfy us for a time at least in the results achieved by whatever machinery we set up to solve our international difficulties i am not advocating any particular machinery the need it seems fairly obvious to say that we cannot find a way is tantamount to acknowledging that we are going to watch our civilization wipe itself off the face of the earth for those of us who remember the world war there is little need to paint a picture of war conditions but the generation that participated in that war is growing older to the younger group what they have not seen and experienced themselves actually means little i heard a gentleman who loves adventure say the other day that he could recruit an army of young people at any time to go to war in any part of the world they would believe that the danger was slight and the fun and comradeship and adventure would be attractive i protested violently that youth to-day are not so gullible but down in the bottom of my heart i am a little apprehensive therefore it seems to me that one of our first duties is constantly to paint for young people a realistic picture of war you cannot gainsay the assertion that war brings out certain fine qualities in human nature people will make sacrifices which they would not make in the ordinary course of existence war will give opportunities for heroism which do not arise in everyday living but this is not all that war will do it will place men for weeks under conditions which are physically so bad that years later they may still be suffering from the effects of this period of adventure even though they may not have been injured by shot or shell during this time of service upon many people it will have mental or psychological effects which will take them years to overcome in many countries of the world there are people to attest to the changed human beings who have returned to them after the world war men who could no longer settle down to their old work men who had seen such horrors that they could no longer sleep quietly at night men who do not wish to speak of their experiences it is a rather exceptional person who goes through a war and comes out unscathed physically mentally or morally secondly it is one's duty to youth to point out that there are ways of living heroically during peace times i do not imagine that monsieur and madame curie ever felt the lack of adventure in their lives for there is nothing more adventurous than experimentation with an unknown element their purpose was to find something of benefit to the human race they jeopardized no lives but their own i doubt if father damien ever felt that his life lacked adventure and i may think of a hundred places in our own country to-day where men or women might lead their lives unknown or unsung beyond the borders of their own communities and yet never lack for adventure and interest those who set themselves the task of making their communities into places in which the average human being may obtain a share not only of greater physical well-being but of wider mental and spiritual existence will lead an active and adventurous life to reach their goal this will need energy patience and understanding beyond the average qualities of leadership to win other men to their point of view unselfishness and heroism for they may be asked to make great sacrifices to reach their objectives they may have to hand over their leadership to other men their characters may be maligned their motives impugned but they must remain completely indifferent if only in the end they achieve their objectives moral courage of a rare kind will be required of them 
in the wars of the past deeds of valor and heroism have won decorations from governments and the applause of comrades in arms but the men who lead in civic campaigns may hope for none of these recognitions the best that can happen to them is that they may live to see a part of their dreams come true they may keep a few friends who believe in them and their own consciences may bring them inner satisfactions making our everyday living an adventure is probably our best safeguard against war but there are other steps which we might well take let us examine again for example the ever-recurring question of the need for armaments as a means of defence and protection and see if something cannot be done immediately many people feel the building of great military machines lead us directly into war for when you acquire something it is always a temptation to use it it is perfectly obvious however that no nation can cut down its army and navy and armaments in general when the rest of the world is not doing the same thing we ourselves have a long unfortified border on the north which has remained undefended for more than a hundred years a shining example of what peace and understanding between two nations can accomplish but we also have two long coastlines to defend and the panama canal which in case of war must be kept open therefore it behooves us to have adequate naval defence just what we mean by adequate defence is a point on which a good many people differ innumerable civilians have ideas as to what constitutes adequate military preparedness and the people most concerned our military forces have even more definite ideas many people in the united states feel that we are still rendered practically safe by the expanse of water on our east and west coasts some people even feel like mr william jennings bryan that if our nation needed to be defended a million men would spring to arms overnight they forget that a million untrained unarmed men would be a poor defence we must concede that our military establishments have probably made a more careful practical study of the situation than any one else for they know they would have to be ready for action at once whether we accept the civil or the military point of view on preparedness we can still move forward we can continue to try to come to an understanding with other nations on some of the points which lead to bad feeling we can begin first perhaps with the central and south american nations and continue later with other nations to enter into agreements which may lead to the gradual reduction of armaments if we only agree on one thing at a time every little step is something to the good simply because we have so far not been able to arrive at any agreement is no reason for giving up the attempt to agree no one has as yet discovered a way to make any of the methods of transportation by which we all travel around the world absolutely safe but nobody suggests that we should do away with ships and railroads and airplanes i feel that the people of various nations can greatly influence their governments and representatives and encourage action along the lines of reduction in arms and munitions every international group that meets must bear in mind that they have an opportunity to create better feeling but to move forward along this particular front also requires the backing of public opinion at home this opinion may be formed in many little groups all over the world and may be felt in a never widening circle of nations until it becomes a formidable force in the world as a whole then there is the matter of private interests involved in the manufacture of arms and munitions i know there are many arguments advanced against government ownership of the factories making arms and munitions when we know the story of the part played by certain families in europe whose business it has been to manufacture arms and munitions however you wonder if the arguments advanced against this step are not inspired in large part by those whose interests lie in this particular business it is true that a government can lose its perspective for a number of reasons the need for employment may push them to overproduction as well as fear of their neighbours and they may manufacture so much that the temptation to use it may be great 
some governments today manufacture practically all they need for peacetime purposes and this is a safeguard but for wartime use all governments would have to fall back on private manufacturers who could convert their plants easily for the manufacturing of war materials some governments today encourage private manufacturers to produce arms and munitions needed in peacetime by buying from them but the great danger lies in the uncontrolled private production which is used for export the element of private profit is a great incentive towards the increase of this business just as it is in any other business governments are not tempted in the same way for they do not manufacture for export or for profit it seems to me that we must trust someone and i think perhaps it is wiser to trust a government than the more vulnerable and easily tempted individual besides which a democracy has it within its power to control any government business and therefore the idea that our government should control the manufacture of arms and munitions fills me with no great trepidation this control of the manufacture of arms and munitions is a measure which could be undertaken by one government alone it does not have to wait for all the other governments to concur and so i believe either in complete government ownership or in the strictest kind of government supervision allowing such manufacture as will supply our own country but which will not create a surplus for exportation thus removing the incentive for constantly seeking and creating new markets the next step will be the mutual curtailment very gradually i am sure of the amount of armaments the world over this is a difficult step because it requires not only an agreement on the part of all the nations but sufficient confidence in each other to believe that having given their word they will live up to the spirit of the agreement as well as to the letter of it and not try cleverly to hide whatever they have done from possible inspectors they will not for instance destroy a battleship and add a half dozen airplanes telling the other members to the agreement that they have carried out the promised reduction but forgetting to mention the additions to some other arm of their military service this lack of integrity or perhaps we should call it more politely the desire to be a little more clever than one's neighbour is what promotes a constant attitude of suspicion among nations this will exist until we have accomplished a change in human nature and that is why for the present it seems to me necessary to have inspection and policing as well as an agreement the objection will be made that in the nations which are not democracies a government might build up a great secret arsenal but in those countries this could be done to-day for most of them control the press and all outgoing information with an iron hand outside of the democracies government ownership is a much more serious danger on this account if all nations were obliged to report their military strength to some central body and this body was allowed to inspect and vouch for the truth of their statements then all governments could feel secure against that hidden danger which is now part of the incentive for a constant increase in the defence machinery of every nation here again we are confronted with the need of some machinery to work for peace i have already stated that i doubt if the present league of nations could ever be made to serve the purpose for which it was originally intended this does not mean that i do not believe that we could get together we might even begin by setting up regional groups in different parts of the world which might eventually amalgamate into a central body it seems to me almost a necessity that we have some central body as a means of settling our difficulties with an international police force to enforce its decisions as long as we have not yet reached the point everywhere of setting force aside joint economic action on the part of a group of nations will undoubtedly be very effective but it will take some time to educate people to a point where they are willing to sacrifice even temporarily material gains in the interests of peace so i doubt whether we can count at once on complete cooperation in the use of an economic boycott 
to be a real weapon against any nation wishing to carry on war it must be well carried out by a great number of nations another small and perhaps seemingly unimportant thing might be done immediately it might be understood that in war time every one should become a part of the military service and no one should be allowed to make any profit either in increased wages or in increased interest on their capital investment this might bring about a little more universal interest in peace and more active interest in the efforts to prevent war whether a man were going to the front or staying at home of course when we talk of the front in connection with future wars we are taking it for granted that future wars will be much like those of the past whereas most people believe that future wars will have no fronts what we hear of spain and china makes this seem very probable gases and airplanes will not be directed only against armed forces or military centers they may be used for the breaking of morale in the opposing nation that will mean shelling of unfortified cities towns and villages and the killing of women and children in fact this means the participation in war of entire populations one other element must be considered namely the creating of public opinion today wars have frequently been declared in the past with the backing of the nations involved because public opinion had been influenced through the press and through other mediums either by the governments themselves or by certain powerful interests which desired war could that be done again to-day in our own country or have we become suspicious of the written word and the inspired message i think that as a people we look for motives more carefully than we did in the past but whether issues could be clouded for us is one of the questions that no one can answer until the test comes i am inclined to think that if a question as serious as going to war were presented to our nation we would demand facts unvarnished by interpretation whether we even in our free democracy could obtain them is another question who controls the dissemination of news is the press totally uncompromisingly devoted to the unbiased presentation of all news in so far as possible is it possible for groups with special interests to put pressure on the press and on our other means of disseminating information such as the radio and the screen and to what extent this is an interesting study in every country where people are really interested in good will and peace if these sources of information are not really free should not the people insist that this be one of our first reforms without it we can have no sound basis on which to form our opinions these are things we can work for immediately but some of my friends consider that one point transcends all others and epitomizes the way to peace summary we can establish no real trust between nations until we acknowledge the power of love above all other power we cannot cast out fear and therefore we cannot build up trust perfectly obvious and perfectly true but we are back again to our fundamental difficulty the education of the individual human being and that takes time we cannot sit around a table and discuss our difficulties until we are able to state them frankly we must feel that those who listen wish to get at the truth and desire to do what is best for all we must reach a point where we can recognize the rights and needs of others as well as our own rights and needs i have a group of religious friends who claim that the answer to all these difficulties is a great religious revival they may be right but great religious revivals which are not simply short emotional upheavals lifting people to the heights and dropping them down again below the place from which they rose mean a fundamental change in human nature that change will come to some people through religion but it will not come to all that way for i have known many people very fine people who had no formal religion 
so the change must come to some perhaps through a new code of ethics or an awakening sense of responsibility for their brothers or a discovery that whether they believe in a future life or not there are now greater enjoyments and rewards in this world than those which they have envisioned in the past i would have people begin at home to discover for themselves the meaning of brotherly love a friend of mine wrote to me the other day that she wondered what would happen if occasionally a member of congress got up and mentioned in the house the existence of brotherly love you laugh it seems fantastic but this subject will i am sure have to be discussed throughout the world for many years before it becomes an accepted rule we will have to want peace want it enough to pay for it pay for it in our own behavior and in material ways we will have to want it enough to overcome our lethargy and go out and find all those in other countries who want it as much as we do some time we must begin for where there is no beginning there is no end and if we hope to see the preservation of our civilization if we can believe that there is anything worthy of perpetuation in what we have built thus far then our people must return to brotherly love not as a doctrine but as a way of living if this becomes our accepted way of life this life may be so well worth living that we will look into the future with a desire to perpetuate a peaceful world for our children with this desire will come a realization that only if others feel as we do can we obtain the objectives of peace on earth good will to men end of this troubled world nineteen thirty eight by eleanor roosevelt read by david wales eighteen u s code section symbol twenty one o one riots this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Riot A. As used in this chapter, the term riot means a public disturbance involving 1. An act or acts of violence by one or more persons, part of an assemblage of three or more persons, which act or acts shall constitute a clear and present danger of or shall result in damage or injury to the property of any other person or to the person of any other individual or two a threat or threats of the commission of an act or acts of violence by one or more persons as part of an assemblage of three or more persons having individually or collectively the ability of immediate execution of such threat or threats where the performance of the threatened act or acts of violence would constitute a clear and present danger of or would result in damage or injury to the property of any other person or to the person of any other individual 18 u s code section symbol 2101 riots a whoever travels in interstate or foreign commerce or uses any facilities of interstate or foreign commerce including but not limited to the mail telegraph telephone radio or television with intent one to incite a riot or two to organize promote encourage participate in or carry on a riot or three to commit any act of violence in the furtherance of a riot or four to aid or abet any person in inciting or participating in or carrying on a riot or committing any act of violence in furtherance of a riot and who during the course of any such travel or use or thereafter performs or attempts to perform any other overt act for any purpose specified in subparagraph a b c or d of this paragraph 
one shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than five years or both b in any prosecution under this section proof that a defendant engaged or attempted to engage in one or more of the overt acts described in subparagraph a b c or d of paragraph one of subsection a two and one has traveled in interstate or foreign commerce or two has use of or used any facility of interstate or foreign commerce including but not limited to mail telegraph telephone radio or television to communicate with or broadcast to any person or group of persons prior to such overt acts such travel or use shall be admissible proof to establish that such defendant traveled in or used such facilities of interstate or foreign commerce c a judgment of conviction or acquittal on the merits under the laws of any state shall be a bar to any prosecution hereunder for the same act or acts d whenever in the opinion of the attorney general or of the appropriate officer of the department of justice charged by law or under the instructions of the attorney general with authority to act any person shall have violated this chapter the department shall proceed as speedily as possible with a prosecution of such person hereunder and with any appeal which may lie from any decision adverse to the government resulting from such prosecution e nothing contained in this section shall be construed to make it unlawful for any person to travel in or to use any facility of interstate or foreign commerce for the purpose of pursuing the legitimate objectives of organized labor through orderly and lawful means f nothing in this section shall be construed as indicating an intent on the part of congress to prevent any state any possession or commonwealth of the united states or the district of columbia from exercising jurisdiction over any offense over which it would have jurisdiction in the absence of this section nor shall anything in this section be construed as depriving state and local law enforcement authorities of responsibility for prosecuting acts that may be violations of this section and that are violations of state and local law the end of eighteen u s code section symbol twenty one o one riots